Funerals and Favors, K-Pope Mysteries, Book 10. Written by Winnie Reed. Narrated by Jack Ainsworth. Chapter 1. Darcy Harmon, what do you think you're doing? I looked up at the sound of my name being called out from across the street, scanning the area around me to see where the voice came from. There were handfuls of people, tourists and neighbors alike, strolling the sidewalks on an unseasonably cool, comfortable morning. Shifting the tub of flowers I'd just unloaded from the back of a van, I caught sight of Mrs. Merriweather and Mr. Hutchins across the street, gaping at me. The two of them wore identical looks of confusion, with Mrs. Merriweather resting her hand on Mr. Hutchins' elbow like she needed help keeping herself standing. No matter how frail she appeared, the elderly woman was no pushover. I hope you don't plan on taking those flowers for yourself. I bit back a frustrated growl. There were times I was convinced my neighbors believed I never grew up. I might as well have been ten years old all over again, with a bunch of adoptive parents watching my every move. Most kids got into at least a little bit of trouble when they were young. Nothing serious, things like stealing a pack of gum from the store, that sort of thing. Yet even that was beyond me, thanks to the watchful eye of everyone in town. This time they wanted to know why I was carrying flowers, as if I was likely to run off with a tub full of carnations. What would I even do with them? I raised my voice to make sure they heard me. Mrs. Merriweather's hearing aid was always strong enough for her to hear a feather dropping from a bird's wing, but I didn't know about Mr. Hutchins' hearing. I'm helping Olivia this week. She broke her arm. Oh, that's right. They both looked relieved, which was almost enough to make me laugh. Did they think that I, Darcy Harmon of the Cape Hope Harmons, would steal a tub of carnations for the heck of it? For heaven's sake. Mrs. Merriweather changed her approach in a flash, as she had a habit of doing. The woman was sharp as a tack. You work too hard, dear. Remember to take some time for yourself. My head bobbed up and down in agreement. Then I turned around and headed into the store before either of them felt the need to chide me about something else, like needing a boyfriend or something similarly embarrassing. I wouldn't have put it past either of them. Olivia gave me a sympathetic smile when I entered the store. She'd been watching from the window and was chuckling softly. Were the two of them, you know, walking together? Her eyebrows moved up and down, telling me what she was really asking. They did look pretty chummy. Mrs. Merriweather is at least ten years older than him, isn't she? Olivia shrugged, joining me in the workroom behind the counter. Who knows? Maybe once you're old enough, that sort of thing doesn't matter. When you're old, you're just old. You should write greeting cards for a living if the florist gig doesn't work out. That's something she would never have to worry about. Not only was she the only florist in town, but she was also the best anywhere up and down the coast. Her work had been featured at the big annual flower show in Philadelphia. I brought in one last tub, this one full of Gerber daisies, and placed it on one of the work tables. Who am I to criticize anybody's love life? There they are, fifty years older than me, at least, and they have a much firmer grip on romance than I do. You should ask them for tips. When I didn't smile, Olivia looked sympathetic again. You do realize you're beautiful, smart, and funny, right? You should be able to take your pick, especially with your sister married now. One less competitor. As if I would ever compete with Emma, but I understood what she meant. I considered Olivia a good friend, the sort of person I could catch up with easily after weeks or even months of our being too busy to connect. She didn't know about Pete or Ethan, though because I didn't know how to explain the whole tricky situation. Not even to myself, it seemed. One minute, they were both interested in me. The next, I managed to push them both away. Pete was a nice guy, one of the best. But he didn't exactly stir anything in me. I liked him, but there was no spark. Ethan, on the other hand, might as well have been a flint to my steel. It seemed there was never a lack of sparks whenever we were in the same room. We were always arguing, getting under each other's skin. For a minute there, I imagined it meant there was something more between us, especially when he kissed me. I messed that up, too. I turned Pete down in favor of turning my attention to Ethan, and Ethan told me he wanted to take time away from me, 
Okay, he might not have used those exact words, but it sure felt like it at the time. I'd gone from not knowing whom to choose to having nobody to choose from. Maybe Mrs. Merriweather could give me tips. Is everything ready for the funeral? Olivia's assistant was out of town for a family emergency, leaving nobody to drive the delivery van and unload the many, many arrangements ordered for the services of one of Cape's Hope's most distinguished citizens. I finished putting last touches on that ring of roses just a few minutes before you came in from the flower market. Yes, and it looked gorgeous. Everybody in town wanted to be the one to say they'd bought the most elaborate arrangement, it seemed. Great, I'll start loading them in. I don't know what I would do without you. She led the way, holding the door open for me. I know you said you didn't want any pay, but I can't possibly let you go to all this trouble without giving you something. Don't even think about it. I slid an enormous spray of daisies and baby's breath into the van. Becca has things running like clockwork over at first edition, so I practically twiddle my thumbs all day. That wasn't exactly the truth, but it wasn't too far off the mark either. Hiring Becca was one of the smartest decisions I'd ever made. Things were starting to get to the point where I wondered if she knew more about my business than I did. Olivia shook her head in mock disappointment. You would find a way to work more when you should be taking advantage of the free time. Careful, or you'll start sounding like Mrs. Merriweather. And my mother, for that matter. But the woman had no room to talk. She raised me to be the workaholic I was. What was I supposed to do? See a friend in need and turn my back? Besides, it was sort of fun being around all those flowers. Everybody needed a little variety in their life, after all and sitting behind the wheel of a big delivery van made me feel sort of powerful, too, in a way that sitting behind a counter and reading the latest mystery didn't. Wow, anybody who didn't know Pierce Cornell would think he was well-loved. I picked up a large arrangement of white roses, which featured a ribbon that read Rest in Peace. There were a lot of pieces similar to that one in all varieties of flowers. No, Cornell wasn't well-loved, but he was well-feared. In his younger days, he was the wealthiest man in Cape Hope and had been a high-powered Manhattan attorney with satellite offices in London, Paris, Berlin, and Tokyo. Cape Hope was where his family used to vacation in a magnificent, rambling old Victorian mere yards away from their own private beach. Once he'd started moving into retirement, he'd started spending more time at his vacation home until it had become his permanent residence. Even after he retired, though, he was a tyrant. He couldn't crucify people in court anymore, so he had to do it in his personal life. There was a lot of gossip around town when word spread about his losing a diamond cufflink and blaming his housekeeping staff. He'd threatened to fire all of them and pick the toughest attorney he knew when he waged his lawsuit. When the cufflink had turned up in one of his slippers, where he'd dropped it, he'd withdrawn the threat. The funny thing was, at least to me, the fact that his housekeepers had come back to work when he'd invited them. I would never have let someone treat me like that. But then, I was fortunate enough not to be in a position like that. It couldn't have been easy. I hoped he paid them well, at least. An older woman was on her way into the shop as Olivia and I were heading in as well. I held the door for her, and she breezed past me without so much as a glance. Okay, then. She was dressed all in black, except for a white lace handkerchief clutched in one hand. I thought she might have been a funeral goer and chalked up her rudeness to grief. Olivia welcomed her with a smile. How can we help you today? I made it a point to hang around behind the counter in case there was something someone needed from me. The woman sniffed a little, her eyes moving around the room. The way they narrowed told me she disapproved of something, along with the thin line she drew her lips into so maybe her attitude had nothing to do with grief. I'm checking on the status of the arrangement I ordered for the Cornell funeral. She had an imperious way about her, lifting her chin and looking at us from over the end of her thin nose. There wasn't so much as a silver hair out of place. Of course. Olivia, ever the professional, maintained her pleasant demeanor. What name is it under? Emily Newberg. It took me a second but I realized I was looking at the woman who'd served as Cornell's personal assistant for more than 30 years. Even post-retirement, he'd kept her on the payroll, going as far as to offer her a guest suite in his home 
so she'd always be nearby if he needed her. Sure, Miss Newberg, I finished that one this morning. Olivia turned to me. Can you bring out the red roses? I knew exactly which one she meant, since it was the only arrangement in that color. I went to the workroom and picked it up, carrying it out for inspection. Here you are. I set it down on its stand and stepped back so she could lean in. I want to make sure I'm getting my money's worth. Emily inspected it down to the last bloom, frowning the entire time. I suppose it's fresh enough. Thank you. Olivia was starting to grit her teeth. At your prices, it ought to be fresh. Emily shrugged. That will do. Make sure it's up in the front of the others, nearest the casket. I'd better be on my way. The family is hosting a repast prior to the service for those closest to Mr. Cornell before heading to the cemetery. I wondered if we should congratulate her on making the guest list. She left without another word, without even thanking Olivia for her beautiful work. Olivia slumped a little against the counter, wiping invisible sweat from her forehead. Wow, here I was, wondering for all these years how anyone could work for a man like him. Now I know, she's just as bad as he was. I watched out the window as Emily strode down the street, just as straight-backed as she'd been in the store. I think it might have been more than that. Olivia joined me at the window, knitting her brows in understanding. Right, wasn't there a rumor about the two of them? And it only got worse when she moved into his house. Everybody pretty much assumed that was their way of being together without making it official. I couldn't help but laugh at the memories. There were more than a few times when Mom asked me to find something in the kitchen that didn't actually exist. The chatter in the cafe would get a little spicy, and she wanted to keep me in the dark for as long as possible. We had a good laugh over that, before I continued loading up the van. We'd have to hustle if we hoped to make it to the cemetery before the service started. I'd have to make sure Emily's roses were front and center, too, and not only because I was afraid she'd throw a fit if I didn't. Gossip aside, these were two human beings who'd been helping to feed the rumor mill for decades. People with feelings. If the rumors were true, and Emily had been Cornell's girlfriend all those years, she deserved at least to have her wishes honored. We made it to the plot with plenty of time to spare. The casket must have cost a small fortune, a gleaming pearl-white box that almost blinded me when the sun hit it. By the time I finished setting up the flowers, I was beyond glad for the comfortable weather. A little humidity would have made things miserable. Cars were beginning to pull into the cemetery in a long line by then. We hung back, watching as dozens upon dozens of mourners poured out, circling the grave. Several people sniffed, touched handkerchiefs to their eyes and noses. I almost wished my sister could be there. Emma would have a good laugh over the fake mourning, and I would have felt more comfortable rolling my eyes at the dramatics. Look at who it is. Olivia nodded in Emily's direction. The old woman walked alone, her head held high. She made it a point to stand near the priest, even closer than Cornell's family did. I recognized them after having seen them in the paper over the years. Oldest son Patrick and his wife Bobby, middle son Matthew and his third wife Valerie, their son Greg, who looked to be around college age, the youngest son Oliver pulled up the rear. He'd never been married, and from what I understood, he had no desire to be. Living the playboy lifestyle was more his speed. They all dressed exactly the way I'd expect wealthy people to dress. Suits, I imagine, probably cost more than my monthly rent for the store. Pearls on the ladies, designer sunglasses all around. Bobby held onto her husband's arm, while Valerie stood a good foot away from Matthew. Nobody looked particularly sad. Emily ignored them, even though they stood near her. I got the feeling she wasn't a fan. The way they smirked behind her told me they shared the sentiment. We weren't close enough to make out what the priest said, but it wasn't the priest who held my attention. It was the family. Oliver's phone rang at one point. He hadn't bothered turning off the ringer for such an important event. He went so far as to answer the call, though a sharp look from his brothers quickly changed his mind. Bobby yawned openly. Matthew must have been allergic to flowers, since he never stopped sneezing, which gave Valerie an excuse to stand even further away. Through it all, Emily stood stone-faced, staring at the casket without reacting to any of the nonsense going on behind her. My heart softened again. She'd lost someone who might have meant the world to her. 
someone who'd been part of her life for longer than I'd been alive. She was stoic, straight-spined, until she collapsed. Chapter 2 I can't believe it. She was only in the store less than two hours before the funeral. She seemed perfectly fine. Olivia looked and sounded shell-shocked, sitting in Mom's cafe after we closed up the flower shop for the day. It was close to closing time here, too, which meant my mother had time to smother us with attention. She clicked her tongue in sympathy, setting a cup of tea down in front of Olivia. What a thing to happen, dropping dead at her lover's funeral. Mom. I rubbed my temples and wondered why I'd thought going to the cafe was such a good idea. Well, everyone in town knew they were together all this time. Only a love would be strong enough to keep working for a brute like him. She shuddered. I thought it was bad to speak ill of the dead. Mom waved a hand, poo-pooing me. There's no sense in lying. He wasn't a nice man. He defended a lot of rich people who should have gone to prison for all the things they did. All that wealth of his comes from blood money. Tell me how you really feel. I went behind the counter and snagged myself a lemon bar, which I split with Olivia before sitting across from her. It's not that I don't agree, but the two of them are gone now. It wouldn't be fair to keep gossiping about them when neither of them can defend themselves. Even when that Emily Newberg was so rude to you and Olivia? Mom shook her head, a disapproving look twisting her mouth into a scowl. She was a bitter person, always difficult to get along with. No wonder she and Cornell were so happy together. I turned to Olivia, rolling my eyes. It's amazing I made it out of here with my sanity intact. The bell above the door chimed, making my head turn before I even thought about it. Over time, it had become one of those knee-jerk things, looking up to see who'd come in. I grinned at the sight of my pregnant sister. Let me guess, you heard the news and came down for all the juicy gossip. Emma shot me a withering look. Hello to you, too. You're also looking well, Darcy. Yes, I am glowing, and yes, my ankles are swollen. She plopped down on one of the chairs near me and put her feet up on another. Indeed, her ankles were enormous. Sorry, you are glowing, by the way. She snickered. I heard about the funeral, yes. Everybody has. It's not the sort of thing that happens every day. Somebody dropping dead in the middle of their boyfriend's funeral service. No wonder you're such a successful writer. You have such a way with words. Hmm? Emma looked at me, distracted. Sorry, I was looking at your lemon bar. What did you say? I said you're greedy. I handed her the bar. It's not me, it's this one. She pointed to her belly. I don't know whether it's a baby in there or a horse. All I know is I'm always famished. I'd bet that means it's a boy. Mom pointed at her from across the room, eyes wide. It's a fact that boy babies consume something like 30% more of their mother's calorie intake. I exchanged a look with Emma. That seems a bit much. It can't be true. No, I've heard that too. Olivia looked a little cheerier, and I breathed easier seeing it. There were a few minutes there when I was really worried about her. Not that seeing dead bodies and dealing with the aftermath was exactly everyday stuff for me but I would have bet the bookstore I was more experienced with death than she was. My family had a way of attracting danger. Emma had been through more close calls than anybody had a right to live through. The girl had more lives than a cat, while I'd recently been through a few close calls of my own. Add in the fact that her father was a detective with a habit of bringing work home with him and discussing it at the dinner table, and you had a family for whom death wasn't anything to get jittery about. Emma gazed down at her growing belly with a look that could only come from love. I wasn't jealous of her in the least, though there was no pretending that the sight didn't make me wonder when my time would come. I know that would make Joe happy. Mom waved a finger. It seems to me he only wants a healthy baby and a healthy wife, which is why I'm going to cut you off at one lemon bar, young lady. Emma's eyes bulged. But Mom, it was only half of one anyway. I didn't eat a whole bar. Just the same. Even if the doctor hasn't said anything about it, I will. You need to cut back on sugar during pregnancy. That's a rule of thumb. But, Mom, you know Emma's blood type is sugar. I ducked when my sister took a swat at me, laughing at her. 
That baby has slowed you down. You didn't even stir my hair. I know. I feel like I'm moving through a semi-set jello all the time. Sugar-free jello, I hope. I stuck my tongue out at her, relishing her sour reaction. It wasn't often I had a reason to tease her over something this relatively low stakes. Joe would agree with me. Another finger wag from Mom. I'm sure he would. Emma grumbled as she brushed powdered sugar from her shirt. I wouldn't have been surprised if she'd sucked the crumbs off her fingers for good measure. I might as well be living with you, he hovers over me so much. You'd think I wasn't capable of taking care of myself, and I swear, Darcy, I will smack you if you make a comment. My mouth snapped shut, because I was, indeed, preparing to make a comment. It's your first baby. He's bound to be anxious. Mom chuckled softly. It reminds me of how solicitous your father was when I was first expecting. He called over here four or five times a day to make sure I was okay, then sent Nell or Trixie to check in on me, too. Amazing. It must have been impending grandmotherhood that made Mom sound charitable towards Dad. It had been a long road, stretching out over many years of animosity, bitterness, and the strict rule that we were not to mention his name in her presence, primarily because he'd started dating Holly, a woman closer to my age than Mom's. I was ashamed of myself when I remembered my part in all that. The divorce had left me bitter and wounded, not to mention hurting for Mom, who I knew was devastated, no matter how she'd rally and soldier through. Emma had at least spoken to him, but I'd refused to for a long time. What a waste. Emma's eyes lit up. You two were some of the last people to see Emily alive, weren't you? Man, you're like a dog with a bone, aren't you? I'd been hoping we wouldn't have to talk about it again, if only for Olivia's sake. I guess we were, but she mentioned something about a private repast for the family before the service, so that means they were with her as well. And who knows, she might have made other stops before then. There was too much hope in Olivia's voice for me to possibly ignore it. I turned to her, reaching over the table to pat her hand. Hey, nobody's gonna think you or I had anything to do with it. Of course not. Mom flew over and draped an arm around Olivia's shoulders. Emily was an old woman. She might have been in poor health. And the strain of losing someone close to her could have been too much. It's as simple as that. Yes, but Emily had certainly seemed healthy when she was at the shop. Strong, sharp, full of vinegar. I told myself at the time the woman was suffering after losing a loved one. Was she suffering enough to make her drop dead seemingly out of nowhere? The police will want to ask us questions, but I'm sure it'll be routine stuff. They'll probably ask how she acted or if she seemed off in any way. Olivia nodded at my explanation, still looking a little shaky. The chime rang out again, and this time it was Becca coming over from next door. I slapped my forehead. I wanted to come over and help close up. Don't worry about it. From what I've heard, you've been through enough today. She came over and patted my shoulder. You okay? Just fine. How was the store today? All a buzz. I think a few customers might have come in hoping you'd be there to give them all the details. At least they bought books, so it didn't look like they were being ghoulish. She sat with Emma, letting out a long, tired sigh. What an awful thing. Though I guess it's sort of romantic. There was never any proof the two of them were actually together as a couple. The eye-rolling that resulted from my dose of reason told me I was in the minority. Please, if anything, the fact that the woman dropped at his funeral only makes it more likely there was a long-time burning love affair between them. Emma's eyes welled with tears. Darn it, there go my hormones. Oh, honey. Mom handed her a stack of napkins. It's just that when I imagine losing Joe, Emma blew her nose loudly. It's enough to break my heart, and they were together for decades. She covered her face with her hands, giving Mom plenty of reason to hover and soothe her. I got the feeling Mom enjoyed it as an excuse to baby her a little. There I was, thinking my sister couldn't get any more emotional. One last chime of the bell. What happened? Joe practically knocked tables aside to get to Emma, who by this time was sobbing full out. I doubt he would have held back even if the cafe had been full of customers. 
The thought of people falling over like bowling pins was enough to make me bite back a giggle, which I knew would get me into trouble. She's fine, emotional over what happened at the funeral earlier. I moved aside to give Joe room. He crouched next to Emma, and she threw her arms around his neck. I didn't know if it was funny or cute or both. He calmed her down while I helped Mom wipe the rest of the tables before closing up. He turned my way once the sobbing calmed into something closer to sniffles. Do you think you could spare a few minutes and come in and make a statement in the morning? You and Olivia? He looked her way, and she nodded. Sure, I'm used to it by now. Sadly, I was. Come on, Liv, I'll walk you home. Before we were out the door, Mom pulled me aside. We have to sit down and talk about you-know-what. She jerked her head toward Emma who was too busy blowing her nose again to notice. I'll stop in tomorrow and we'll hammer it out. I waved goodbye to everybody and promised Becca to drop in and relieve her at some point too. She needed a break during the day just like anybody else. Once we were outside, Olivia whistled like she was impressed. I don't know how you do it. Do what? You're there for everybody all the time. Your mom, your sister, Becca, me. She elbowed me with her good arm. There's only so many hours in the day. Tell me about it. But I like it this way. I'd go nutty if I didn't have anything to do. What was your mom asking about when we left? Emma's shower. It's scheduled for next weekend. We have most everything ironed out now. But of course, this is mom's first grandchild, so she's... she's mom. We shared a knowing laugh. She wants everything to be perfect, and so do I. I'd be happy to make up centerpieces if you want. Consider it a baby gift. You don't have to do that. Please, it's the least I can do to repay you for everything you're doing for me. You just had to come up with a way to pay me, didn't you? We came to a stop at her door, leading to her apartment above the flower shop. I had to admit the layout of the store was a good idea. There was never a chance of getting stuck in traffic on the way to work. I knew I'd come up with something. She disappeared behind her door, but I could hear her gentle laughter as she climbed the stairs. At least she was in a better mood now, not so uneasy about speaking with the police. Me? I might as well have had a desk reserved for me. Maybe Emma and I could share it. Only then did it hit me. I'd have to see Pete for the first time since I'd told him I'd wanted to ease up and be friends. Looks like it's my turn to freak out. Chapter 3 You look very nice this morning. Olivia looked me up and down when we met up in front of the police station the morning after the funeral. I didn't know a visit with the cops had a dress code involved. I feel downright sloppy. What? I looked down at my daisy print sundress and white cardigan. I wanted to wear a dress today. And strappy sandals. You were wearing sneakers yesterday. I was unloading deliveries and transporting floral arrangements yesterday. Mm-hmm. She eyed the double doors. You wouldn't be dressing up for anybody in there, would you? I've seen you and Pete Fraser out together, so don't bother pretending you aren't dating. I blew out a sigh that puffed my cheeks. I wish we had this conversation last night. I'm not dating Pete anymore. I'm glad you told me, or I might have said something dumb. Still, she raised her brows, lips pressed together so tight I knew she was trying to hold back a grin. What's so funny? Nothing. She reached for one of the door handles. I'm sure he'll think you look nice, too. I made a face at the back of her head as we entered the station, where we were greeted by a desk cop I'd known since I was a teenager. I guess you're here to give a statement about Emily Newberg, huh? Hank shook his head. A real shame, that one. We have the family coming in, too. I'm sure the whole thing must be tough for them. They just lost the old man, after all. Maybe we should ease up on the old man thing when the family gets here, huh? My heart fluttered in an almost disturbing way at the sound of Pete's voice. He strode down the hall between two rows of offices, one hand in the pocket of his khakis. His yellow polo brought out the nice golden tan of his skin. I forgot how handsome he was. How could I forget how handsome he was? He also deliberately avoided making eye contact, nodding my way before asking Olivia how she broke her arm and how she was coming along at the shop with her cast. Oh, I'm fine. Darcy's been helping me while Rachel's out of town. She's very helpful. Yet she didn't deserve the courtesy of a look. 
I wanted to remind him she happened to be in the room and didn't need to be spoken of like she wasn't. But that would be immature. I didn't want to embarrass myself. Or Pete. As he led us back to his office, I reminded myself he had the right to carry a chip on his shoulder. It had only been a few weeks since we last spoke. I wouldn't have blamed him if he didn't want to talk to me ever, for any reason. Can I get you ladies something to drink? We both shook our heads before sitting across from his desk. It was a new office, bigger than the one he'd had before. I wanted to comment on it and ask if he'd gotten a promotion, but thought better of it. There really isn't much to say. Olivia glanced my way. Emily came in because she ordered a floral arrangement for the funeral. We showed it to her. She said something about needing to go to the repast. And that was it. We showed it to her? Pete looked in my general direction. I brought it out from the workroom. Why did I feel like I had to fold my hands in my lap like a good little girl? The energy between us had shifted so dramatically. I was unprepared. His mouth set in a firm line as he took note of this. Was there anything unusual about the flowers in the arrangement? Something exotic, maybe? Are you suggesting there could have been something in my flowers that killed her? Olivia's voice tightened until it was barely a squeak. No, I'm sure that's not what he means. I shot Pete a look, which he seemed to understand, even though he scowled. At least he got the message. It's more like we have to cover every possibility. From what I understand, the burial site was practically blanketed in them. We've already spoken to the priest who performed the service, and he mentioned hearing Emily wheezing. He mistook it for crying at first. She was wheezing? I couldn't help but ask, even though Pete scowled deeper than ever. I knew he would, but I couldn't help myself. She was having difficulty breathing. We're being as careful as we can, making sure we don't jump to conclusions. Was it my imagination, or did he sound a little too forceful? He reminded me of my dad, which was not exactly a compliment in the current situation. I didn't enjoy being spoken to like a willful child who needed to be knocked down a peg or two. He looked back and forth between us. I guess you weren't close enough to the burial plot to say for sure whether Emily was acting strangely. Considering we'd just met her for the first time at the store, there was no way of knowing. A glance at Olivia told me she agreed. She was extremely rude, though. Yes, well, it seems that was sort of her personality. I, I wouldn't take it personally. Right, the way I wasn't supposed to take personally the way Pete was acting? I couldn't have it both ways. I had heard him. Even if he didn't actually have feelings for me, I'd wounded his pride. That could be just as painful as any other sort of wound, if not more so. I was asking too much, expecting him to be nice. Thank you both very much for coming in. He stood abruptly, surprisingly so. We have Cornell's family coming in this morning, so it's going to be a busy one. Right, that was our cue to leave. He thanked Olivia again as we were on our way out of his office, leaving me out of it. I pretty much wanted to curl up and die on the spot. No, I didn't deserve special consideration. But it wasn't until then that I understood the depth of Pete's resentment. It hurt a lot worse than I could have imagined, which was saying something because I'd imagined quite a bit. I'd been dreading this ever since I realized we would have to sit face to face. Endless hours of worry, second-guessing, and being angry with myself. I couldn't have imagined this icy feeling in my stomach, the heaviness of my feet as I walked along the hall. This was not the time for my feet to be heavy. I needed them to be light, to carry me out of the station on wings. The sooner I put a little distance between the two of us, the better. I don't see why we have to waste time here. It was her voice that caught my attention before the sight of her, one of Pierce Cornell's daughters-in-law. As if we don't have enough to deal with. It was Valerie, Matthew's wife. She was complaining to Oliver, since it was clear her own husband didn't care for her complaining. He stood as far away from her as he could without actually going so far as to leave the building. Stop, you're making up things in your head. Maybe I was, but the body language spoke for itself. The sooner we get it over with, the sooner we can go back to the house. I have a lot more digging to do. Oliver eyed me as we passed. I eyed him right back, and something about that made him smirk. Weren't you there yesterday? You're the florist. Something like that? I tried to be as courteous as possible, which wasn't easy. There was something hard about him, appraising, like he couldn't help but consider the value of everything around him, whether it was worthy of his time. 
I didn't like the feeling of being appraised. Matthew elbowed his way in before his brother could say anything else. Thank you both for the beautiful work you did. The flowers were gorgeous, and I'm sure Dad would have appreciated it. At least he seemed a little more sincere, though Valerie didn't bother hiding the way she rolled her eyes and gagged a little. She obviously didn't agree. Oliver didn't bother hiding his disdain either. Come on, Maddie. You know just as well as I do Dad wouldn't have noticed. The only time he ever cared about anything was when he found out one of us cared about it. He looked my way, then winked, so he could try to get it for himself. What a lovely family. Olivia's overly bright smile screamed out her discomfort. Whatever we could do to make the day better for all of you, and we're sorry for your latest loss. Valerie hooted out a laugh. Please, good riddance to the old witch. Valerie. Matthew's face went red. She tossed her long, dark hair over her shoulders. Well, it's the truth. There was no love lost between her or any of us. She walked around like she owned the place and treated us like a bunch of spoiled children. Oliver laughed, and it was the sincerest thing I'd heard from him yet. But we are a bunch of spoiled children. At least I can admit it. We really should be going. I forgot Pete was even hanging around, too busy observing the family like I would observe animals in the zoo. He went so far as to place a hand in the middle of my back and give me a tiny shove. I bit my tongue rather than whirl around and push him back. It was his way of getting rid of me before I could hear anything juicier. It was better off for us to leave anyway, since being around the Cornell family didn't exactly make me feel comfortable. It wasn't until we were outside that Olivia let out a long groan, shaking out her good hand. What a miserable bunch of people. I didn't think there were people like that in real life. I truly didn't. I threw a dirty look towards the doors. Honestly, the nerve. Olivia followed the direction of my gaze. Are you talking about them or about somebody else? I could have offered a bunch of half-hearted excuses. I could have insisted she didn't know what she was talking about. Instead, I settled for letting it go as we set off for Main Street. No comment. Chapter 4 I'm telling you, it's been two days and I still can't shake the slimy feeling. I shivered a little, rubbing my arms before giving Georgie another spoonful of mashed peas. He was getting to the point where he could start eating hand to mouth. But peas were not exactly the sort of thing anybody wanted him handling. I certainly wasn't trying to clean dried peas off the floor, the high chair, his hair. They're a real piece of work, the entire family. I stopped in when the oldest son and his wife were making their statement. Dad shook his head with a bewildered expression. I don't know how anybody could be so unaware of themselves. What do you mean? Holly joined us with a pitcher of iced tea and three tall glasses, setting them down on the kitchen table. They strut around like they own the world. And yes, they have a lot of money. At least their father had a lot of money but they think it somehow elevates them above everyone else they come in contact with. My head bobbed up and down as I scraped peas away from the corners of Georgie's mouth with the edge of his spoon. That's the truth. I'm telling you, that Oliver? I couldn't shake the feeling he was trying to figure out how much he could get from me if he put me up for auction. Everything has a dollar sign attached to it. One glance at Holly told me she didn't share our opinion. Remember, they did just lose their father. Trust me. Dad patted her hand after taking a glass of iced tea from her. None of them are exactly heartbroken over the old man's loss. I can't imagine anybody would be. Except for Emily. Dad snickered a little at my interjection. So you believe that too, that the two of them were romantically linked? When you hear something your entire life, eventually you have to accept it as being true. The rumors must have started somewhere, right? From what I remember, it was Matthew's other wife who started those rumors. I don't remember if it was the first or the second, but it was one of them. The whole family was down for a vacation at the big house. A vacation from what I don't know, since none of them has a job. Emily must have rubbed the wife the wrong way, and she blasted the rumors all over town. He scowled like the rumors had something to do with him. Nothing but a bunch of cattiness and pettiness. Holly and I shrugged at each other. Anyway, nobody seemed very upset about Emily's passing. 
I made a point to make faces at my baby brother, who giggled and clapped his hands, but really I was observing our father, trying to get a feeling for how much he knew about the case. And darn him, he saw right through me. I'm not going to tell you anything about the case. There isn't even a case, not really. People die all the time, and there didn't appear to be foul play. I gave him my most innocent look, a trick I'd picked up from Emma. Who asked you to tell me anything about the case? Like you said, there isn't one. Don't play word games with me, young lady. I've known you since the first time you took a breath. You and your sister think you're so clever, and I admit you both are, but your old man still knows a thing or two. Holly took a seat next to Dad, waving at the baby before taking a long sip of iced tea. It really was refreshing, which helped since the heat and humidity had skyrocketed. She set down her glass with a sigh. If I were one of those kids, I would wonder how much money was left for me. I'm sure that's all they care about. I gave Georgie my biggest smile, then airplaned the last spoonful of peas into his waiting mouth. The kid could have lived on peas and he would have been completely satisfied. I wiped his face with his bib and made a big fuss over him. Then I remembered something else. Oliver said something about wanting to dig at the house, like being at the station was keeping him from the digging he wanted to do. I'm sure he wanted to go through his father's things in case there was some hidden treasure nobody knows about. I wouldn't put too much stock in it. Darn it, he was determined to stay closed-lipped, and if I kept pushing, he would know how interested I was. The fact was, Chatting with the family members in the lobby of the police station had sparked my interest. I couldn't help it. It was one thing to know through rumor what selfish, greedy children Pierce Cornell had sired, but it was another to watch them and speak with them, to breathe the same air they did, to get a sense of their personalities. I only wished I'd been there when Patrick and Bobby had shown up. Two days had been more than enough time for theories and ideas to percolate in my imagination. Years of reading voraciously had granted me a deeper curiosity than most people possessed. I had a habit of drawing conclusions about people, making up backstories for them, trying to figure out their motivations. I could just as soon break myself of the habit as I could learn to live without breathing. I turned to Holly. Do you think they might have been worried he left all his money to Emily? Dad scowled. Could we not make up stories? Nobody's making up stories. Holly reminded him in a gentle tone. We're curious is all, and that's what I've heard around town. I tried my best not to seem too voraciously interested. That's the consensus? What does it matter what the consensus is? Dad lifted Georgie out of his high chair, settling the baby in his lap. It didn't matter how gruff and irritated he seemed. The second he was with Georgie, his entire demeanor changed. And though I was becoming slightly annoyed with my father, I couldn't help but feel warm all over when I saw how happy he was. I'm just saying, word has it, he and Emily were very seriously involved for a long time. Why wouldn't he leave his estate to her? Dad made funny faces for the baby, who giggled and patted Dad's cheeks. Because his children are his children. Nothing will change that. Even if they're all terrible people? I exchanged a look with Holly that told me she agreed. I mean, let's face it, Dad. Not everybody got as lucky as you did. I twirled my hair around one finger, batting my eyes. He grumbled good-naturedly before grinning. Even though you're being a wise mouth, I won't argue. Holly set her glass down with a thump. Enough of this. Let's talk about the shower. Has anyone RSVP'd? Should I check in with anyone? I was grateful for the distraction, but I suspected Dad was, too. It struck me as sweet how excited Holly was to be part of the shower preparations. We were needlessly cold toward her for a long time, and it made me ashamed of myself when I thought back to my earlier behavior. Holly was in charge of decorations, and I made sure to tell her about Olivia's offer of floral centerpieces. Dad, meanwhile, looked downright gleeful, and I soon found out why. How is your mother handling all of this? Has she managed to keep it a secret? I can only imagine her practically biting off her tongue whenever your sister is around. Yes, Detective, I can assure you she's been a closed book on this. I'm sure it's tearing her up, wanting to talk openly about it at the cafe. She can keep a secret when she has to. Wow, what a compliment. 
I held back any sarcastic remarks since that was one of the most generous things I'd heard him say about her since they were divorced. We spent the rest of the evening talking about the shower and how we planned on getting Emma to the restaurant, whose back room we'd reserved for the afternoon. I left out the part where Mom insisted on bringing in all of the desserts for the event. She had refused to leave it up to the restaurant, claiming this was her contribution to the shower. I tried to tell her all she needed to do was show up and be our mother, but of course she had refused to hear me. I got the feeling the owner of the restaurant wasn't exactly thrilled, and probably took it as an insult to his baker's skills, but he agreed this one time to let outside food be brought in. Something told me Dad would have had more than a few strong opinions on that if he knew. As if he wasn't one of the stubbornest people in Cape Hope. Let me drive you home. It was full dark by the time I got my things together to leave, and Dad reached for his car keys once I'd put Georgie down for the night. Hanging out and taking care of him had become one of my favorite things to do, and it gave them a break, too. Don't even think about it. You know I would rather walk. It's the only exercise I've managed to squeeze in lately. But it's so humid and muggy out there. Holly made a face. I can't wait for September. I agreed, even though summer meant profits. Cape Hope was a shore town, after all, and while we received plenty of visitors in the off-season, nothing could beat the influx of revenue the summer brought us. Then again, thanks to Becca, my store's online business had exploded. Knowing I could continue making money no matter the time of year granted me a sense of security I hadn't enjoyed before. Just thinking about it as I left Dad's was enough to make me want to give her yet another raise. It wasn't until I was a few blocks away that it occurred to me I should have had Dad drive me after all, not because of the humidity, though that was rather uncomfortable, but because my usual route home meant passing Ethan's store. I was already on his block before I considered taking another route. Stop being ridiculous, I chided myself and continued on, practically marching. I couldn't spend the rest of my life taking a long way home just because I might run into Ethan Crosby. If I wasn't careful, I would end up alienating everyone in town, and then how would I get around? I was a few doors down from Ethan's when, to my horror, he stepped outside. I froze like a scared rabbit and watched as he pulled out his keys and locked the door. He hadn't seen me. I took advantage of that, ducking behind a car, and immediately cursed myself for doing it. What was I hiding for? I had just as much right to walk down the street as anybody else. That didn't stop me from crouching down, peeking out from behind the bumper of a late model hatchback. A hatchback which, evidently, had an alarm. An alarm which screamed out into the heavy night air when I made the mistake of leaning against the car. I jumped up, horrified, while Ethan jumped back from the door. Our eyes met. He called out to me over the siren's squawk. Darcy, what are you doing? What was I doing? Good question. I searched for an explanation, my thoughts racing, my heart pounding and sweat rolling down the back of my neck. This was going splendidly. I was, you know, walking home from Dad's. I tripped and fell against the car. I looked around, searching the windows of the buildings lining the streets, until somebody finally leaned out and pressed a button on a key fob. The silence following the deafening noise was somehow even more unsettling. Tripped and fell against the car, huh? I couldn't quite make out all of Ethan's face, thanks to the shadows, but something in his voice told me he was laughing at me. You'll have to be more careful next time. I guess I will. Well, it was good to see you. I lowered my head and was just about to run past him, but he caught me before I could get away. Let me walk you the rest of the way home. I can't stand to think of a woman walking on her own at night, even around here. He eyed me, lifting an eyebrow. Then again, you would know all about that. Please, nobody's tried to run me down with their car in weeks. At least it was something to laugh about, even if almost being run down wasn't particularly funny. So how have you been? At least it sounded like he felt as uncomfortable as I did, which for some reason made me feel a little better. I wasn't the only one. For once, somebody had knocked Ethan off his high horse. He wasn't as self-assured as usual. You know, the usual thrills and chills. Planning a baby shower for my sister. Witnessing a woman dropping dead at a funeral. Everyday sort of stuff. That's right, I heard you were there. Helping that Olivia girl out with the flowers. He shook his head with a laugh. 
I swear you have a way of attracting these things. Are you saying I'm bad luck? No, you have a penchant for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I'm not going to argue with that. His eyes widened. Wow, Darcy Harmon isn't going to argue with me. I have to mark this date down on my calendar and remember it as the years go by. I'm glad your sense of humor hasn't suffered. I sneaked a look at him from the corner of my eye. He was wearing his usual black clothing, which he always wore when he was working. His t-shirt was stained, powdered sugar it looked like, maybe mayonnaise from a sandwich he'd prepared. There were crumbs on his shoulder, and I wanted to brush them off while asking how exactly they'd gotten there. It wasn't my place, just like it wasn't my place to brush the sweat dump and hair away from his forehead, no matter how much I wanted to. Boy, I had really managed to mess things up royally. So, you're having a shower for Emma. He pouted comically, and I didn't get an invitation. Oh, I'm sure that was an oversight. Let me look into it, and I'll get back to you tomorrow. That's okay. I think I'm busy that day. You don't know which day it is. I'm a busy man in general. I shouldn't have laughed, but I couldn't help it. The fact was, it felt good, the two of us getting along, even if things were still tentative, uncertain. I wasn't about to talk myself into believing a single walk home meant we were on our way to being friends again, but I realized then and there how much I wanted us to be, how I very much wanted it. We approached my house, where I was glad to see the porch empty for once. It was too hot even for Poppy, my neighbor across the hall, to sit outside. That was fine with me, since I knew she would pepper me with questions if she saw me walking with Ethan. I had already told her about everything going on between us, and she had commiserated with me over a bottle of wine and a tub of ice cream. Not exactly the best combination, in hindsight. Thank you for walking me. I appreciate it. I know you're tired after a long day. We came to a stop at my front gate, and I turned to face him with more than a little trepidation. He offered a tired shrug. Don't worry about it. It's on my way anyway. Have a good night. And that was it. He crossed the street and continued on, hands in his pockets. I told myself I was getting off easy, that at least he hadn't laughed at my awkwardness, or worse yet, flat out ignored me. Still, I had to ask myself how it was so easy for him to stroll along without so much as a backward glance. Chapter 5 I spoke with Holly about the flowers, and she was beyond grateful. She's going with a gender-neutral theme since we're not sure about that yet. Olivia stuck her head out from inside the workroom. Wow, that's uncommon nowadays, isn't it? I thought the whole gender reveal thing was accepted as the way things are done now. Trust me, Mom would never pass up on the opportunity to throw a big, splashy event. But both Emma and Joe were against it. They want to be surprised. Good for them. I'm not sure I could handle the suspense for all those months. So what are we looking at? White? Yellow? Pale green? Yes, muted pastels was the term Holly used. Olivia gave me a thumbs up, so I guess that was all she needed to know. I went back to my checklist, running up and down the line. Mom's going to pick up the things she set aside in her storage space that she wants to give Emma at the shower, some of our baby toys she saved, and our christening dress. I tapped the pen against my chin. I guess if the baby's a boy, that would put a wrinkle in things. It's not like the baby would remember wearing a dress for his christening. Besides, there's still plenty of time. She can always have it made over. That's true. It's not like I'm going to have any kids to pass it down to. Did that sound like I was feeling sorry for myself? No doubt, because I was. The whole experience with Ethan was like a cloud hanging over my head. I could tell Olivia was about to try bucking up my spirits when the door to the shop flew open. I recognized Bobby Pierce instantly. She was wearing the same type of outfit she'd worn to her father-in-law's funeral. Although instead of black, her linen pantsuit was a shade of cream, I knew I would never manage to go an entire day without staining. I spent too much time at the cafe to have any illusions about neatness. Her chic blonde bob was pulled back in a low ponytail, and dark sunglasses covered half her face. She slid them up when entering, resting them on top of her head as she approached the counter. Good morning. I understand you ladies chatted with a few of my family members at the police station the other day. What a strange way to lead off. We did. I don't think you had gotten there yet. At least Olivia managed to sound cordial. Yes, we were running a little late. I thought I would be remiss if I didn't offer my own personal thanks for all the beautiful work you did. 
Truly, the flowers were stunning. It's a shame the photographing of flowers isn't as commonplace during a funeral as it is for a wedding. It's all right, I do get plenty of work that gets photographed. On a day like your father-in-law's funeral, what mattered most was paying tribute, and so many of his friends obviously wanted to. Bobby's nose wrinkled at her use of the word friends. Yes, of course. She tucked a strand of hair behind her ear, and I couldn't help but notice her diamond earrings. They had to be at least one carat apiece, maybe more. I wasn't exactly a jeweler, after all. Then she cleared her throat, telling me she was about to get down to business. I understand Emily Newberg visited your store earlier in the morning? I should have known she'd want to talk about that. She did? Olivia looked my way. We already spoke to the police about it, so I'm sure they'll be able to give you any information you want to know. I gave her a tiny nod. Bobby waved a hand. How she managed to lift it with so many rings was a mystery. I'm not trying to accuse you of anything, trust me. There were far too many people who hold a grudge against the old woman. I'm sure a florist is at the bottom of the list. I wasn't exactly thrilled with the way she said the word florist, with the obvious disdain behind it. I couldn't help myself. It's funny, hearing the way your family talks about her, too, it seems like none of you really liked her very much. It was a gamble. She could have either told me to mind my own business or taken the bait. I had a feeling the odds were in my favor. Bobby barked out a harsh laugh. <laughs> That's putting it mildly. She was a tyrant. Frankly, over the last year or so, a couple of us had questions about just how much influence she held over my father-in-law. I had to bite the inside of my cheek to keep from reacting too excitedly. How so? I made sure to add plenty of sympathy to my voice and expression so she wouldn't get the wrong idea. Well, it would have been the right idea, but she didn't need to know I was digging for information. It wasn't exactly the kind of thing the family wanted to air publicly, if only to spare the old man's image. But he wasn't feeling like his real self these last eighteen months or so. She went so far as to tap a perfectly manicured nail against the side of her head. Sometimes he called me by his mother's name, if you get my meaning. That's a shame. It's so sad to see people deteriorate that way. I shook my head in sympathy, clicking my tongue for good measure. So, what, you think she took advantage of that? Who's to say for sure, now that they're both gone? Bobby lifted her thin shoulders. The old man certainly liked to let us think he was under her influence. It was too tempting, like having a nice juicy prize dangled right in front of my face. How was I not supposed to reach for it? Like how? He used to say things just to get under our skin, like how he was leaving her all of his money because his children were a bunch of ingrates. She rolled her eyes. Granted, he might very well have done that, but if he did, I can only imagine it was her idea. She, of all people, would know how much he was worth. He told her more than he told his own sons. I couldn't help it. Is it true they were, you know? Bobby giggled. Oh my God, can you imagine? I don't even want to think about it. She shivered dramatically while I noticed she didn't actually answer the question. I decided not to ask again since I didn't want to gross her out or anything like that, as if older people were incapable of falling in love and having a relationship. I wondered if she knew about the crow's feet at the corners of her eyes and decided she most definitely did. It wouldn't be that much longer before she was middle-aged. Why did I feel like I needed to defend people I didn't know? I had no trouble believing Cornell had been a tyrant, one who had evidently enjoyed tormenting and taunting his children. Having met them, I wasn't sure I could blame him. But that was beside the point. He didn't deserve to be talked about like he'd lost the use of his faculties before he died, even if it was true. Unless that's what she wants you to believe. I stood up a little straighter when it finally hit me. What if this was her way of establishing doubt as to whether he was in his right mind before he died? Why would she start with us, two women in a florist shop? As it turned out, she answered my unspoken question only a moment after it occurred to me. There's something I wanted to ask you, ladies. Bobby lowered her voice until it was barely more than a whisper, though we were the only three people in the small store. Was Emily acting strangely at all when she was in here? 
That's hard for us to say. Olivia spoke slowly, looking my way from the corner of her eye. Since we'd never met her before that day. Oh, of course. But still, there are ways to tell even when a stranger is acting funny, right? You wouldn't see somebody on the street talking to themselves without making an assumption, right? I understand what you mean. And no, she didn't seem to be acting strangely to me. So she didn't seem forgetful, confused, or anything like that. Her eyes darted back and forth between us. I shrugged. No, in fact, she seemed sharp as a tack. It's just that she was acting a little strange in the days immediately after my father-in-law's passing. She touched a hand to her chest. I, for one, chalked it up to stress. She did a lot of work to arrange the funeral. She insisted. I suppose it was one last thing she could do for him, after all those years of service. I didn't like the way she said the word service, like it was a double entendre. For somebody who didn't want to entertain the idea of two older people being in love, she seemed awfully comfortable bringing it up. I'm sure that was it. It's never an easy time, losing someone, loved one or not. They worked together for an awfully long time, too, didn't they? Yes, I'm sure you're right. Though she was on blood pressure medication. She bit her lip, her brows drawn together. I just hope it wasn't a stroke or something like that. I hope she remembered to take her pills in the middle of all that stress. Well, I'm sure an autopsy will clear all of that up. I'm sure you're right. She fixed her sunglasses, placing them in front of her eyes again. Well, thank you for your time, and again, beautiful work. I'll be sure to keep you in mind for any events. Somehow I doubted it, but Olivia was gracious as she showed Bobby to the door. Meanwhile, I flipped over my checklist and started frantically scribbling notes. Boy, what a piece of work, huh? Olivia joined me, leaning in to see what I was writing. What's up? I'm writing down everything she said before I forget it. Why? She didn't seem the slightest bit suspicious to you? When Olivia only gave me a blank look, I decided to explain. For one thing, why did she come all the way over here to thank us for the flowers? A phone call would have been fine, or an email. But no, she had to come here in person. I don't know. I thought maybe she was trying to be polite? Something tells me that's out of character for her. I kept scribbling as I talked. Anyway, you notice how she went out of her way to tell us how the old man wasn't himself recently? How is that any of our business? What did it have to do with anything? Why would she bother telling us, though? I figured she likes to talk. Some people are like that. That made me laugh. Really? I had no idea, growing up at the cafe and hearing everybody's life stories. Yeah, I guess you would know about that. Anyway, you sort of proved my point by saying that. Nobody walks into a business they've never visited, introduces themselves to two people for the first time, then launches into a story about how she thinks her father-in-law might have been manipulated somehow. The whole thing felt forced and deliberate. I set the pen down, skeptical now. Unless you think I'm reading too much into it, that's completely possible. No, I thought it was weird too. Now that you mention it, what was all that stuff about wondering if Emily had a stroke? Wasn't that strange? Very strange. Now that I didn't feel completely off base, I found myself following the train of thought Olivia had put me on. You know, that sounded an awful lot like she was trying to start a rumor, plant the idea in our heads. But why? I knew how I was going to sound, and I knew once I said it and truly entertained the idea, there would be no turning back. I'd have to see it through. What if somebody in the family killed Emily, and that was Bobby's way of preemptively cleaning up the mess? Chapter 6 Darcy, hello, are you listening to me? My head snapped up when I finally noticed the irritation in Becca's voice. I'm sorry, my mind is wandering. What did you say? I was suggesting that maybe we ramp up our online advertising in the last couple of weeks of summer, you know? To make up for how much quieter the town is going to get over September and October? All I could do was shake my head in amazement. You're incredible. I don't know what I would do without you. She tried to play it off, but I could tell she was pleased with herself. I wanted her to be, too. I wasn't one of those bosses who got offended when an employee came up with a good idea. Distracted as I was, I needed all the help I could get. 
I wanted to encourage her to come up with more ideas, to grow the business alongside me. After all, we both benefited. That's a great idea. Let's set up a budget and make a plan. I finished stocking the romances, which seemed to be flying off the shelves. Is it just me, or are people devouring the romance section lately? You know why, right? Don't tell me it's because... Because two devoted lovers died within days of each other. She clasped her hands over her chest and batted her eyelashes. If I had to hear one more time how romantic that is, I swear. But it's selling books. People amaze me. There was still no confirmation the two of them were ever in a relationship at all. Becca's head tipped to one side, her eyes narrowing. What's up? What do you mean? Your energy is all off. You are distracted, and you almost seem annoyed. She was right. I was in all kinds of a funk. I told her about the visit from Bobby earlier in the day, if only to get her read on the situation. Do you think I'm overreacting? Am I making up things in my head? The truth? I don't love the sound of that. She snickered, finishing stocking the last of the mysteries. No, I don't think you're overreacting. I think it sounds pretty sketchy, like a kid covering up something before anybody has even accused them. I pointed at her. See, that's exactly what I was thinking. Great minds think alike. She chewed her lip, arms folded. What does it mean, though? That I'm not sure of, and it's probably why I've been so distracted since I came in to help close up. There's this nagging feeling in the back of my head telling me I should give somebody the heads up on this. As far as I know, nobody has actually been accused of killing the woman. That's true. I haven't heard that either. I could be jumping the gun. Then again, maybe I'm not. Maybe somebody did want her out of the way. Maybe she knew too much. I slapped my forehead when the realization dawned. What if she wasn't the one mistreating Cornell in his final days? What if it was one of his kids and she knew about it? I could tell from the light in her eyes that Becca was interested in this theory. Still, she was reticent. I don't think any foul play was announced in his passing, though, was it? That doesn't have to be what killed him. They could have been abusing him, taking his money a little at a time, that sort of thing. The more I thought about it, the more it made sense. The way they talk about her? I doubt there was much they got away with before she put a stop to it. She definitely seemed like a no-nonsense kind of person. That was putting it mildly. Wow, how do you manage to always get involved in situations like this? I gathered up the stacks of empty boxes from around the store while she chuckled at me. I wouldn't say I'm exactly involved. I just happened to be there when the whole thing happened. Are you going to tell somebody? Like, maybe your dad would like to know about this. Yeah, maybe. And maybe he would tell me to mind my own business. He was too close-lipped when I visited him last night. He'd never exactly approved of me being interested in things like this. We would only end up getting in an argument. Though that didn't mean it seemed like a good idea to keep this to myself. There was Joe, but then Joe was completely wrapped up in Emma and the baby. I was sure I'd never forget the way he practically jumped over the tables at the cafe when he found her crying. Besides, knowing him, his reaction would be the same as Dad's. They were cut from the same cloth, those two. That was probably why Emma married Joe in the first place. Weren't girls always supposed to marry men like their father? If that was the case, we'd definitely both gotten lucky. All that was left was for me to find my version of Dad. That left only one person I was close enough with to share an unfounded theory like this. I didn't love the idea of reaching out to Pete after the chilly reception he gave me at the station, though I couldn't pretend like the idea of seeing him again didn't have its perks, such as maybe getting to the bottom of why he was still so outwardly hostile toward me. I wanted to apologize, too, since I'd never really gotten the chance to do that. After breaking down the boxes for recycling out back, I pulled my phone from my pocket. Was this a good idea, or one of the worst I'd had in recent memory? There would be no way to know until I sent the message. My fingers flew over the screen. I know you probably don't want to speak to me, but something happened today related to the Newberg situation. It got my spidey senses tingling, and I thought maybe you would want to hear about it. Do you have a minute to chat? I sent it before I could talk myself out of it, then hurried back into the store, feeling guilty for some reason. You know what? Why don't you head home? I'll finish up around here. 
You've been carrying the load all week. Are you sure? Meanwhile, Becca was already getting her things together. No matter what she said, she was eager to get the heck out of there. I hustled her out and locked the door behind her before turning the sign from open to closed. As I did, my phone buzzed. I jumped on it like it was a live grenade. I have plans in a little bit, but I could stop by the store on my way if that's where you are. That was slick, the way he slipped in the fact that he had plans. I ignored that part. Sure, that would be fine. I'm cleaning up some things now. I'll wait for you. Then I ran to the restroom and ran a brush through my hair before putting on a little mascara and lip gloss. What a relief, being alone. I wasn't sure I could have stood the teasing I'd get if anybody saw me like this. It was another twenty minutes, but Pete was true to his word. I walked out of my office like I hadn't been sitting there chewing my nails, waiting for him to arrive. I was the picture of ease, at least in my own mind. Thanks for stopping by. I let him in, then locked the door again. Meanwhile, I did what I could to ignore how good he smelled. New cologne? Whatever it was, it was fantastic. I know better than to let you run wild with a theory. Oh, so that was how it was going to be. He suddenly didn't smell quite so good. That was the lie I told myself. He still smelled better than fresh-baked cookies. He even smelled better than books. It's not a theory. It was a theory. But I did have a conversation with Bobby Cornell this afternoon. His mouth fell open. Darcy, don't get the wrong idea. She went to the florist shop when I was there helping Olivia. She said she wanted to thank her for the beautiful flowers, and she was sorry she didn't have the opportunity to do it the other day at the station. They were running late. He scowled, shoving balled-up fists into his pockets. Yeah, they kept me waiting an extra hour. Must be nice to think everybody runs on your schedule. That was unlike him. He wasn't usually snarky and bitter. I hated to think I might be a part of the reason for that, if not the entire reason. Anyway, I found it really funny that she went out of her way to make it seem like Emily was starting to lose it a little bit. She asked us if Emily was confused at the shop. And you told her she wasn't? Of course. Then she said the weirdest thing about Emily's blood pressure medication. How she hoped Emily was remembering to take it in the days leading up to the funeral. She mentioned the word stroke and everything. It was the change in his posture that told me he was finally listening, really and truly. His shoulders fell a little, and he didn't look like there was a metal rod holding him upright anymore. She went out of her way to use that word? She did. Am I wrong, or does that seem kind of strange? I don't know about strange, but I'll go with unnecessary. You'd never met the woman, and I'm assuming you weren't acquainted with Bobby before that visit? No, we don't exactly run in the same circles. I didn't think so. He stroked his jaw, staring at a row of mystery novels. I'm glad you reached out about this. It does seem like she was trying to compensate for something. Compensate for what she was covering up? I didn't say that. Don't put words in my mouth. I fell back a step at his sharpness. Right, of course. Though she also said something about not trusting Emily. When you spoke to the other family members, did they mention their father having dementia or something like that? His mouth opened, then snapped shut. I can't discuss that. Come on, I'm not asking you to tell me a secret. And why would I have brought it up if Bobby didn't? I'm not making this up off the top of my head, you know. His exasperated sigh sounded so much like my father's, it was uncanny. So she told you that, huh? Let me guess, she wanted to cast doubt on Emily's intentions. I tapped my finger to the tip of my nose. Bingo. Of course, all of it was made to sound like she was just concerned about Pierce's well-being before he died. There was no reason for her to open up and tell us all those things, but she did. It was a good thing the man couldn't read my mind, or else he would know the difficulty I was having not asking what brand of cologne he was using. Why did he never affect me like this before, when I could have maybe done something about it? I knew the answer, and it disappointed me. I didn't appreciate him before. It took weeks of being apart, and knowing he wanted nothing to do with me anymore, to turn me into a teenager with a crush on a cute boy. I wasn't proud of myself. Like I said, I'm glad you reached out. Thank you. This is all very interesting, and I'll have to keep it in mind now that the preliminary blood screening is due in the morning. I couldn't hide my interest. Really? Do you think there's going to be something funny in it? He rubbed the bridge of his nose, eyes squeezed shut. 
I shouldn't have said that. Why don't I know better by now? Come on, this is me you're talking to. You know it won't go any further than the store. That's not what I'm worried about. He went to the door and unlocked it, turning to look at me before opening. Do me a favor. I know this is gonna fall on deaf ears, but at least try to listen and pay attention. Leave this alone. It could be a case of the family trying to get ahead of any scandal that might pop up. People like that, it's how they operate. It's all about the optics. Gee, when did he start talking like that? Just when I thought he couldn't interest me more, he went and got all serious. Yeah, you could be right. No, I, I know I'm right. Just like I know you aren't taking me seriously right now. But you'd better. Interfering in any case that might come out of this could end up going badly for you. Once again, I took a step back. Is that a threat? He shook his head a little, his eyes going wide for a second. N no, I didn't mean that as a threat. I I'm just saying, interfering in a case could get you in trouble. And there won't always be somebody hanging around the station who can get you out of it. With that, he left, leaving me to wonder if he'd ever gotten me out of trouble without my knowing it. I never did get a chance to apologize, either. Chapter 7 I bet you're glad Rachel will be back tomorrow. Olivia was in the back, working on a couple of last-minute orders. How she managed to be so efficient and artistic while only using one hand was incredible. Not at all. You know I've had fun here with you. And I had much more fun than I could have anticipated. Olivia had taught me countless things about building bouquets, arranging flowers in a vase. After practicing, I felt pretty confident about my new skills, how to create corsages, all kinds of things. Life gets a little repetitive at the bookstore. I find that hard to believe. I'm sure you get plenty of interesting people in there all the time. Yes, but they're usually the same interesting people over and over. I pulled the broom from the closet and started sweeping up behind the counter. I'd gotten bits of floral foam and tape all over the place while I was practicing with some smaller blooms that Olivia didn't plan on using for anything. I reached under the counter and swept up anything that happened to be hanging around down there. At first, I was ready to dismiss the sparkle in the middle of a few withered flower petals as a piece of glitter or something similar. It wasn't until I crouched down and picked it up that I realized I was holding Bobby Cornell's diamond earring in my hand. It must have fallen out when she came in yesterday. My pulse went berserk as the implications of this unspooled in my head. I had an excuse to speak to her again. My fingers closed around the diamond as I tried to figure out how best to approach this. I jumped when Olivia came out of the back of the store, like I was doing something to feel guilty about. Nothing could have been further from the truth, but that didn't help me shake my nervousness as I tucked the earring into my pocket. Why I wanted to keep it a secret was a mystery even to me. Instinct told me to, and my instincts were rarely off. Unless men were involved, in which case I was a hopeless mess. I was thinking small arrangements of hydrangea with a few roses for the shower. What do you think? She hadn't noticed me filching the earring, at least it didn't seem that way. I stood up and continued sweeping. I think that sounds way too generous. Nonsense! Besides, your niece or nephew is practically Cape Hope royalty before they're even born. Nothing but the best. She winked, chuckling, before ducking back into her workroom. While she was back there, I was waiting at the front counter for a few customers to come in and pick up their arrangements. I decided to do a little sleuthing on my phone. If I was going to visit the house, I wanted to know who I would be dealing with. From what I understood, the entire family was staying out there. Dad had been wrong about none of the Cornell sons working a job. Peter was a big-shot hedge fund guy in Manhattan. He was in his mid-fifties and had married Bobby only five years earlier. There was a story in the New York Times about their wedding, which looked like it was a big social event. It seemed a lot of the narratives surrounded Peter's former playboy status and how Bobby had managed to lock down the city's most eligible bachelor. Matthew, meanwhile, was only a few years younger than his brother and had been through two ugly divorces. His first wife, Deirdre, had threatened self-harm when she got her divorce papers. Tammy, the second wife, had already been impregnated by another man around the time that impending divorce made the papers. One thing that had struck me as interesting was how little the ex-wives actually got from him, since much of his wealth wasn't actually his. I did a little more digging before confirming what I'd guessed. 
The boys had come into their trust funds at the age of 20, but the money they'd been gifted was hardly more than a small percentage of the pie. They lived large, all of them, but none of them would ever truly be considered wealthy until they inherited the rest of their father's estate. And until then, restaurants, bars, and stores were willing to extend their tabs, banking on the fact they would eventually get their money back. Yet not everybody felt so generous. There was a story about a dispute Oliver Cornell had recently settled with a store on Fifth Avenue who claimed he hadn't paid for so much as a pair of socks in years. The previous owner had been okay with keeping his debt off the books, but once the store had fallen into the hands of a larger corporation, things had changed. Isn't it funny? I turned to Olivia, who joined me behind the counter. These rich people refusing to pay for things the way you or I would. How do you think they managed to stay so rich? She had a point. Driftwood. Growing up so close to the beach, I'd seen it all my life. As such, I had to wonder why Pierce Cornell's ancestors had decided to name their palatial beach house after wood that washed up on the shore, worn down, smoothed of its rough edges. Junk, for the most part. The word junk did not come to mind as I pulled up in front of the gate separating the rabble from the magnificent emerald green trimmed mansion and surrounding estate. I wondered if they would let my car through the gate, old as it was. I rolled down my window and pressed the button beneath the speaker, through which a voice filtered moments later. Can I help you? Yes, I have something belonging to Mrs. Cornell. She visited a florist shop in town yesterday and dropped something there. I hardly got the sentence out of my mouth before a horn blared out behind me. I turned in my seat to find a flashy red Ferrari practically touching my rear bumper. The driver leaned out. Open the gate, Paul. I recognized him as Matthew and Valerie's son, Greg. Just like that, the gate began to swing open, and I made a mental note to thank Greg once we were out of our cars. The driveway wound up a slight incline, leveling out a few hundred yards away from the circular courtyard in front of the mansion. The estate had a gingerbread trim, wraparound porch, and windows. Tons of windows. The house must have been full of natural light all the time, and the view couldn't have been anything less than spectacular. When it was all lit up inside, I imagined the house would glow like a jewel against the night sky. Greg pulled in behind me. Thank you so much. I hurried over to him, one hand out thrust. I was one of the... I remember you. I saw you at the funeral. Greg was dressed in what looked like gym clothes. I wondered where he went to the gym around here, whether there was anything high class enough for him. He slung a bag over his shoulder rather than shake my hand. Why are you here? I have something I think belongs to your aunt. She visited the store yesterday, and I noticed she was wearing earrings like this. I pulled the earring from my pocket and held it out in the palm of my hand. I found it on the floor under the counter this morning. The last thing I would have expected him to do was burst out laughing, but that was what he did. Oh man, is she going to be happy to see you? She's been freaking out over the earrings since yesterday. He waved me along behind him before jogging up the steps leading to the porch. Come on, I want to see this. All of a sudden, I wasn't sure this was such a good idea. I didn't like the feeling of being put on the spot. But the chance to get a look at the inside of the house, maybe see a few of the family members in action, was too much to resist. The inside of the house didn't disappoint. A sweeping staircase greeted us upon stepping inside, wide enough to split into two separate stairwells. Each led to what I guessed were the two different wings of the house. To my right was a big open living room that looked like it came straight from the pages of an architecture magazine. It was flawless down to the carefully coordinated throw pillows and art hanging on the walls. There was a dining room to my left. I wanted to ask what color they used on the walls, since I'd never seen such a rich, deep blue and was instantly in love with it. I had a good feeling nobody in the house would have an answer, though. Bobby! So Greg didn't bother with formalities, like referring to his aunt as his aunt. Where are you? Somebody's here to see you! I noticed a woman, in what could only be a housekeeper's uniform, darting from one room to the other with her head down, like she wanted to avoid being noticed. The clicking of heels on the upstairs landing drew my attention, and I looked up to find Bobby beginning her march down the stairs. Who is it? She paused when her gaze fell on me, her mouth tipping downward at the corners, as she obviously struggled to remember where she knew me from. Mrs. Cornell, we met yesterday in the florist shop in town. 
I found this under the counter and remembered admiring them on your ears yesterday. I held out the earring for her inspection. She clapped her hands over her head before crossing them over her chest and practically running the rest of the way downstairs. Thank you so much. There I was thinking. She shook her head. It was so good of you to come all this way. It wasn't all that far, though it had felt like I had landed on the moon or on a different planet entirely. There was a loud conversation going on upstairs, which I had to pretend not to hear, not to mention what sounded like demolition. Please let me make it up to you. Bobby pocketed the earring, raising her voice and speaking deliberately to be understood. These earrings were a wedding gift for my husband, so they mean a lot to me. Maybe you should make sure they stay in your ears, then. Greg sauntered off, chuckling. The expression on Bobby's face changed in a flash, becoming something twisted and ugly before quickly fixing itself, but not quick enough that I didn't see it. Obviously, there was no love lost between them. My skin was beginning to crawl. I didn't belong there and needed to leave even if curiosity had me wanting to stay. Please don't even think about it. I don't need any repayment. You're being insulting. Apparently Greg didn't feel like keeping his nose out of it, calling out to us on his way to another room. I'm not insulted. I appreciate your thoughtfulness, I stated. Bobby touched one hand to her forehead, closed her eyes for a second, then took a deep breath. If you only knew how crazy it's been around here. For the first time, it hit me she might not have had a lot of people to talk to. Being surrounded by people wasn't the same as having a confidant. And sometimes, what was needed most was somebody who wasn't directly involved in the situation. Like the way I sometimes vented to Poppy when Mom drove me crazy, or the men in my life threw me into a state of confusion. I found myself feeling sorry for the woman in front of me. I'm sorry. Things do get a little messy in the days after a funeral and I'm sure it's only more complicated in your family's case. You have no idea. We both winced at what sounded like a crash coming from upstairs. Bobby let out a shaky breath, one hand over her chest. I'm sorry, Oliver's been on a rampage. Right, and he had mentioned wanting to dig around, hadn't he? I dug my nails into my palms, determined not to look too eager. We all process our grief in different ways. I knew it sounded lame, but I didn't expect her to laugh like she did. Sure, that's one way to describe it. Greg wandered back in, munching on an apple. I'm sure she doesn't want to hear our family drama, Bobby. He rolled his eyes behind his aunt's head. I offered what little bit of a smile I felt safe to offer. I wasn't trying to insult anybody. And yes, I could have made my leave then and there. But there was too much juicy stuff going on. Don't you have something to do? Bobby rolled her eyes the way her nephew did, folding her arms over her splashy floral caftan. Aren't there other people you could annoy? Anyway, I'm just glad I could help. One less thing to worry about, right? Quite the little girl scout. I gritted my teeth at Greg and reminded myself I was nearly ten years older than him, an adult while he was obviously a child, no matter what kind of car he drove. Clearly, he was bored of this. I'm going down to the beach. Bobby gave him a brittle smile. Try not to drown. Okay, I had definitely stayed longer than I should have. I should go. I'll let all of you do what you need to do. I wasn't quick enough, though, because Peter came storming down the stairs before I could take my leave. That's stupid, pig-headed, son of a... He stopped when he saw me. Sorry, I didn't know we had company. Bobby's demeanor changed in an instant. She found my earring in town and was nice enough to bring it over. I was surprised she didn't bat her eyelashes and coo at him. Peter finished descending the stairs and shook my hand, his grip firm. Thank you very much. Those earrings have a lot of sentimental value for my wife. You probably have a terrible opinion of us, if you've heard anything going on between my brother and me upstairs. I'm sure she doesn't want to hear about that. Bobby wound an arm around her husband's, squeezing a little. I could have reminded her I'd already heard quite a bit about it, but thought it would be safer to hold my tongue. I swear, he did this on purpose. Oliver's voice grew louder, and to my horror, I realized it meant he was walking down the stairs. One last way to stick it to us. I bet he's watching right now, laughing himself sick. 
He appeared on the landing, a glass of what looked like whiskey in one hand. His clothes were rumpled, along with his hair, a little sweaty, a little dusty. He'd been digging in earnest. If he gave everything to that old bag after all this trouble, I'm gonna... Oliver! Peter's voice was sharp enough to bring his brother up short. We have a guest, and you're giving her the impression we're nothing but a bunch of vultures. Oliver squinted up at me from the top of the stairs. Oh, it's you. You've got a habit of turning up. Like a bad penny. Something about that struck him as hilarious, though I figured the whiskey might have something to do with it, too. Regardless of the reason why, he cackled like a hyena. As for our family... He started down the stairs. I wished he'd hold on to the railing, since he swayed slightly the whole way down. I held my breath, watching. We are a bunch of vultures. Why pretend to be anything else? Bobby's laughter was tight, forced. Okay, Ollie, we get the point. You can stop performing now. I'm not performing, and you know it. Oliver joined us at the foot of the stairs, where I had the pleasure of once again being appraised. This time, though, it seemed my appraiser struggled to make his eyes focus. Why don't you go back upstairs and rest for a while? Peter's jaw was clenched tight enough to crack walnuts. You're overtired. That's right. Send baby up to bed. Oliver turned around, this time gripping the railing to steady himself. I'm the only one who cared enough to look into whether we're getting what's coming to us, but sure. Enough. Peter's face was now roughly the color of an eggplant. Go upstairs. Oliver snickered to himself the entire way up. Yes, it was well past time to make tracks. It was very nice to see you both, and I hope everything calms down soon. I made a point to hold Bobby's gaze for a beat longer than was strictly necessary, trying to convey my sympathy. I then showed myself to the door, which wasn't difficult since it was right behind me. Why did she come in the house? Peter wasn't smart enough to wait until I had the door completely closed before he asked the question. Either that or he didn't care one way or another whether I heard him. How would I know that idiot nephew of yours let her in? Anyway, at least there are still honest people in the world. Peter snickered. Unlike my brother. I should have left. I knew it. Every second I spent hovering near the door was a second closer to disaster. It's just as important to us as it is to him that he finds your father's papers. It's not our fault he kept us in the dark all those years, taunting, keeping us on the edge of our seats. That sick, twisted old man. They started moving toward the living room, and I followed, careful to dart between the windows as they crept along the porch. They were too busy with themselves to notice. At least that's what I'd hoped. I keep telling you to be patient. It can't be more than a couple of days before the lawyer can come down and read the will. Not a moment too soon. Everything will turn out fine. I'm telling you, just as I said, there is never a chance of your father writing all of you out of the will. You know how much he loved to torment you. Nobody needs to remind me of that. Another crash, loud enough that even I jumped. He's going to tear the entire house down. Peter stormed off, shouting as he ran up the stairs. I could hear his feet hitting every step. What an incredibly deranged family. I peeked through the window with one eye, watching as Bobby settled in with a magazine. She sat with her back to me, so I figured the chances were pretty good I would be able to escape without being noticed. I tiptoed around the porch again and practically ran for the car. So that was it. All of their father's taunting and threats had gotten to them. Oliver was trying his hardest to find something, anything, that would confirm what was eating away at him. He wanted to make sure his lifestyle would be subsidized now that his father was gone. I guess that might be enough to drive anybody into a frenzy, especially a person who'd lived off his family name his entire life. It might be enough to make a person desperate. Desperate enough to kill? I decided to go to the one person who knew more about Cave Hope and its many secrets and mysteries than anybody else. Rather than driving home, I turned the car in the direction of my Aunt Trixie's. If anybody could shed a little light on the family, it was her. Chapter 8 Have you ever actually heard of a family member being murdered so somebody could get their inheritance? Trixie pretended to stumble a little in surprise at my question like I had shocked her sensibilities or something similarly horrible. I knew nothing could be further from the truth. 
a lifetime of working as a journalist, had left her fairly unflappable. Wow, getting right down to brass tacks today. Well, I told you there was something I wanted to ask you when I got here. And here I was, thinking it had something to do with calming your mother down now that the shower is just around the corner. You know she bought three new outfits for it and can't decide which one she wants to go with. I couldn't help but laugh a little, though it was full of affection. That doesn't surprise me in the least. Trixie handed me a glass of lemonade before settling in with some of her own. I couldn't remember the last time I'd been to her house. Normally we met up at the cafe, the bookstore, at Mom's. It was just as flashy as she was, and just as heavily decorated in various animal prints. The woman did have a way about her. So you want to know if I ever reported on a story where murder and inheritance were involved? Exactly. Her gaze was shrewd, knowing. This wouldn't have anything to do with Pierce Cornell, would it? Whatever gave you that idea? She pursed her ruby-red lips. This is me you're talking to. What are you getting yourself into this time? Did anyone ever tell you you sound a lot like my mother sometimes? I'm sure the fact that I've known you since the day you were born has nothing to do with that. When I wouldn't back down, she gave an exasperated sigh. Of course, there have been times when wealthy people were murdered because relatives wanted to get their hands on the estate. I reported on that sort of thing once or twice. I'm sure you could find my work archived somewhere. She hit me with a stern look over the red frames of her glasses. Don't tell me you think Cornell was murdered. There was nothing about his death that pointed to foul play. It's not even so much Pierce I'm concerned with. Who then, Emily? Don't pretend you never heard the stories about the two of them. The way I hear it, Pierce used to threaten the kids and tell them he would leave all his money to her instead of them. She laughed. Yes, that sounds like him. I interviewed him a few times back in the day, when he was covering high-profile cases here in New Jersey. Wealthier families from up closer to New York, but still of local interest. He was a piece of work. That might be the most generous way I've heard him described yet. And those kids of his have always been a nightmare. You have no idea how many times Cornell's people reached out to journalists to shut down stories that they were going to publish about the family. I couldn't help it. Curiosity sent goosebumps racing across my skin. Like what? Why do you think it matters? She leaned back against the cushions, staring at me while she made herself comfortable. I fought the urge to squirm under her inquisitive stare while she arranged a zebra print skirt over her legs. I don't know. I'm curious is all. That's a lie. Don't you know better than to lie to me? You don't make it easy, do you? When she didn't so much as blink, I caved. You have to promise me you're not going to say anything about this to Mom. That's a good lead-off if I ever heard one. Trixie, please. This is just a theory I have. But you know what will happen if she finds out. She'll take it and run with it. I placed my glass on the coffee table, then folded my hands. Please, I'm begging you. Fine, fine, I won't say a word. She went so far as to make a big dramatic X over her heart. I would spit in my palm and have you shake on it, but no, thank you. I then told her everything I knew so far, right down to the conversation I heard at the house and that creepy performance by Oliver. I know it doesn't technically mean anything. You're right, it doesn't. Still, when she said it, her voice was surprisingly soft. Her gaze was unfocused, too, drifting over my shoulder and out the window. You know, I can almost see steam coming out of your ears. She shot me a look. Hush, I'm thinking. Because you know it means something. Her head fell back and she let out a groan that sounded like it came from all the way down in her toes. You're just as bad as your mother, both of you. You get an idea in your head and you can't let go of it. She then raised her head and she wasn't smiling. I'm going to be upfront with you about this. Yes, it sounds pretty suspicious from where I'm sitting. But then everything about that family is complicated, twisted. Nothing is cut and dried. I got that feeling. Then, listen to me. I couldn't remember a time she'd ever sounded so serious. Leave it alone. We're not talking about normal people who believe laws apply to them. Quite the opposite. You thought what Charlotte Kingston did to you earlier this summer was bad? That is nothing compared to what a family with as much money as the Cornells can do. They can cover up anything. She lowered her brow, staring holes through me. Anything. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? I shivered. Are you telling me they've covered up really terrible things? That's a very nice way of saying it, yes. There were rumors and stories of ghastly allegations against at least two of the three sons. Let me guess, Oliver was one of them. She inclined her head in silent affirmation. They can make anything disappear, or anybody, all right? Frankly, if any of them was involved in Emily's death, it would be no worse than what I've already heard about. NDAs, disappearances, accusers whose homes were suddenly paid off, their debts suddenly cleared. A few young women were literally never heard from again. Her voice shook with sudden emotion. I don't want you getting involved with this family, or anything to do with them, all right? Do you understand? What else was there to say? Fact was, the woman had me shaken in my boots. Sure, of course. I'll steer clear. Good. I'll sleep easier at night knowing that. She went back to her lemonade, and it was clear she was relaxing somewhat as she sipped it. Have you talked to your mother lately? Deft change of subject. I was willing to let it go. I was going to swing by the cafe, then send Becca home and close up the shop. Well, you won't find your mother at the cafe. Why not? Because she's not feeling well today. I stopped in earlier, and Frankie told me she'd stayed home. Wow, I could have counted Mom's sick days on two hands and still had fingers left over. I hope it's nothing too serious. So do I, since the shower's in five days and it would kill her if she couldn't make it. On the way to the store, I gave Mom a call. Don't worry about me. That was easy for her to say, but the thickness of her voice told another story. She was stuffed up worse than I'd ever heard her. I hope it isn't the flu or something. She gasped. Don't even say that. It's probably just allergies. Besides, it's not flu season yet. I'm sure you're right. I was not sure she was right, but Mom was one of the healthiest people I'd ever known, not to mention her stubbornness. She would find a way to will herself out of this. I was going to stop by the storage facility today and pick up those things I'd set aside. Can you do that for me? I hadn't exactly planned on driving out of town, but I told her I would do it. She offered to leave the key to the unit under the mat on the porch so we wouldn't have to come into contact with each other. As I wrapped things up at the store, then drove back out of town to the storage facility, Trixie's warnings played on an endless loop in my head. I couldn't shake the certainty that somebody had murdered Emily, even if I couldn't imagine how they would manage it. She had seemed just fine one minute, then the next, she was in a heap beside Cornell's casket. From where I sat in the back of the delivery van, I hadn't seen anything unusual. It seemed to me that the type of awful things Trixie had alluded to wouldn't have included ways of killing a person in broad daylight with a hundred witnesses. I had a pretty good idea of the acts the Cornell boys had been accused of, and this seemed a little too sophisticated, a little too planned. Though what did I know? They might have been planning this for a long time. Even before their father had died, they might have been planning on getting rid of her. From all accounts, she had made life difficult for them. The facility was eerily quiet when I arrived, and the overhead lights that flickered on in response to my motion sent a chill down my spine. Maybe I should have waited until morning to make this trip. There was nothing Mom wanted to pick up that couldn't have waited for one more day. But I had already driven the 45 minutes. Honestly, I couldn't understand why she'd chosen a facility this far from home, but I wasn't about to run home with my tail tucked between my legs just because I was already freaked out. At least Mom had known where to find the things she was looking for. They were in one of those plastic storage bins labeled Darcy and Emma Baby Stuff. I took it and practically ran out of the facility, my footfalls echoing ominously while the lights flickered on and off. I couldn't have been happier to get back in the car and lock the doors, where at least I felt safe. Still, I was a little twitchy. I thought about calling Emma and having a chat, but then thought better of it when I realized she would want to know where I was, why I was driving around. No way would she get off my back unless I fessed up. I wasn't about to crumble under her interrogation, so it was better to avoid calling her in the first place. I switched on the radio instead and sang along to a song that was popular when I was in middle school. It occurred to me that the music of my youth would one day show up on an oldies station, and the thought made me grimace. But that was the way of life, after all. My sister was married and about to have her first baby in a few months. Things were changing. I let my thoughts wander as mile after mile ticked away behind me, the car moving easily through light traffic on the parkway. 
The sight of my exit came as a relief. There was a red light up ahead and I slowed down in preparation. Yet when I hit the brake, nothing happened. I pushed down on the pedal until it was even with the floor mat, and still the car wouldn't stop. I was coming close to the light, and there were cars moving past in both directions. Stop! Stop! As if the car would hear me and respond. I could either lean on the horn and hope everybody coming to the light would stop in time, or I could drive off the road, which is what I did. I aimed the car for a light pole at the bottom of the ramp and closed my eyes, hoping it wouldn't hurt too much when I made impact. Chapter 9 How many times have I begged you to get a better car? Dad, I'm fine. Things happen sometimes. My father stared at me like he'd never seen me before. Are you serious right now? You could have been killed tonight, and you're going to tell me these things happen? All of a sudden your brakes failed, but these things happen? My brakes have never failed out of nowhere, Darcy. That kind of thing doesn't randomly happen. I closed my eyes, resting my head against the pillow beneath it. I didn't need it, just like I didn't need to be in the hospital at all. I wasn't hurt, maybe a little sore, but it wasn't serious. What I couldn't shake was the heart-stopping fear of those final moments, moments when I had to question whether this was my last night on earth. It was the type of feeling only a person who sees impending doom coming their way could understand. I could have told myself all I wanted to before this night, that I would understand what it meant for life to flash before my eyes. The fact was, I couldn't possibly have grasped what it felt like. Still, everything had turned out okay. Maybe not for the car, but I was in good shape. Dad, I'm okay. I opened my eyes and reached for his hand, which he closed around mine. Thank you for coming to the hospital. Where else would I be? He took a seat next to the bed, still holding my hand. Just because you're not Georgie's age anymore doesn't mean you're not my little girl. Okay, now you're going to make me cry. It wasn't often he got mushy or sentimental. This wasn't the average situation, though. Promise me you're going to get a more reliable car. Dad, promise. What if I say I'll do the best I can? I mean, you realize I'm not exactly rolling in dough, right? I grinned, trying to lighten the mood to no avail. Sure, my online sales have taken off, but that's not going to be enough to pay for a flashy new car. I never said it had to be flashy. I didn't even say it had to be new. It would be new to me, though, which is what I meant. He winced, rubbing his temple with a hand not holding mine. You're giving me a headache. I should be the one with a headache now, not you. He didn't see the humor in that, and I wished I hadn't said it. Sorry. What if I told you I'll pay for half? I'd thank you for the generous offer, then turn you down. He scowled, and I scowled back. We'd see how he liked it. I'm a grown woman who's taken care of herself for a long time. I won't have you taking food out of my baby brother's mouth so I can get another car. And I thought your sister was the dramatic one. I cringed. Low blow. Well, maybe it's what you deserve for being so obstinate. I'm trying to help you. And I'd sleep a lot easier at night if I knew you were driving around in a reliable car. You know, I don't do too much driving in general. Darcy. I knew better than to keep teasing him. Let's talk about it later, okay? I'm too sore right now to keep talking about it. No matter how hard I had tried to keep from tensing up, Bracing myself for impact, I was still achy in my arms, shoulders, and back. He frowned, grabbing for the call button to summon a nurse. This is ridiculous. They've kept you waiting far too long. Dad, I don't need that much attention. They're only waiting for the scan results to come back, and I'm sure they'll be fine. Oh, you're a doctor now. He was in full-on grumbling dad mode. I knew better than to fuss with him once he reached that stage. He'd end up taking his frustration with me out on an innocent nurse. I settled back and closed my eyes again, while he prowled around, ready to demand to know why his daughter had to wait like a normal person. It was sweet, if a little embarrassing. He didn't get a lot of chances to act like this for his older kids, and I had to wonder if he didn't like it a little, feeling needed by somebody besides Georgie. Semi-retirement had left him drifting a little, trying to find ways to contribute and fill his time. Though I wasn't about to let him buy me a car, the most I'd agree to would be going housies, and even then I'd pay him back. I'd give the money to Holly if I had to. 
I was sure she'd sigh and say something about the Harmons and about how impossible we all were. I was also sure she'd take it, especially if I told her to use it on the baby. I'd have to give Georgie a bigger hug than usual the next time I saw him. Tears prickled behind my eyelids, but I willed them away. I was perfectly fine, a little banged up, but I'd seen worse. At least the tub I'd pulled from the storage space was okay. I had begged the responders who came out to the scene of the accident to let me bring it to the hospital with me. I wasn't about to leave anything up to chance. Not only would my mother kill me, but it would seem like the entire trip was for nothing, like I'd almost gotten myself killed on an errand that resulted in lost treasure. Besides, if the tub was lost, I would have had to explain to Mom just how that happened. I had no intention of telling her about any of this. I wasn't badly hurt, and there was no reason to worry her when she already felt under the weather. She would insist on coming over to baby me, too, and I didn't want to catch whatever she had. No sense in everybody getting sick. The curtain opened. Miss Harmon? The doctor looked more than slightly harassed, and the sight of my father standing behind him explained why. I wanted to apologize, but that would have only gotten me into trouble. I settled for giving him my guiltiest look. It appears everything is in good working order. You got very lucky. She's smart, that's what happened. Dad stood next to me, arms folded, and he sounded insulted. That's also true. Poor guy, though I doubted Dad was the first concerned parent he'd ever seen. Take it easy for a couple days and you'll be fine. You heard that? Dad looked down at me. Take it easy. Would you take it easy if this was you? We're not talking about me right now, we're talking about you. He stood outside the curtained-off room while I changed out of my hospital gown. I didn't understand why I needed to put it on in the first place, then insisted on getting me a wheelchair rather than letting me walk out to the parking lot. I was too tired to argue. Besides, it was nice, knowing somebody wanted to take care of me. Now please, remember what I asked. I stood at my front door, watching as Dad set the tub down in the living room. Please, let's not tell Mom about this. Normally, I would have no problem with one of you girls asking me to keep something from her. It's not exactly as if we speak on the phone every day. He looked grim as he slid his hands into his pockets. But this is different. It feels downright sneaky. It's not sneaky. It is if you deliberately try to keep something from your mother. Dad, you know how she is. She'll turn this into a huge near-death experience type of thing. Who says it wasn't? Give me strength. Thanks. I don't think I'm going overboard by honestly assessing what happened earlier this evening. But everything turned out okay. I'm fine. The car got banged up, but it'll be fine too. And if it would make you happy, I'll split the cost of a used car with you. I was saving that one, my ace in the hole. His eyes narrowed. You're shrewd. I had good teachers. He couldn't argue with that. All right, you drive a hard bargain, but I'm willing to see to it your mother doesn't find out about this. If she does, it won't be for me. That much I can promise. My muscles loosened as relief swept over me. Thank you, you have no idea the agony you spared me. That earned me a gentle laugh. You forget how long your mother and I were married. Believe me, I have an idea. He then opened his arms and engulfed me in a hug. I let myself cling to him a little longer than I would have under any other circumstances. For a second, I let myself be his little girl again. I let myself tremble a little, because no matter how I insisted everything was fine, I was still shaken up inside. A hot shower and a couple of ibuprofen had me feeling better by the time I slid between the sheets. I was sure I wouldn't be able to fall asleep, at least not right away. The next thing I knew, my phone was ringing and when I opened my eyes, there was sunlight streaming into the room. How had I overslept? I never had to set an alarm, always waking up at five o'clock, if not earlier. There had been nothing to wake me up until the phone rang. I must have needed to sleep. A quick glance at the time told me it was already closing in on eight o'clock. I cringed at what Becca must have been thinking. Darcy, I'm sorry if I woke you. I didn't recognize the voice, and the number was unfamiliar. I'm sorry, who is this? Of course, sorry. It's Dale Green from over at the mechanic shop. Oh, hi, Dale. He had been Dad's mechanic for years and was the guy I always went to for oil changes and car maintenance. Sorry, I'm a little fuzzy-brained this morning. No need to apologize. 
I heard what happened last night and I came in early. The cops had the car towed over here and I wanted to take a look at it. I only had it in here for inspection a couple of months ago, so it stuck in my craw. Right, I'd almost forgotten about that. The summer had been such a whirlwind. The car had passed with flying colors, but then it normally did. Did you find anything unusual? I knew from the way he hesitated. Unfortunately, I did. I sat up in bed, wincing when my sore muscles cried out. What is it? Again, he hesitated, and my heart clenched. I hate to put it to you this way, but somebody cut your brake lines. Chapter 10 Amazing how one piece of information can make the entire world look different. There I was, ready to pop a couple of ibuprofen and get on with my day, but the call from Dale had sent everything into a tailspin. It was one thing to have an accident, but another to know it was no accident. Who would do that to me? And why? Of course my thoughts went in one direction and stayed there. I couldn't imagine why, though. Why would anybody do that to me? The Cornells had no reason to believe I was a threat to them. What if one of them followed me around after I'd visited the house? I hadn't exactly been paying strict attention after I left Driftwood. I was too busy thinking about the questions I wanted to ask Trixie once I made it to her house. And when I was inside, there was plenty of time for someone to... To what? Crawl under my car and cut the lines? That was what Dale theorized before we got off the phone. Newer model cars were lower to the ground, so to reach the lines, someone would have to pop the hood. Older models like mine, however, had all the room in the world underneath. The person who did it would have to know what they were doing, but it wouldn't take them long. It did seem unlikely that someone would pull a stunt like that in broad daylight, though. Then again, who would ever think to be on the lookout for something like that? Cape Hope was a quiet town for the most part, and Trixie lived on a peaceful, tree-lined street full of cute little houses with cute little families inside. If someone happened to drive past and find a man or woman on their back under a car, they might easily dismiss it. I had done a lot of driving around after that, and eventually the brake fluid had run out. That one little bit of information took what I was willing to dismiss as one of those things that happen sometimes and turned it into the chilling knowledge that someone had threatened my life. Once I was out of the shower, all I could do was sit on my bed, staring at the walls. Even my sore back and shoulders didn't bother me. I hardly felt anything. So this is what it's like to feel numb inside. My phone buzzed, and I jumped a mile. What did I expect, for someone to laugh maniacally on the other end and warn me to mind my own business? The sight of Pete's name on the screen both relieved and worried me. Why was he calling out of nowhere? He didn't keep me waiting. I heard what happened. For one brief, heart-stopping moment, I thought he was calling because he was concerned, because he wanted to see how I was doing. That might have been part of the reason, but that wasn't all of it. I got, got a call from the mechanic. Just when I thought things couldn't get worse. Oh, no. Please tell me nobody's reached out to Dad yet. No, I, I took the call. And I called you right away. Can we please keep it from him? Do you think you really need to ask me that by now? It would kill him. It might not actually kill him, but it would worry him a lot. Believe me, if he'd seen the way he threw his weight around at the hospital last night, you might have a clearer idea of how this would affect him. He sighed, and the sound brought to mind a man with the weight of the world on his shoulders. The best I can do is promise I myself won't say anything. But the report is here for anybody to see. If he were to come in and look at it, I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. Fair enough. There was a moment of silence between us, and I wondered if he was trying to figure out what to say next, or if he simply had nothing else to say. Have you had breakfast? That was the last thing I expected. No, I really should get to the store, though. Poor Becca's been holding down the fort this past week, and Rachel is finally back at Olivia's. I'm sure Becca's looking forward to having me around today. You're not at the store yet? That's unlike you. I know, I overslept. I might have still been sleeping if Dale hadn't called me when he did. You had a close call last night. Was that a little extra emotion in his voice, or was I only hearing what I wanted to hear? 
I'm sure anybody would understand. Just the same, I should get over there. I can bring over bagels if you want. Just as I was about to ask where this sudden change of heart came from, he continued. Obviously, this is a much more serious situation than it seemed in the beginning. We should talk over everything you've done in the past few days and get down to the bottom of who might have tampered with your car. That was a very nice way of saying it, a very careful choice of words. Funny how the impulse to remind him that I wasn't some random victim bubbled up in my chest. We weren't strangers. He didn't have to speak carefully with me or treat me with kid gloves. He obviously thought he did, though, which is why I said nothing. He'd built a wall between us, and it wasn't my place to try to knock it down. Given the current situation, I didn't have the energy to do so. Only if you promise not to get mad at me. He groaned. That doesn't give me confidence, Darcy. You did what? I held up a hand, leaning over in my chair to look out into the store. There were a handful of customers browsing the shelves, all of whom were looking straight at me after Pete's outburst. Could you not? Could you not be so determined to walk straight into a dangerous situation? I didn't know it was going to be a dangerous situation. That's a bunch of bull, and we both know it. Excuse me, but I don't appreciate being spoken to that way in my own store. Then uh, let's go outside, and I'll say it again. He slammed himself back in his chair. Honestly, it's, it's like talking to a wall. The woman lost an earring in the store. Olivia could hardly drive herself over to the house with only one working arm, so I did. I threw my hands up into the air and regretted it when my shoulders reminded me of what they'd been through. Maybe I should have taken out an ad in the paper, lost and found. But then you hung around. You eavesdropped. Any one of those people could have noticed you doing it. Nobody was even outside at the time. You don't think they have security cameras all over the place? On a palatial estate owned by the town's wealthiest man. Oh, I had never considered that. I slouched a little, chewing my lip, which he took as a sign that he was right. Exactly. Why do you always do this? You walk straight into danger with your eyes wide open. I've never known anybody like you. Thanks? His head fell back, eyes squeezed shut. You're killing me. I'm sorry. Honestly, you're right. It never occurred to me. But then it never occurred to me that everything would be so weird over there. He opened his eyes, hitting me with a skeptical look. Seriously? Seriously. So there was nothing in you, not even the slightest bit eager to witness the Cornell family in action, when they weren't behaving themselves for the sake of public eyes. I snickered, remembering their antics at the cemetery. Spoken like somebody who didn't watch them at their father's funeral. Believe me, they didn't exactly go out of their way to maintain an image of decency. Then all the more reason for you to leave them alone. They're a breed apart. They live in a world of their own. Our rules, they don't apply. That sounds pretty fatalistic. He lowered his voice to little more than a hiss. Considering one of them tried to kill you, I don't think I'm too far off the mark, do you? I shivered at his choice of words. That doesn't exactly make me feel good. Yes, well, I'm not exactly trying to make you feel good. No offense, but back when I first warned you to steer clear of those people, it obviously wasn't enough. I'm not trying to be nice now. I'm trying to keep you alive. Thank you? My reaction must have surprised him, since his mouth snapped shut and his face flushed. You don't need to thank me. You just need to listen for once. At least his tone was a little gentler than before. Believe me, sometimes all it takes is a close call to realign a girl's priorities. I tried to smile, trying to lift my chin, but it was no use. My chin trembled a second before I turned my face away. The last thing I needed to do was break down in front of him. He'd feel obligated to comfort me the way I desperately wanted him to. Hey, now, don't, don't get upset. You got lucky and you were smart. Some people would panic and drive straight into traffic in that situation. He even touched my shoulder, though it was a brief touch. Obviously, whoever did this doesn't know who they're dealing with. That got a laugh out of me anyway. I guess not. And I didn't know who I was dealing with. And now you do. And now you will mind your own business, right? Do you really think that matters anymore? Somebody set their sights on me. Are they going to stop? 
or are they going to keep going until the job is done? He folded his arms, his jaw tightening and loosening. Finally, he lifted his shoulders with a sigh. There's no way of knowing that, is there? The best thing I can do now is recommend you keep your head down, get back to your business and your family until this all blows over. Unless we're talking about a bloodthirsty murderer, they might be satisfied with thinking you've been scared into silence. I hope you're right. For what it's worth, so do I. He stood, checking his watch as he did. My heart sank. It still wasn't exactly comfortable, the two of us sitting and talking, but his presence made me feel secure. I doubted any of the Cornells would burst in with a machete or anything like that, but still, I was shaken up and in need of a little reassurance. Hey. I stood too, even though my legs were shaky. I have to say this. I'm sorry for what happened. I, I wish we could be friends again. I didn't mean to hurt you. It came out all at once, the words running together, but it had to be said. I had to make sure he knew at least that much. His frown made me wish I hadn't said anything, but there was no help in it. I had to get it off my chest before he walked away again. Thank you for saying that, but right now it'd be better if we didn't mix personal feelings with an ongoing case. I understand. Even if I didn't, even if his response sounded more like an excuse than anything, what case? Was he planning on investigating who might have tampered with the car? If not, his reasoning didn't hold water. I wanted to point that out, but knew it would sound childish. He didn't owe me anything, and the fact that he'd brought breakfast over to the store was at least a nice gesture. I told myself to accept it graciously and let him move along. He cleared his throat. As I was saying, I should get going before anybody at the station notices I've been gone this long. Keep your head down, focus on work and family. No more Cornell business. Got it? Got it. I stopped short of calling him George or Detective Harmon, but just barely. The man spent too much time with my father. The similarities were becoming uncanny. I walked him to the door then took my place behind the front counter. Becca, why don't you take the rest of the day off? You deserve it. I'll be fine here on my own. Because, after all, it seemed like a good idea, getting used to being alone. Chapter 11 This is a disaster. Mom, it's not a disaster. We'll find our way around this. For heaven's sake, who catches a cold in the summer? Lots of people. That's where the whole consensus of summer colds being worse than winter colds comes from. That they certainly are. Mom at least had the decency to pull the phone away from her mouth before she sneezed. Even then it was loud enough to make me wince. I feel like my head is going to pop like a balloon. What a lovely visual. What you need to worry about right now is resting and taking care of yourself. What I need to worry about is the shower. It's in three days, and I'm sick as a dog. As if I needed to be reminded. Everything will be fine. The shower will be beautiful, thanks to all of your planning. But how are we supposed to have a shower with no sweets? Right, the desserts Mom was supposed to bake. Even if she felt up to the task after another few days, it would be a real crunch to get everything done while still making sure the cafe had enough for its customers. There was a split second where I had a wild thought. What if I made everything myself? That was a little too much, even for me. It would have been one thing to help Mom, but doing it all alone? I had a business of my own to run. We'll figure it out. Don't you trust me? It took a long time for her to answer. Of course I trust you. You know, if someone held a gun to your head right now, I don't think you could sound less convincing. You know I don't trust anyone as much as I trust myself. Well, that's just fine. I get that. But these things happen. Do you trust me? What are you going to do? The woman was bent on driving me crazy. Mom, you told me all of three minutes ago that you were sicker than you thought you were and don't think you're going to be able to make everything. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath, wishing she hadn't insisted on being the baker. I'll call the banquet manager over at the restaurant and see if they can put something together quickly. After all the grief I gave him. At least she could admit that much. I'll take care of it, okay? Get some rest. I ended the call before she could deafen me with another sneeze, then dropped the phone onto the counter and held my head in my hands. How the heck did these things always happen to me? There I was, 
wrestling with the fact that somebody almost killed me, and looking forward to soaking in a hot bath later to ease what soreness was left in my muscles, I should have known something else would pop up. I knew in my heart of hearts she was right about the restaurant, but I had to try. The manager didn't bother to hide his smug satisfaction. I'm sorry, but we could have avoided this if your mother hadn't been so... I know, and she realizes that now. There's nothing you can do? Do you work with any other bakeries in the area that I can call? You can try, but don't be surprised if you end up paying extra for a last-minute arrangement. I was starting to think he was exaggerating. Asking for cupcakes, lemon bars, and a cake wasn't exactly the same as asking for the moon. The way I saw it, any bakery unable to handle that kind of order three days out shouldn't have been in business. A little harsh, maybe, but that was the mood I was in. I went down the line, calling the bakeries after looking them up on my phone. To my surprise, I kept getting the same answer. There were a lot of events coming up in town, people trying to squeeze everything they could out of the end of the summer. If I wanted everything finished, decorated, and delivered on time, I would need to pay a hefty rush fee. Every time I thanked them for talking with me and stuck my tongue out at the phone. Sure, I had told Mom everything would be fine, but I was starting to wonder if that really was true. The idea of baking everything myself was starting to look more appealing. Until one last idea tickled the back of my mind. It was enough to make me blurt out a laugh. What would Mom think? More importantly, what would Ethan think if I asked? No, out of the question. Not only would he give me a world of grief for even asking, but Mom would have a fit knowing it was Ethan who'd bailed her out of a tight situation. What was the alternative? Picking up a bunch of mass-produced cupcakes from the supermarket? That might have flown for anybody's family but mine. Emma and I had grown up in the cafe, and most of the people coming to the shower were lifelong friends and family. There was a standard to uphold. Silly, but true. And Ethan's desserts had been a big hit at the wedding. It had killed Mom letting the competition handle that aspect of the big day. But we were in a similar situation then. Mom simply hadn't had the time, and neither had I. I would have to eat a little crow, but I had the feeling I'd be able to convince him. And then, I would be glad my mother was too sick and too weak to murder me. Darcy Harmon, what brings you in here? At least Ethan seemed like he was in a good mood when he came in from the kitchen and found me standing in front of his register. There were a handful of tables in use behind me, people eating late lunches or early dinners. Sandwiches, paninis, soup. Not for the first time I asked myself if Mom hadn't limited herself a little bit by sticking strictly to sweets. Then I reminded myself her business hadn't suffered in the least. People knew what they were getting when they went to her, just like they did when they visited Ethan. There was more than enough room in town for both of them. I put on my biggest smile, showing what was likely an alarming number of teeth. I have a favor to ask. Why did I know it would be something like this? No way would you come in to sample my food. I've sampled your food plenty of times. But you didn't look like you were smiling your way through a trip to the gallows when you did. My face fell, making him smirk. See, it's an improvement. You look like a serial killer when you smile like that. Keep it up and I might just grow into the role, if you know what I mean. At least he laughed. At least he was acting like himself. He leaned on the corner, propping his chin up with his hands. So, what will it be? What do you need from me? I need you to work your magic, you know, like you did for Emma's wedding. He stood up fast, dropping the playful act. No way. Let me explain. When is the shower? This weekend? He asked, to which I nodded, increasingly miserable. You think I have time to put together something that quickly? Do you see the customers in here? Of course, only my mom is sick. That brought him up short. Is it serious? No, nothing like that. Though it was sweet that he seemed concerned for a second, considering how cold mom had been toward him for a long time. She's just under the weather, and it's probably not a great idea for her to be handling food when she can't stop sneezing all over everything. His nose wrinkled. Wonderful. I guess it never occurred to her to let the vendor provide the desserts. You've met my mother. Indeed, I have. He tapped his fingers on the counter, scowling. I let him work it out in his head, 
while I was practically jumping out of my skin with anxiety. He was my last hope. I didn't want to have to admit that. I still had a little bit of pride. But I was willing to, if it tipped the scales in my favor. His eyes darted over my face. I heard you had an accident a couple nights ago. Where did that come from? I just remembered. How are you doing? How was I doing? It had been a day and a half since I'd gotten the call from Dale, and I was running on fumes. I was barely able to close my eyes without imagining a vengeful Cornell laughing with glee over the news of my tragic death. I had just spent the past hour practically begging total strangers to take on last-minute work for my sister's sake. I'm hanging in there. I didn't doubt you would. He scowled, his usual expression, then lifted a shoulder. Fine. I'm going to charge you extra. I knew you would. I haven't told you how much. Ethan, at this point, I don't care. I'd give you one of my kidneys if that's what it took. I just need to get this done. I didn't hear the rising panic in my voice until it was too late. I took a deep breath, willing myself to get a grip. His scowl deepened. I didn't care. I had other things on my mind. What's going on with you? Are you in pain? Do you need to sit down? It was unusual seeing him this solicitous. Sure, he'd saved my life, but for the most part, he went out of his way to irritate me. Except when he was kissing me. But I really needed to stop thinking about that. It only confused me worse than ever. I sat at an empty table, and Ethan brought me a glass of water before sitting down across from me, folding his arms on the tabletop. What happened? You lost control of the car? It really wasn't that big of a deal. My brakes gave out on the way down the ramp from the parkway. That's terrifying. For once, he wasn't being sarcastic. It was, and it felt good to admit it. I had that whole life flashing before my eyes thing. I can only imagine. He glanced around before leaning in a little closer. You do realize it's okay sometimes to admit when you're feeling weak, upset, or sad, right? He wasn't saying anything life-changing. There was no pearl of wisdom there I hadn't heard before. So why did I want to cry? Why did I feel so grateful to him? I sipped my water, taking my time, hoping I wouldn't say anything embarrassing. It was gratitude for his kindness more than anything, I decided, since things had been so strained between us. Thanks, I'm feeling better now. When he only lowered his brow, I mimicked him, bringing my voice to match. Seriously. I'll take your word for it. He leaned back in his chair, folding his arms over his chest. I tried to ignore how his biceps bulged a little when he did that. All right, what do you need for the shower? Well, it would be nice to have a cake. That's always a good start. And then we were thinking, you know, like the type of dessert you did for the wedding? Your pecan bars were very good. It would be great if you could make some lemon bars, too. Lemon bars? They're Emma's favorite besides blueberry muffins. Since this isn't an event you bring muffins to, I thought it would be nice if we could have those. I know Mom had planned on making them. And I assume, knowing your family, they'll have to be exactly like the ones your mother makes? He wore a pained expression. And, to be quite honest, I didn't hate it. There is no backing out now. His pride wouldn't have allowed it. Let him suffer a little. He'd put me through the ringer lately, hadn't he? You say that like it's a bad thing. Not bad, just a little more work than I strictly need to be doing in such a limited time frame. I'll pay you more then, whatever you want. Oh, you're going to owe me for this, believe me. He flashed a wicked little smile. I'm already coming up with ways you can make it up to me. And there I was, wishing we could be friends, silly me. So long as you don't expect me to degrade myself somehow, I'm not going to walk around town wearing something like a cupcake costume holding a sign with the name of your shop. He threw back his head, laughing hard enough to startle his customers. You know, hadn't even thought about that. But now that you mention it, it sounds like a great idea. Don't even think about it. Too late. You planted the seed. How it grows is out of my hands. I had a feeling I was going to regret this. I was about to tell him so, too, when my phone rang. I might have let it go to voicemail if the call had come from anybody but my dad. I better go take this. Can I give you a call later? Sure. We'll hammer out the details. He was still chuckling, shaking his head, and I couldn't help but wonder what he was cooking up. It didn't matter so long as a shower went off without a hitch. Dad? I stepped outside and turned in the direction of the store, where Becca was waiting for me to return. What's up? 
What's up? You have the nerve to ask me that? Oh no. What did I do? Why don't you head over to the station right now and we'll talk about what you did? Just when I thought the day was looking up. Chapter 12 I would just like to say I had nothing to do with this. Pete perched on the corner of Dad's desk looking guilty, even though he swore he wasn't. You and I will have a discussion about this later. I groaned, although I knew the chances were good it would get me into trouble. Dad, that's not fair. You can talk to me and Emma that way, but... My dad, a legendary small-town detective, silenced me with a single glare. I'm sorry, did I just hear you telling me how to speak to a person? Is that what I just heard? I had seen the man get worked up before. There was this time I drew all over the wall in magic marker because I wanted to create a mural in my bedroom. There was this time Emma decided to get back at me for some childish argument by tearing up half my books. There was the time I deliberately stuck gum in her hair, so much of it, in fact, that she needed to have it cut out. Each and every time, Dad had blown his stack. It was little wonder the doctor had warned him about heart problems and how inadvisable it was for him to get worked up. I couldn't help but lovingly point that out to him, knowing I was probably signing my own death warrant. Dad, please, I know you don't want to hear this. If you warn me about getting too worked up, so help me. Pete cleared his throat. Can, can I say anything? No. Dad never stopped staring at me. You found out someone tampered with your car, and you thought you should keep that from your father? You do realize I happen to be a detective, right? Semi retired, but something told me he didn't want to hear that. You're also my dad, and I didn't want you to worry. So you thought you could get away with not telling me about it, so you could spare me the concern? Of course. Congratulations, you failed. I had to find out from the mechanic that somebody tried to kill my daughter. I hung my head, hands folded in my lap. There was no argument to be made. I'm sorry. I'm sure that was a shock. Meanwhile, there's Dale probably wondering why my daughter wouldn't confide in me. He pointed at me. It's one thing for you to keep this sort of thing from your mother. I understand why you would want to do that. But it's a little insulting when I found out you've done the same thing to me. Is that how you see me? Someone who flies off the handle and needs to be protected? Oh, boy. He did not want to hear the true answer to that one. I didn't want to upset you. And honestly, what good does it do, you knowing? That doesn't change anything. It only leaves you worrying and concerned and... Do me a favor. Stop acting like you're the adult and I'm the child. Stop deciding for me what I can and can't handle. Got it? He ran his hands through his gray-streaked blonde hair, swearing under his breath. He rarely did that. I don't know the last time I was this furious with either of you girls. I shot Pete a look. The best he could do was wince with his back to my father, unseen. It couldn't have been comfortable for him to sit there and listen to me getting scolded. Unless it was. Unless he enjoyed it a little and didn't want me to know. At that point, I didn't care much either way. He'd already seen me at my worst. Why not observe as Dad spoke to me like a five-year-old? I waited, watching as Dad took several deep breaths, in through his nose and out through his mouth. That was new. Maybe something Holly had suggested he do to keep his temper in check. Regardless of where he'd picked up the technique, it seemed to work. He was a lot calmer and more rational when he spoke again. So, break lines. I understand you already discussed all of this with Pete here. It was a good thing Pete couldn't see him, because the expression Dad shot him wasn't pleasant and it made me feel terrible, because the only reason Pete kept things to himself was as a favor to me. He knew Dad would want the details, but had avoided reporting them. Granted, only two days had passed, but to Dad? It might as well have been a lifetime. I did, but only because Dale happened to get Pete on the phone yesterday morning. I wasn't sneaking around behind your back. That's true. I, I called her after the mechanic called. That didn't seem to make a difference as far as Dad was concerned. Did you do a lot of driving that day? I did. Where did you drive exactly? Dad folded his hands on top of the desk, his face blank. I wasn't stupid. I knew he already knew the answer. 
He wanted to see if I would evade the question or come straight out. I also wasn't a child. Lying would get me nowhere, even if the idea of fibbing was tempting in the moment. I went over to Driftwood to give Bobby Cornell her diamond earring. Dad, I know you already know what happened that day. Can we not go through this? Oh, I'm sorry. Am I cutting into your free time? Dad, I leaned in, placing my hands on top of his. Enough, please. I know you're mad at me. I'm sorry. For the record, I had no intention of getting mixed up with the Cornells. I swear. I just wanted to get back to my life. Again, he ran his hands through his hair, which he only did when he was good and worked up, with no way to vent his emotions. Do you understand that it might be too late for that? Another glance at Pete. It was starting to become obvious how sorry he felt for me. His face was scrunched up like he wanted to speak in my defense but didn't dare. I nodded slightly, trying to tell him I understood. I didn't hold his silence against him in the least. Yes, I understand that. But everything's been fine. I've been running around like a chicken with my head cut off, trying to arrange desserts for the shower for heaven's sake. Nothing could be more normal. You'll forgive me if I'm not convinced. He leaned back, still doing his slow breathing. If he didn't calm down and quickly, I wondered if I should call Holly and have her come over. Somebody had to calm him down, and I certainly wasn't doing the job. What do you want me to do? What precautions do you want me to take? He snickered at that. Would you settle for locking yourself in your apartment and not leaving? Is there a time frame involved? Because I don't know if I can do that indefinitely. I smiled, hoping to lighten him up. I really am sorry. How was I supposed to know somebody would go to those lengths? That's just the thing. We don't know. None of us knows. He blew out an exasperated sigh. The fact is, you couldn't have known what you were walking into at that house. The most reasonable theory I've come up with so far is you heard something you weren't supposed to hear. Somebody knew you heard it, and they were desperate enough to try to... He trailed off, and I could understand why. I didn't particularly like to think about the specifics of someone trying to kill me either. Maybe it wasn't one of them. Maybe it was something else. I was reaching, and I knew it, but I had to try. What if an animal got up under the car and chewed through the line? I'm sure that can happen. Just when I thought it wasn't possible for the man to look more disappointed in me. Well, I shrugged, looking from Dad to Pete. I'm just saying, let's not jump to conclusions. The Cornells might not have had anything to do with this. And Santa might come sliding down the chimney in December. Dad arched an eyebrow. Unless there's more you haven't told me. Is there someone in town who's been bothering you? Some wacko you turned down for a date, maybe? Oof. I avoided looking Pete's way. No, nobody like that. Would it make you feel better if she had eyes on her? Pete turned to Dad, and I could practically feel his eagerness to smooth things over with my father. Semi-retired or not, Dad's opinion held a lot of sway around the station after the many years he'd practically lived there. Everybody respected him. Dad nodded slowly, his focus on me. Yes, that would make me feel better, having eyes on her. No offense, but I'm sitting right here. I waved my hand a little. It's unnerving hearing you talk about me like I'm not in the room. I'm sure it is. That didn't change anything. I want you to stay at my house. Dad, you know I can't do that. I don't know any such thing. But I'm up so early in the morning. I go to bed early. I would completely mess up the household schedule. And I wouldn't want to wake Georgie up at five in the morning. I dipped my chin, looking at him from under my brows. You know what I'm saying. He did, and I could tell it was killing him. Yes, my safety was crucial, but so was a household where there wasn't always a baby crying at all hours of the morning. And while I'm sure Holly would never have complained, it would have put extra strain on her, too. She didn't deserve that. We could have a car in front of her house, have officers working in shifts. We could even post somebody at the store, if Darcy wouldn't mind. Pete looked my way, and all I could do was shrug. No, the idea didn't thrill me, but compromises had to be made. I hate to think of spending taxpayer dollars on something like that, but I would be okay with it. I turned to Dad. Well, would that be enough? Someone cut my daughter's brake lines. No, I'm sorry, that isn't enough. I opened my mouth, prepared to argue until my face turned blue if need be, but he only held up a hand and ignored everything I tried to say. There's a simple answer to this. If you won't stay at my house, someone will have to stay with you. 
I'm not going to take you away from Holly and Georgie. That's not fair to either of them. I wasn't talking about myself. To my horror, my father turned to Pete. How would you feel about racking up a little overtime? There was no keeping my mouth from falling open. Dad, that seems a little much. I might have let out a nervous laugh that sounded like the braying of a donkey, but it was sort of a blur. No way in the world was Pete going to be okay with spending time one-on-one at my apartment. For his part, at least Pete tried to be diplomatic. I would have to shift a few things around, plans I made, that sort of thing. I couldn't help but wonder what those plans were. Focus, Darcy, priorities. It would be a great personal favor to me if you did. And like I said, it would be overtime pay. I'm sure she won't be any trouble. Excuse me, I'm a grown woman sitting right in front of you. I'm not a dog you need to drop off at the sitter, and I'm not a baby. I don't need anybody sleeping in my apartment to make sure I'm safe. That's why there are locks on the doors. And if memory serves, you had a break-in just a few months ago. I wanted to tell him that was different, but in essence, it really wasn't. Just like now, I had unwittingly barked up the wrong tree. Seemed I had a talent for that. I shriveled up inside, horrified for Pete. This was a real no-win situation. He could either refuse to accept the assignment, which, frankly, I wasn't sure Dad had the authority to make, or he could agree and spend alone time with somebody he had stated he wasn't ready to be friends with just a few days ago. Good enough. I tried to pretend I didn't hear the resignation in his voice, but it rang out loud and clear. While I doubt he would ever say anything to make me feel guilty, he didn't need to. The best I could hope for at that point was for this to not stretch out too long. I wasn't sure how much guilt I could take. Chapter 13 You really don't have to do this, Pete grimaced, setting down a duffel bag. That's easy to say. I know, and if anybody knows what it's like to deal with my dad, it's me. I felt so helpless standing in the middle of my living room in front of an unwanted and unwilling guest. But you know, we could just tell him you're staying here. I doubt he's going to drop by for a surprise visit. You have a lot more faith in him than I do. I have no doubt he'll be stopping by at some point to make sure I'm here. He looked around, rubbing his palms on his thighs. So, so, this wasn't the most awkward thing in the world or anything like that. Far from it. Are you hungry? I could fix something to eat. Now that you mention it, yes, I could use some food. I was planning on heading out to dinner after work. He was going to spare me not a single moment of discomfort, was he? I'm so sorry you had to cancel your plans. As far as I'm concerned, you can go and come back. I know. He let out a deep breath. Sorry, I shouldn't have even brought it up. None of this is your fault. And yet, I felt like it was. Very much so, in fact. I can't help but feel bad. He's just, you know, worried. Overreacting. No comment. He sat on the couch, then pulled out his phone. When he turned his attention to it, I felt like he was silently dismissing me. My father had no idea what he'd done to either of us. Something told me if I clued him in, he'd tell me it was what I deserved for not coming clean about the car. I forced a smile I in no way felt. Help yourself to the remote. Put on whatever you want. Can I get you something to drink? Disappearing into the kitchen gave me a way of avoiding him anyway. How are we supposed to pass the time together? What was more, how long was this supposed to go on? I was afraid to ask, since something told me that would only depress Pete worse than before. Did he really have to cancel plans? Who were they with? I couldn't help wondering while I pulled cold chicken out of the fridge, along with salad greens and vegetables from the crisper drawer. It was a little late in the evening for anything heavier. I'd have to start dinner earlier tomorrow and make something a little nicer. Maybe a lasagna. I wanted to show him how much this meant. Every time I peeked out from inside the kitchen, he was on the phone. His thumbs flew over the screen, and his expression was hardly one of happiness. I'd rarely seen him this tense. He had to resent the daylights out of me, even more so than usual. I ducked back into the kitchen before calling out, So you said the preliminary reports were supposed to come in, didn't you? On Emily, I mean? He was quiet for a long moment. I did say that. Did they come in? Yes, they did. I covered my face with my hands and screamed silently. It was like pulling teeth. Anything interesting? I'm sure it was very interesting, but not 
to a civilian. Ouch, I looked out at him. I've never strictly been a civilian. I've been listening to details of cases since I was old enough to understand what manslaughter meant. To my surprise, he cracked a grin. It must have been a charming childhood. You have no idea. I brought out the salads along with a bottle of dressing, figuring we could eat at the coffee table. No sense being formal when the situation was already uncomfortable enough. All I'm saying is, I'm not your average civilian. You didn't have to tell me that. He looked over at the food and offered a smile. This looks great. Thanks. I'd be happy to pick up groceries tomorrow if you want. No need. You're my guest. Boy, did that get stuck in my throat. If anything, you should make a list of the foods you'd like to have around the apartment. That was the wrong thing to say. I knew it the instant he went stiff, utensils unused in his hands. You know, I don't strictly have to eat here. I can go out and pick up my breakfast on the way to work, and the same on the way here with dinner. You don't have to go to any trouble. Translation, I don't want to take meals with you. This is not a friendly situation. We're not going to bond or anything like that, and there's no reason to pretend we will. Okay. I turned to my food, determined not to let him see how that hurt. Whatever works for you, but I'm not letting you off that easy. I want to know if there was anything funny in that report. You're not going to hear about it from me. Fine, I'll ask Joe. He'll tell me. Pete nodded slowly, chewing with a thoughtful expression. You're right. You should ask Joe. And then he'll ask why you want to know, and you can tell him you heard something you weren't supposed to when you drove out to the Cornell estate. And he can holler at you like your dad did. He didn't holler. Before today, I never heard anybody holler without raising their voice. He popped a piece of chicken into his mouth, but he managed it. The worst part was he was right. It was humiliating. I'm sorry you had to witness that. I'm sorry I had to witness it. He caught my look of dismay and looked dismayed too. For your sake, not for my own. I, it couldn't have been fun to sit there and go through that with me watching. On the list of my favorite things I've ever been through, it's at the bottom, right above steering into a light pole to avoid careening into traffic. So much fun. I wasn't hungry anymore. The best I could do was push food around on the plate. Do you have a particular family member in mind? He didn't look at me when he asked, studying a piece of arugula like he'd never seen it before. Oliver. You didn't hesitate. He's the one with the most to lose when you get down to it. He has a job somewhere, some nominal title. Everybody knows he lives off his trust fund. Oh, everybody knows that? It sounded like he was laughing at me a little, but that was a lot better than his flat, obviously disappointed voice from earlier. The articles I read said so. He snorted. What? I'm allowed to read articles. Of course you are. It's just that I should have known that you did. Your curiosity is endless and dangerous. Is that why it killed the cat? Very funny. He finished his salad, then eyed my plate. You finished? Yeah, my stomach's in knots. I shouldn't have taken so much. He picked up the plate, stacked it with his own, and took them to the kitchen. I tried to tell him it was okay that he didn't need to. But I'd been through too much already that day to bother. I was wrung dry, ready for bed, and it was early even for me. There were irregularities. He joined me again, flopping onto the sofa. In the report? Darn my heart for beating faster. You didn't have to tell me that, you know? And you sound like you believe exactly none of the words you just said. You wanted me to tell you, and I guess I felt bad holding back, though I can't imagine why. He rubbed the back of his neck in that adorably sheepish way of his, and for a moment, I had hopes things would turn out okay between us. I angled my body to face his, propping my head onto my bent arm. Was that casual enough? It would have to do. So what kind of regularities? Why don't you tell me, since you are the lifelong expert? Come on! I nudged his leg with my toe, then crumbled a little inside when he deliberately moved the leg further away from me. You can tell me. What sort of irregularities would raise a red flag? You tell me. His face was a blank mask. A cute blank mask. So this was how it was going to be. He was going to torture me as punishment for hurting him, then making it so we'd have to spend time together. Delightful. Let's see. She dropped pretty quickly. 
while there wasn't any dramatic foaming at the mouth or gasping for air, it seemed obvious to me from the beginning that she was poisoned, if there was foul play at all. So there were chemicals in her blood that shouldn't have been there. He blinked rapidly. Wow. Am I on the right track? There was hope in my voice. I couldn't help it. He didn't want me to be right, but he knew better than to pretend. We'd known each other for too long for that. You're on the right track. Yes, there were markers in her blood. Markers pointing to what? Something that shouldn't have been there. I wondered if he'd mind my hands around his throat, squeezing until everything went dark for him. So she was poisoned. Let's take it easy with that word. She might have ingested something by accident. It might have had nothing to do with the funeral or the Cornell family. Or one of them might have poisoned her at the repast, then cut my brake lines because there's no load to which they won't sink. His brows lifted. And your sister's the one who's supposed to be a writer. Yeah, well, I've done a lot of reading. He snickered. Too many mysteries. I'll have you know my interests span a wide range of genres, but yes, mysteries and thrillers are right there at the top. Along with the romances, but I didn't want to make things weirder than they already were. He might have taken it the wrong way. Anyway, we're looking into it. The chemical in her blood is notoriously tough to pin down as a murder weapon since it degrades quickly. I thought it over. Something she wouldn't have known she ingested that quickly broke down in the bloodstream. Cyanide? His head snapped back. Who are you? My gosh, is that it? There was cyanide in her blood? Now I really wanted to shake him until his head flopped back and forth like a rag doll's. How did you not tell me that? You aren't a cop, Darcy, no matter how close you are to us. And you're too close to the case on top of everything else. I pursed my lips. It's a shame you can't test Pierce for cyanide. It's probably way too late for that. Much too late besides the fact that we'd have to get permission from the family to dig up the body. And something tells me they wouldn't exactly chomp the bit to let that happen. True. You're saying you think Pierce was murdered too? His face crumpled while mine lit up. I couldn't see myself, but I can only imagine. You used the word too. That means you think Emily was murdered. Don't bother taking it back. It's too late for that. I forgot how exhausting it can be spending time with you. No offense taken. He grinned. You know what I meant. I have to think about every word that comes out of my mouth for fear you'll find a way to twist me up. I'd apologize, but I was about to say I wasn't sorry, but my phone rang before I had the chance. Only then did I remember I'd promised to call Ethan and iron out the details for the shower. He'd want to know about the guest list, any food allergies, all that stuff. We'd been through it during the wedding planning, except back then I considered him the enemy the man looking to barge in and steal my mom's customers. I should take this. I got up and walked toward my room. I had to wrangle Ethan Crosby into making desserts for the baby shower this weekend. Right, the shower. There I'd been, thinking he couldn't sound any lower. Part of me wanted to leave him hanging, let him think he had to sit through a baby shower all because he was ordered to guard me. I wasn't heartless enough to do that. Don't worry, Dad will be there. I'm sure you can take the afternoon off. When relief washed over him, I acted like it didn't hurt. Even though it did. Just a little. It wasn't the shower he was concerned with. It was me. And the fact that he wanted nothing to do with me anymore. Chapter 14 What a night. If this kept up much longer, I wasn't sure I'd be able to keep functioning. The couple of hours of sleep I'd gotten over the past two nights had me feeling like a zombie. I stumbled from my bed to the bedroom door, where I grabbed my bathrobe. My pajamas weren't exactly revealing, or even that attractive, but still, I didn't want Pete thinking I was trying to seduce him or anything. It was exhausting, keeping him in mind all the time. Like playing the world's biggest game of chess, weighing my words, my actions based on how I imagined he would take them doing whatever I could in hopes he wouldn't hate me more than he already did. As it turned out, I didn't have anything to worry about that morning. He was already gone. The bedding I'd given him for the couch folded neatly beneath the pillows he'd used. There was coffee in the pot, still piping hot, telling me it hadn't been long since he'd brewed it. Wasn't that always the way? I spent all night tossing and turning. Then in the last hour or two, I'd slept like the dead. I hadn't heard a thing as he'd moved around right outside my room. 
Was I relieved or disappointed? Considering it was only 5.30 in the morning and he was already gone, disappointment won out. Was he in that much of a hurry to get away from me? I dragged myself to the shower, where the cold water at least revived me somewhat. I would still need concealer for the bags under my eyes. There was a towel wrapped around my hair, and I was just in the middle of belting my robe as I left the bathroom and walked right into Pete's chest. Oh my God! I fell against the wall, clutching my robe closed while he jumped back. I'm sorry. He was sweaty, wearing a holy t-shirt and shorts. Running. He'd been out for a run. There I was thinking he'd left for the day. I was hoping to be out and back by the time you woke up, but I guess I should have known better. No, that's okay. I didn't hear you come in is all. You're very stealthy. I didn't want to wake you if you were sleeping. It seemed like you were having a rough time in there. When I frowned, he added, Your bed springs are squeaky. Now I had the pleasure of imagining him lying awake all night, listening to me bouncing around on the bed. This was getting better and better. I'm sorry if I kept you up. Not at all. Don't worry about it. He gave me a tight smile that didn't reach his eyes before sidestepping me on his way to the bathroom. Do you mind if I wash up or do you need to get back in there? I told him to help himself, then ducked into my room and leaned against the closed door. At least he hadn't taken off his shirt before I found him. I doubted I could have kept from blushing through something like that. Get a grip. I closed my eyes, breathing slowly. Since I didn't know how much longer this was going to go on, it would behoove me to get myself under control. I needed to stop assuming the worst when it came to him. Just because he wasn't there when I came out of my room, I'd assumed he'd meant he'd gone to great lengths to avoid me. I was making up stories in my head, shredding my own nerves for no reason. I resolved to start from scratch, if possible, and pretend the awkwardness wasn't there. It wouldn't be easy, but I had to do it. I wasn't about to scurry around my apartment for heaven knew how long. I belonged here. This was my place. And I hadn't asked anybody for protection. Pete was dressed for work by the time I emerged again. He must have bought every single polo shirt in stock, spanning the entire rainbow. Today it was a red shirt that brought out the hints of red in his hair. Stop it. Stop noticing him like that. It was no use. Did you have some coffee? I went to the kitchen to pour myself a cup. He checked the time, it was barely 6.15, and frowned. I have a couple things I need to check out before I go to the station. You think you'll be okay here for a little while? I think I can handle it. I'm on my way out soon anyway. I wanted to thank him again for making the sacrifice, but then I also wanted to ask what in the world could be so important at this time in the morning. It's not your place. You forfeited any right to ask that question. Okay, I guess I'll see you tonight. He left quickly, which I decided to look at as a good thing. The less time we spent feeling awkward around each other, the better. Within moments of him jogging down the stairs, there was a rapid little knock at my door. I knew exactly who that was. Do you ever sleep? I opened the door to find Poppy bouncing up and down on the balls of her feet. Oh, geez, how much caffeine have you had? Caffeine? She rolled her eyes. Not a drop. I've been waiting to ask you about him. I thought you weren't seeing him anymore. I'm not. It's not like that. Oh, that's good to hear. I'm relieved. Relieved? I thought you liked Pete. That's not what I meant, she giggled. If you were seeing each other again, and there wasn't so much as a peep from over here last night. My cheeks flushed. Hush, you're incorrigible. Her mood changed, her smile vanishing. Wait a second, so... Pete's staying over here, but it's not because you're dating. What's going on? Are you in trouble? I'm fine, honestly. Somebody cut my brake line. Excuse me? Terrific. Somebody else to explain it to. Come on in. There's coffee on the counter. No, I'm good. I was working all night. If I drink any now, I'll never get to sleep. Instead, she sat on the counter while I fixed myself a piece of toast. I gave her a brief rundown, wrapping it up by the time I took my first bite. She gaped at me, her mouth hanging open. How do these things keep happening to you? I'm not sure. If you ever find out, let me know. So your dad thinks somebody's going to come to your apartment? Nobody's coming here. I patted her knee in passing, 
reminding myself she had more reason than anybody to be worried. She'd been attacked by an intruder who'd been after me, or rather, the necklace my sister had bought me as a maid of honor gift before her wedding. Dad's just being dad. He doesn't know it, but he's making my life more complicated than it already was. Yeah, that's so awkward. Forced to be in close quarters with somebody you dumped. I didn't dump him. We weren't seriously dating. If anything, I was trying to keep him in mind. I didn't want to string him along. Well, the way you make it sound, he's not exactly grateful. That's a very nice way of putting it. And lucky me, I got to look forward to going through it all again that evening. It was a nice morning, at least. The kind of morning that reminded me fall was on its way. Things around town were getting quieter, too. There weren't so many tourists riding bikes down the street. Even this early in the morning, lots of them liked to do that. Yet I only saw a few bicyclists on my way to Main Street. Maybe it made me a traitor to my neighbors, but I preferred fall and winter to summer. Sure, summer meant tourists and revenue. I was probably the only person in Cape Hope who didn't live for the months when outsiders came through and spent money. I couldn't wait to see pumpkins, hay bales, and scarecrows in front of the stores. Being able to walk to work without having to wring my clothes out by the time I arrived was nice, too. I was just thinking about that when I reached the block on which Olivia's shop sat. There were police cars out front. I jogged the half block to the shop, gasping in horror at what I found. It had been trashed. The front window was broken, and there were flowers strewn all over the place. But it wasn't the flowers that concerned me. Where's Olivia? I looked up at the second floor where her apartment sat. Darcy? Olivia came out of the back room, her eyes swollen, her face red. She didn't look injured, though, just tearful and devastated. She stumbled out onto the sidewalk, and I hugged her. Who would do this? When did it happen? An hour ago. I was asleep. All of a sudden there was this loud crash, and then I could hear things being broken up down here. I've never been so scared in my life. The poor thing, having to listen to something like that, wondering if whoever was doing it was going to come upstairs. At least that's what I would have been afraid of. I'm so sorry. It sounded weak, lame, but I didn't know what else to say. I just don't understand why anybody would want to do this. I mean, they wrecked the shop, tore apart all the work I had waiting in the back. Her eyes teared up again. All the work I did for Emma's shower, they tore it up. Don't even think about that. I'm only sorry your work went to waste. That was the last thing she needed to be worried about. I stood there with her as the sidewalk slowly filled with more people, business owners and residents alike. Everybody offered to help clean up, but the officers who'd responded to the call pointed out the need to dust for prints inside. It would have to wait. Soon after, a familiar face joined the crowd, one I had recently seen. Olivia, are, are you okay? Pete was kind, warm, patting her on the back. You did the right thing, staying put and calling the police. I was too scared to do anything else. Pete met my gaze over the top of her head. I'm sure they told you they would dust for prints and look for anything the burglar might have left behind. Can you tell me anyone you think might have done this? I don't have the first idea. Nothing like this has ever happened to me before. I really wished he would stop looking at me like that, like this was my fault. I already felt like it was. I didn't need him reminding me. Do you feel up to giving a statement? We can do it right here if you want. Olivia agreed, and he pulled her aside so they could speak privately. Once he did, I took out my phone and dialed the one person I knew who would take this and get to the bottom of it. Trixie, do you feel up to doing a little digging? Chapter 15 Well, what do you think? What did I think? I thought the man must have been up baking half the night. I stood in front of one of Ethan's work tables in his shop's kitchen, and before me was arranged an assortment of lemon bars. Three batches, in fact. I think this would be a sugar addict's fantasy come true. It's almost a shame I can't call my sister and tell her to come over. Are you going to taste them? He stood on the other side of the table, wiping his hands on a towel before slinging it over his shoulder. You realize this might have been a lot easier if you could have just given me the recipe? Listen, and this is coming from someone who could have lost her life a few nights ago. 
I would rather go through that again than tell my mother I gave you the recipe for her lemon bars. There is no scenario in which I would escape that situation with my life. Fair enough. Don't get annoyed with me if they don't taste exactly the same. I tested the first of his bars, closing my eyes and focusing on the taste, texture, flavor. This one's a little tangier than hers, but that's not a bad thing. There's a nice amount of sweetness to balance it out. Thank you. But the crust is too dry and crumbly. It needs more butter. I opened my eyes. Unless you baked it for too long? He barely stopped short of growling at the suggestion. I went by the recipe. I moved on to the second bar. The texture of the filling's wrong. How so? It's a little grainy. It's not smooth. There's not enough lemon. He scratched his head, looking from one batch to the other. There's more lemon in those than I used in the first bars. Well, he could have fooled me. This one is a no. I'm sorry. I'm sure you can sell it, though. Which is it? It's garbage and it belongs in the trash, or I can sell it to my customers? I didn't say it was garbage. It's just not, you know, up to our standards. Your standards. He threw his hands in the air, muttering something I wasn't sure I wanted to make out. I didn't realize I was baking for the Queen of England. You said you would do this, remember? Yes, and I must be a glutton for punishment. I should have known better than to think this would be easy. I'm just saying these are perfectly acceptable. He held up both hands, shaking his head. Please, stop. You're flattering me too much. Anybody who wasn't used to the bars mom makes would go crazy over these. Please quit while you're ahead, okay? He gestured toward the last batch. Give that a try. I almost don't want to touch them, they're so pretty. But I did, taking a small bite from one of them, inwardly praying these were better than the last batch. Well, I could hear the strain in his voice. What about those? It's very good. I gave him a thumbs up while chewing. Oh, are you kidding me? My eyes popped open. They're very, very good. That was a compliment. But are they good enough for this all-important shower? the social event of the year, the most important baby shower to be held in Cape Hope or, indeed, anywhere else in the world. Yeah, this was a bad idea from the beginning. The truth? Do I have a choice? The crust needs a teeny bit more salt, and the lemon zest in the filling is a little off-putting, but that's just my personal feeling on it. Your mother doesn't use zest. No, she doesn't. And God knows Sylvia Harmon is the authority on all baked goods. I didn't say that. I'm just saying I want everything to be perfect. Is there anything so wrong with that? I didn't notice the tears welling up in my eyes until it was too late. I stared at the table, pressing my fingers against the crumbs that gathered there. I just want everything to be right. I'm sorry I'm making it so difficult for you. You're making it difficult for yourself, the way you always do. Oh, is that what this is going to turn into? Criticize Darcy Day? Because if it is, I'd rather go. I have an employee in my store who probably thinks I've deserted her. You're allowed to take lunch breaks, you know. When's the last time you took a lunch break? No comment. He gave me one of his patented scowls, looking over the bars. So number three was the closest to perfection? By far, and it really, they're all delicious. Just not quite good enough. He was determined to break me, wasn't he? I'm sure everybody will be thrilled with whatever you bring to the shower. Honestly, you're a lifesaver. Please don't take my pickiness as a reflection on you. It's more like a reflection on my family. I want Emma to have things just the way she likes them. I just hope everybody's as dedicated to making you happy as you are to making them happy. We exchanged a glance, and he looked away. It wouldn't seem fair otherwise. Thank you. How else was I supposed to respond to that? It was a very sweet thing to say. And out of character for him, on top of that. Who could blame me for not knowing how to respond? And I'm sure they will. So I heard what happened in town this morning. He then went about gathering the lemon bars, putting some of them in the fridge before arranging the rest on a tray for the display case outside. How is Olivia? Shaken up. She lives right above the shop, you know. No kidding. And she was there when it happened? I nodded. That's terrible. I know. I feel awful about it. Do you ever get tired of taking the blame for everything? What other choice do I have? No, really, think about it. He gave me the sort of look a person has when they're completely lost. What do you have to do with any of this? Right. He didn't know. 
Forget it. No chance of that happening now. What does it have to do with you? It's just that I might have angered the wrong people recently. And as far as they know, I work at the florist shop. I don't even think any of them knows my name. Ethan might have been a lot of things, but stupid was not one of them. Any of whom? Who are we talking about? It's not worth getting into. Don't give me that. Somebody's business was almost destroyed today. Olivia could have been hurt if she'd come downstairs. You think I don't know that? You think that's not sitting right here like a burning coal in my chest? I placed a hand there, surprised when I didn't feel heat. My brakes didn't suddenly fail. Somebody cut the line. He fell back a step. Oh, Darcy. I heard something I wasn't supposed to hear, or saw something. I'm still not sure. And yes, I stupidly walked straight into it the way I always do. I plopped down on the closest stool, folding my arms on the table and resting my forehead against them. And the only reason I didn't tell you about it is I didn't want to put you at risk. How would I be at risk? Good question. Why would Olivia be at risk? I never considered that either. Clearly, I need to be more careful. He leaned in from the other side of the table, whispering, You were working at Olivia's, helping her out. Right. And you helped her with the Cornell funeral? Also right. Are you saying this has something to do with them? Could be. I raised my head just enough to look him in the eye. Please don't criticize me right now. Yes, I was a little too eager to get a look at the family close up. It was wrong of me. I didn't realize at the time any of them would be so cold-blooded. What did you hear? I just finished telling you one of them tried to kill me, and you want to know more information? Well, it's not like they'll know to come for me. He had a point. Unless somebody was following me around town. The family is falling all over themselves to get their hands on Pierce's money. Apparently nobody knows whether he actually left them his money or left it to his assistant. They're losing their minds because of it. That's the woman he was supposed to be having an affair with for all those years? You've heard about that? He groaned. Please, I've heard so many versions of that story over the past week, you have no idea. I'm pretty sure I have a decent idea, actually. But yes, that's the thing. And now, let's just say, there's questions as to how Emily actually died? But you did not hear that from me. I glared at him, teeth bared. I'm serious. That goes no further than this room. I know this will come as a surprise, but not everybody in Cape Hope is addicted to gossip. Besides, it doesn't surprise me. The woman dropped dead, and according to everybody who ever knew her, she was the picture of health. Somebody made a joke around here that she never got sick because germs were afraid of her. It was nice to laugh. After the few minutes I spent with her, I'm inclined to agree. Would that be enough to murder her, though? Honestly, I think it's more complicated than that. I shook my head, waving my hands. I shouldn't be telling you any of this. Well, you clearly need to talk to somebody. But the more you know, the deeper I drag you into it. You don't deserve that. Listen. He drew a deep breath and let it out slowly. I know I've been out of touch lately. I know I told you it would be a good idea for us to take some time to figure things out. And I stand by that, but it doesn't mean we can't be friends. It seems you need a friend right now. He said it slowly, like each word took effort. This wasn't a man who talked about feelings. It had to be hard for him. Thank you. I appreciate that. The tightness in my chest loosened when I felt a little less alone. I have my Aunt Trixie looking around, finding out what she can about the family. If anybody can dig up some dirt, it's her. To what end? I don't know, to be honest with you. I just need to feel like we're doing something. There's got to be some way to bring closure to this, to get these people off my back. There I was, thinking they would be satisfied with scaring me off. But that doesn't seem to be the case. I shook my head, my heart sinking. I don't know what to do. I didn't think I'd ever be afraid in my own hometown before. I'm starting to figure out that even small towns hold pretty dark secrets. No place is ever really completely safe. No kidding. I think if we can find out if one of the kids was stealing from their father's estate before he died, or maybe if there's proof of him being mistreated, we might get a lot closer to figuring out who would want to get me out of the way. Because it would point to who wanted her out of the way. Emily, I mean. Exactly. One of them thinks I know about what they did. We just have to find the family member with the most to lose. Can I ask a question? I nodded. 
Why do you not trust the police to find these things out for themselves? Why do you always feel like you've got to be the one to solve things? Because it's personal for me. This is my life we're talking about. And for them, it's another day at work. It's bad enough I'm stuck with a house guest for goodness only knows how long. The sooner I can get rid of him, the better. Something flashed across his face, something like confusion. House guest? Right. I had deliberately avoided mentioning Pete when we spoke on the phone last night. It's Pete Fraser. He's the only person my dad trusts enough. This is all his idea, of course. But I can't tell you how awkward it is. Neither of us wants him to be there. How long has this been going on? Just since last night. We both want it over with. I doubt he wants it over with as much as you think he does. He then went back to arranging the lemon bars. I snorted in disbelief. Please, if it gets much colder around there, I won't have to use the air conditioning. At least it'll save you money on your energy bills. He glanced my way, then averted his gaze again. I'd better get back to work. I was up late making lemon bars. Okay. It seemed a little abrupt, but I'd already taken up so much of his time. And thank you for listening and going out of your way. Hey, what else do I have going on? There was no humor to his laughter as he backed his way through the swinging door leading to the dining room. I took that as an invitation to show myself out through the back door, which I did. Just when I thought we were making progress, it seemed there was always something lurking in the shadows, ready to ruin everything. Considering everything else going on, though, that was the least of my problems. I hustled back to the store, ready to apologize profusely to my overworked assistant and I deliberately avoided walking past Olivia's shop because the guilt was too much. Chapter 16 There weren't any full fingerprints at all? Pete shook his head, standing in the kitchen doorway, watching as I pulled the lasagna from the oven. There hadn't been time to whip one up from scratch, so I'd stopped in an Italian market near Emma's apartment and picked up a pre-made version. I'd also grabbed some meats and cheeses for antipasto, plus the loaf of fresh bread. There was a tiramisu waiting in the refrigerator in case we were in the mood for dessert. In other words, I was doing the most to make sure Pete didn't hate me. Only partials, and even then they weren't good prints. He took a pull from his beer bottle. I'd even bought a six-pack for him, in case he wanted to unwind. So they didn't use gloves? No, but they went back and wiped down everything they touched. Not completely, but enough. So we're not exactly dealing with a criminal mastermind, but they at least aren't stupid enough to forget to cover their tracks. Something like that, yes. Olivia's beside herself. I'm sure she is. I put the bread in the oven to warm while leaving the lasagna out to cool. Do you want some wine when you're finished with your beer? I could use some wine. No, thanks. He could fend for himself, then. I, for one, was in the mood where I could finish a bottle by myself. That would be the worst thing to do, all things considered. I didn't want to lose control of my faculties while Pete was around. I might end up saying, or even worse, doing, something I would regret later. He went to the living room, and I followed, noticing the slight roll of his eyes when he realized I wasn't staying in the kitchen. Just where he thought he could get off being annoyed with me for moving freely through my own home, I don't know. You know, I was thinking about something. I wasn't about to be silent, either. What were you thinking? He couldn't have sounded less interested. If there was cyanide in Emily's blood, it was probably slipped into something she ate or drank, right? Typically, that's how it's done. I gritted my teeth, determined not to react to his rudeness. She was carrying a lace handkerchief. I noticed it that day. If she wiped her mouth with it, maybe there's traces of cyanide on it. He lowered his phone, because of course he was already looking through it again, and sighed. No offense, but has it occurred to you that we might have already figured that out? Actually, no, it hadn't occurred to me. I folded my arms, still holding my wine glass in one hand. Could you be a little less rude, maybe? Whoops, I didn't mean to say that. I'd barely taken two sips of wine, and already my tongue was getting away from me. Excuse me? He left his phone on the couch, looking at me straight on. Oh, so I exist now. You're not going to pretend I'm not in the same room. Well, excuse me if I don't act like this is some treat. Being told where to go, what to do, having no say in the matter. And how many times have I told you I don't care whether you stay or not? You and I both know my father's in no position to give you any sort of official order to be here. You could have said no. You could still say no. So why don't you already? 
It's not that simple. Somebody who thinks she knows so much about what goes on at the Cape Hope Police Department should know that. Give me a break. I spun on my heel and went back to the kitchen, slamming my glass down on the counter with more force than was necessary. What I really wanted to do was slam him into the counter, but assaulting an officer was never a good idea. No, don't walk away. Why not? I'm only doing what I've seen you do. All right, that was a low blow. I felt good saying it, but regretted it instantly. Don't do that. He stood in the doorway, arms folded, glaring at me. But you did. I turned on him, and all of a sudden, it didn't matter very much whether I spared his feelings. Just because I told you I wasn't sure about us, did it ever occur to you that I was really, truly trying to make sure you didn't get hurt? I didn't want to lead you into something that I couldn't maintain. You deserve better than that. You said you would call, but you never did. You walked away. Color flared to life in his cheeks. I'm so sorry if I couldn't put my feelings aside just so you would be happy. Do you realize that's what you're asking? All I'm asking is for you to stop treating me like you hate me. If you do, fine, I get it. You don't need to keep rubbing it in. I never said I hated you. You don't have to. Certain things don't need to be said. I pulled the bread from the oven and slammed it onto the stove. Dinner's ready. Lucky me. Yes, poor baby. Somebody made dinner for you. What a tragedy. I attacked the lasagna, cutting away a piece using a spatula and imagining I was cutting into Pete's chest. Once again, if you don't want to be here, go. I would prefer it that way. I have a job to do. That's right. Wouldn't want to miss an opportunity to... Kiss up to my father? That was going too far. I bit my tongue, setting my plate aside and reaching for a bread knife. An opportunity to what? Forget it. I'm serious. No, I want to know. Pete, so help me, you're going to force me into a fight. Force you into a fight? You're the one who started this in the first place. Only because you've been acting the way you have? What am I supposed to do? Wander around here, hanging my head, afraid to look at you? Afraid to speak? Wondering if you'll even answer if I ask you a question? Too busy with your head and your phone? I mimicked his actions, hands in front of my face, my thumbs moving back and forth. I didn't realize I had to be entertaining, too. I never asked you to be, but neither of us wants this, so why don't we both admit that and try to make the best of it, for heaven's sake? I turned to him again, the knife upraised. You want to know why I'm so eager for somebody to figure out how Emily died and who killed her? Because the sooner that happens, the sooner you're gone. I would think you'd be glad for that. You can be rid of me. Instead of shouting, Pete sighed. His shoulders fell. I don't want to be rid of you. I sawed through the bread, grunting. You've been doing a pretty good imitation of it. You have no idea how complicated this is for me. Complicated? It's really simple. If you couldn't do this or didn't want to, you should have said no. I would have backed you up all the way. And you know that's not possible. When I started to argue, he shook his head. No, listen to me. This job is everything. I'm trying to establish myself. I'm trying to set down roots in this town. And if you think I'm kissing up to your father to curry favor, guess what? You're not completely off the mark. He's been mentoring me from the beginning, just like he did Joe. And now one of the most important people in his world is in danger. What am I supposed to say, that I don't care? The fact that he trusts me with you means more than I can say. At least he was being honest. That was better than freezing me out the way he'd been doing. That's all you had to say. I didn't know I had to say it. I thought you knew me better than that. Pete, right now, I don't feel like I know you at all. We might as well be strangers. And I'm so sorry for blindsiding you. I'm sorry for making things hard. I'm no good at relationships. I'm no good at taking time for myself, much less for somebody else. He smirked, looking me up and down. Don't pretend it was all about that. Now what's that supposed to mean? You know. But hey, we were never exclusive. Like I told you a few weeks ago, we'd only been on one proper date. I know there was somebody else interested in you. I, for a little while, I asked myself if your hesitation might have something to do with not being able to make up your mind. He jammed his fists into his pockets, staring at the floor. That was how I interpreted what you said. But he was right. That was exactly what was going on in my head. I wanted to explore things with Ethan, to see where we could go, but I'd messed that up too. Well, my track record stands. I've managed to blow up every aspect of my life. It's amazing I still have a store. 
I picked up a bottle of olive oil, wanting to pour a little in a dish and dip my bread in it. Naturally, what did I manage to do? I dropped the container on the floor, where it broke, sending olive oil spilling out in all directions. Oh, come on! I wanted to weep. I wanted to sit in the middle of that puddle of olive oil and weep. Okay, okay, at least the bottle didn't splinter into many pieces. Pete crept as close to the mess as he could without stepping in it, then crouched down and picked up the glass before setting it on the counter. It could be much worse. Sure, a $20 bottle of olive oil I'd only just opened. I reached for the paper towels on the counter, standing on tiptoe to avoid stepping in the puddle. I was unsuccessful. The next thing I knew I was staring at the ceiling, having slipped and landed on my back. Ow! I looked up at Pete, whose lips had completely disappeared. He'd clamped them so tight. Do not laugh! I wasn't going to. It sure as heck sounded like he was, though. I guess I can say goodbye to this outfit. I sat up, feeling disgusting in general. The shirt was plastered to my back, oil running over my skin. I'll never get it out. You ought to take it off and use it to mop up the rest of this. His face darkened when he realized what he just said. Here, let me help you. He stood, holding out a hand. I took it and did my best to find my footing. Once again, I failed, and this time, I took him down with me. We landed in a tangle of legs and arms like something out of an oil wrestling match. You've got to be kidding me! His hand slid on the floor as he tried to get up. Suddenly, the whole thing struck me as hilarious. I could see us in my mind's eye, scrambling around, slipping, swearing, bumping into each other. I started laughing and couldn't stop, which didn't make things much easier. I'm glad you think this is funny. But soon he was laughing too, so hard he snorted. That only made me laugh harder than before. <laughs> but it is. I could barely speak. It is funny. It's stupid and funny and ridiculous. He looked at me, red-faced, tears of laughter building in his eyes. For the first time in weeks, he was himself. And I was myself. And I remembered how nice it was to be with him. How much I'd always enjoyed our time together even if I didn't appreciate it fully in the moment. I felt so much better with him than without him. There was no telling what came over me. One second I was laughing, and so was he, and the next I wasn't, and neither was he. We fell silent, staring at each other, only inches apart on my oil-slick floor. I leaned in. He leaned back. I'm sorry, I should have told you. I'm seeing someone. It was like hitting the floor all over again. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't have to apologize. I mean, I wanted to change my name and move to Antarctica, but that wasn't his fault. I'm glad for you. Now you know, and now you understand why this arrangement is so complicated. This time he managed to stand, and I managed to follow him. I had to hold on to the counter to get myself upright, but I managed. She's not exactly thrilled. I can understand that. I feel terrible. I really do. I stopped short of asking who she was, since I didn't want him to take it as my being nosy. I even considered offering to talk to the girl for him, but I didn't want to step in where I wasn't wanted. I had already done enough of that. But I do wish you told me. You don't have to keep secrets. Well, that's nice of you to say, but I didn't exactly feel comfortable talking about it for obvious reasons. He looked down at himself in his ruined outfit. I hope you don't mind, but I'd like to chuck these clothes and take a quick shower. Sure, I can keep things warm in the oven for you. And I did, before wiping up the oil, then mopping up the floor like there was no tomorrow. I was a mess, embarrassed, and more than slightly disappointed. But at least now my floor was nice and clean. Chapter 17 this is a catastrophe. I'm so sorry, Mom. I was hoping so hard you'd feel better by now. You were hoping. I've spent the past few days drinking tea, eating raw garlic, and taking honey by the spoonful. I even put drops of oregano oil in the back of my tongue, since it's supposed to be strong enough to wipe out any infection. She made a gagging noise. It was the most disgusting thing I'd ever tasted. It did sound pretty disgusting. Sometimes we just need to let these things run their course. I know that's not what you want to hear. My heart broke for her. It truly did. She'd spent the months since Emma's pregnancy announcement dreaming of the shower she would throw for her. 
deliberately holding it early enough in Emma's pregnancy that she wouldn't suspect anything. And I bought all these new outfits, too. I know, I know you were looking forward to it, but hey, you can still get dressed up. I can FaceTime with you on my tablet. You can watch the whole thing from home. It's not the same. I know it isn't. But aren't we lucky to be able to do something like that? Back in the day, it would have been impossible. You would have missed the whole thing. That's true. Though it didn't sound like it made her feel much better. At least I'll be able to watch her open the gifts. See, there you go. Then you have all the time in the world to be with her once you feel better. You know, I should give you a big lecture about taking better care of yourself when you aren't sick, so you won't leave yourself susceptible to bugs when they come around. Right, right. Then I would tell you to take your own advice. She blew her nose, and the sound brought to mind a trumpet. I would have to find a tactful way of asking her to mute her microphone whenever she wasn't speaking during the shower. We'd gone to a lot of trouble to make sure the food would be perfect. No sense in grossing everybody out until they lost their appetites. I promised to call her later, then made a mental note to reach out to Bob, her boyfriend, to see if she needed anything. It was a relief knowing she had someone in her life to take care of her when she was under the weather. But I also knew all too well how exhausting Mom could be when she was feeling healthy. Sick Mom? A whole other beast. He was probably at his wit's end, poor guy. I was on my way to pick up a quick lunch for me and Becca while Mom and I were on the phone. As I waited for our sandwiches, I couldn't help but thinking about another man at his wit's end. Things with Pete had improved after our fight, with both of us feeling free to speak plainly. All it had taken was saying nasty things to each other, shouting them, actually. I still cringed at the memory, disappointed in myself. As a way of making up, I'd promised to speak with Dad at the shower. I'd tell him the problems this was creating for Pete and his new girlfriend, and ask if we couldn't settle for having a car outside my building. I still didn't know who his partner was, though curiosity threatened to choke me. There was no reason Pete or somebody else needed to stay in the apartment along with me. Dad had reacted out of fear. Several days had passed since then. Odds were he'd be feeling more reasonable, not to mention the happier mood he'd be in with the shower taking place. Whatever it took, I would do my best to help Pete out of this tight spot. On my way back to the store, I saw something completely out of place. One second everything had been normal, a sunny afternoon, neighbors and tourists wandering the streets in search of a little retail therapy. It was Friday, too, meaning the town would start filling up with weekend visitors. The next thing I knew, Bobby Cornell was leaving the jewelry store a few doors down from where I walked. Instantly, I turned toward the storefront next to me, pretending to admire the kitschy beach-themed decor for sale. Bobby passed behind me, never noticing me, dressed in one of her white linen suits. She was still the picture of poise and grace. Though I knew better, there was a lot going on under the surface, polished though it might have been. What was Bobby doing in a jewelry store in Cape Hope? This hardly seemed her speed. I would have expected to see her strolling out of Tiffany or Harry Winston. Before I knew it, I was darting inside, eager to know why she'd been there. In other words, I was a complete glutton for punishment. There couldn't be anything wrong with asking a friend a simple question, could there? Heather Hayes grinned when she saw me. Hey, it's been a while. Anybody tried to steal that locket lately? She was referring to the locket Emma had given me, the locket I was almost strangled over. It had been purchased in her shop, and she'd helped me figure out the culprit. Not lately, I held up my crossed fingers. I just saw Bobby Cornell come out of here. What was that all about? Now you know that's confidential. Is it, though? I'm not asking for her credit card number. She laughed. Anyway, I don't have her credit card number on file, because she didn't buy anything. Just shopping around? No, in fact. She sold something. Goosebumps raised over my skin. Sold? That's interesting. I thought so, too, especially earrings that size. But hey, I'm sure I can get a good price for them. Now my hair was practically standing on end. Earrings? They wouldn't be diamond studs, would they? Probably around two carats each? Her eyes narrowed. Two and a half? How did you know? Call it a hunch. I didn't know what it meant, only that it had to mean something. Do me a favor. I was never here. Just pretend this didn't happen. Okay, goofball. She was still laughing merrily as I left the store. 
looking both ways to make sure there wasn't anybody watching. Bobby was long gone by then, but who knew? That sneaky Oliver could have followed her the way he'd probably followed me. Now why would Bobby sell earrings that were supposed to have such sentimental value? She had been beside herself when I returned them to her, the picture of relief. Peter had made a point of telling me how much they meant to her, too. And now, almost a week later, she'd sold them. What had changed? I waited until I was at the store, eating my sandwich in my office, before I called Trixie. Maybe it was paranoia, but I didn't want to talk about any of this out in the street. Anybody could have been listening. Have you found anything interesting? You mean in the two days since you asked me to start digging? She laughed. Of course I did. What, do you think this is my first rodeo? We both know it isn't. That sounds dangerously close to being a reminder of my age, young woman. I promise that was the last thing on my mind, though I held up my crossed fingers since I was fibbing. Very well, I believe you. So, what did you find? For one thing, a lot of smoke and mirrors. What do you mean? I mean, it's obvious why the family is so eager to get their hands on that money. If they don't get it, they're ruined. All of them. How do you know? For one thing, Peter's about to be ousted from his hedge fund. There's a lot of chatter on the finance board about poor performance and questions relating to the allocation of funds. Everything points back to him in one way or another. No kidding. Then you have Matthew, who is about three seconds away from filing for bankruptcy. He's still making massive alimony payments to both his ex-wives, neither of whom has remarried. Probably so they can wring him dry. Exactly. Frankly, considering the sort of shenanigans he was pulling off all those years, I wouldn't blame them. Both his ex-wives alleged infidelity throughout the course of their time together. No wonder Valerie seemed to loathe him. A leopard didn't change its spots. Wow, that's pretty grim. And then you have Oliver, who blew through his trust fund in the blink of an eye and owes money to half the people in Manhattan. I did know a little something about that already. There you have it. All three of them are motivated by their financial situations. And I just spotted Bobby Cornell selling five carats of diamond earrings here in town. You're kidding. It's that desperate. Seems that way. How much did she get for them? Trixie, I wasn't about to ask that question. Why not? Because I was already going too far by asking Heather what Bobby was doing in her store in the first place. And if you so much as think about going to her and asking her for a dollar amount, I swear I will find a way to make you wish you hadn't. What could you possibly do? She laughed like it was the funniest thing in the world. For starters, I'll tie you to a chair and make you listen to Mom blow her nose over and over again. The laughter stopped. Got it. If only it were so easy to convince everybody in my life to fall in line. As interesting as Trixie's report was, it didn't change anything. No one of the Cornell sons was any better off than the others. They were all teetering on the brink of disaster, so all of them would have been desperate, not only to get their father's money, but to shut Emily up if she had anything to say about it. And if she was sole inheritor, who knew if that was true or not, they might have been desperate enough to get rid of her in hopes that the estate would then land in their hands. The more I thought about it, the more I speculated, the more unfounded theories I spun up. What I needed was to stop thinking about them entirely, but that was like asking me to ignore a mosquito buzzing around my head. Eventually, I knew it would land, and I knew it would suck my blood. The question was, how could I get rid of it? Chapter 18 Everything is beautiful! I hugged Holly the second my hands were free. You did a wonderful job! She tried to shrug it off, but I could tell she was proud of her work, and she had every right to be. The banquet room looked like a fairy tale land, beyond anything I could have imagined. There were potted trees along the walls strung with twinkling lights and a massive balloon arch for Emma to sit under while she opened her gifts. Since Olivia hadn't been able to provide the flowers, Holly had arranged at the last minute for a friend to put together centerpieces that absolutely blew my mind. I couldn't help but admire the one closest to me, a square container full of flowers into which an umbrella had been stuck. It was open, and on it were attached dozens of daisies and other small blooms. 
Each table was the same, whimsical, charming. This is incredible. I've managed to meet some good people in my line of work. That much is for sure. Yes, she had arranged for all of this with Georgie in the mix. She was carrying him in a sling on her back while putting the finishing touches on her work. I offered to take him, and she thanked me profusely. The little guy was not so little anymore, growing bigger every day. Isn't our sister going to have the best time today? I plopped him on my hip and brought him along with me as I surveyed everything else. Come on, let's set up the tablet. I placed it close to the chair Emma would be sitting in when it came time to open gifts, crouching behind it to make sure the angle was right, then arranged the wrapped baby toys and christening gown nearby. Darcy! Hurricane Raina came bearing down on me, but I didn't mind. It had been a few months since I'd last seen her, and she'd never looked better. That was saying something, too, because the girl always looked like a million bucks. Can you believe it's finally the big day? Do you think she suspects anything? Not a thing. My sister's best friend was supremely confident, giving me a thumbs up. I just talked to her this morning, and she was completely distracted by her doctor's appointment. That's right, she did have one scheduled this morning. Good, at least she's not suspicious. Ethan was bound to arrive at any minute, and Raina helped me finish setting up the dessert table in preparation. While we worked, she told me all the news about her and Nathan, and it sounded like things were getting more serious. Are we going to be having a shower for you soon? She blushed, which of course meant I had to tease her mercilessly. Uh-oh, do I hear wedding bells? Has he asked you for your ring size yet? No, he hasn't asked for my ring size. But there was something funny about the way she said it, and the way she wouldn't look at me. I finally noticed the band around her ring finger on her left hand. It was plain, thin, and I had the sneaking suspicion there was a stone on the other side. Raina, are you serious? I grabbed for her hand, flipping it over to see the underside. I was right. The girl was wearing a platinum diamond ring, sparkly enough to almost blind me. Oh, my God. Shh, she held up a finger to her lips, even as she beamed brilliantly. I don't want to steal people's focus. You're engaged? He asked last night, in fact. Oh, my God. Even Georgie clapped as I hugged her, squealing. She'd been friends with Emma for years and years, to the point where they were practically sisters. We'd gotten friendly enough over time that I was genuinely emotional for her. Emma is going to flip. Let's just keep it to ourselves for now, okay? I'll tell her after the shower. She admired her ring, and I could understand why. It was admirable. I just couldn't bear the thought of leaving it at home, though. I'd feel the same way. Though, frankly, I would be too self-conscious to wear anything that big out in public. But then Raina's family had a lot of money. And she was used to wearing what amounted to a down payment for a car on her hand. Though I doubted she ever glowed over any of it. Not the way she glowed when she looked down at her engagement ring. You know, you're probably right, leaving it until after the shower. If you tell her during the shower, she'll burst into tears and that'll be the end of it. Can I get a little help? That was Ethan, coming in with a tall box balanced in both hands. Where am I putting this? I hurried over to him, directing him to the dessert table, then standing back and holding my breath as he set down what had to be the cake. He slowly deconstructed the box from around it, and when he was finished, all I could do was gasp in wonder. It was exquisite, simple but beautiful, three tiers covered in pale yellow fondant, decorated with fresh flowers which cascaded down the side. Ethan, it's breathtaking. It occurred to me I never asked for a color scheme, so I sort of winged it. It's exquisite. I can't say enough about it. And to think he'd gone to all that trouble after I'd already put him through his paces. You need help getting anything else out of your car? Ethan eyed the baby. Looks like you've already got your hands full. Holly and Raina offered to help, and the three of them went back out to fetch the rest of the goodies. I looked down at Georgie. He looked up at me, his eyes wide and innocent. This is going well, isn't it? He stuck his fingers in his mouth, drooling. I agree. While Ethan and the others set up the desserts, I called Mom on my tablet. You look beautiful. And she did. She also looked red around the nose, 
like she'd been going through tissues by the box. No amount of powder could cover that up. I gave her a look at the room, and she ooed and awed, praising Holly the entire time. I don't know how you did it, especially with that little one keeping you busy. The fact that Mom sounded tender when she talked about Georgie touched me, as I'm sure it did Holly as well. Not only had their relationship gone from frigid to merely cool, but it was clear Mom thought Georgie was the cutest thing around. Granted, once her grandchild was born, things would change. But the fact that she could overlook Georgie being her ex-husband's son meant she'd come a long way. He's a dream. You're the one who built up that cafe from nothing with two kids running around the entire time. Yes, the fact was, Mom and Holly had a lot more in common than not. Both were hard-working businesswomen, and now they both knew what it was to work full-time while raising a baby. And of course, they both knew what it was like to put up with Dad. Maybe one day they could laugh about that over coffee. I couldn't help but hope. The room filled up quickly. Nell and Trixie arrived, along with other friends from around town. Mrs. Merriweather brought an enormous gift basket filled with diapers and onesies, while Brianna Schultz told me all about the prenatal yoga that she'd roped Emma into practicing. Joe even comes with her to class sometimes. The thought of Joe doing yoga was enough to make me laugh helplessly. Ethan hovered around the sidelines, making adjustments to the array of desserts he'd brought. I handed Georgie off to Holly before cornering him. Thank you so much for this. Really, I know I've thanked you before, but it doesn't feel like enough. When you see my invoice, you won't want to thank me anymore. Sure I will. I made sure to hold his gaze a beat longer than necessary, so he knew I meant it. Suddenly, in came Dad, waving his hands. They're coming! Emma thought she and Joe were meeting Dad and Holly for lunch. He joined me and Ethan while everybody else moved to one side of the room so they wouldn't be seen before Emma entered. I ran for the tablet, holding it in front of me, so Mom could watch Emma's reaction. Are they almost there? Mom squinted, leaning in so close I could practically see up her nose. I shushed her and rolled my eyes to Dad, who only shook his head. I heard Joe's voice and held my breath. The anticipation was almost too much to handle as they came closer to the banquet room. Why are we going back here? That was all Emma had a chance to ask before she discovered the answer. Surprise! There was a lot of laughter, a lot of people taking pictures on their phones. Raina and I rushed forward to give her a hug. Poor Emma, her eyes were as wide as saucers darting around the room. This is for me? Well, it's really for the baby, but I figured we could invite you too. I hugged her again. Are you surprised? Her head bobbed up and down, her chin quivered, her eyes filled. No, no! Raina took Emma's chin in one hand. No crying. But she went to all this trouble for me and the baby. Emma then noticed the tablet I was holding. Mom? Oh no, and you're still sick. Honey, don't worry about that. Today is all about you. I would have to let Mom know at some point that she didn't have to shout. That was when Emma's gaze fell on the dessert table. Oh! It was a breath, a sigh. It was quickly followed by a storm of gusty sobs. I looked at Ethan. He looked at me. We both looked at Emma, who buried her face in Joe's shoulder. Poor Joe looked perplexed and a little chagrined. What's wrong? Emma answered for him. The doctor told me I can't have any more sugar. She leaned on Joe again, wailing. What did she say? She can't have any more what? There was Mom, this time turning her ear toward the camera like that would help her hear better. Mrs. Merriweather cupped her hands around her mouth. Sugar, Sylvia. She can't eat sugar. All that did was make Emma cry harder. All this beautiful food, and I can't have any of it. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Ethan turn his back on the entire mess. I wanted to crawl into a hole after putting him through so much torture to get everything just right. He would never let me live this down. Then I saw his shoulders shake. He covered his face with one hand. I went over to him and discovered he was laughing. So hard, in fact, there were tears in his eyes. I'm sorry, but this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever been part of. I swear your family is nuts. You do realize I can hear you, right? Mom looked none too happy. I handed the tablet over to Raina so Mom could try to cheer Emma up. 
before going back to Ethan. I'm really sorry. I was mortified, not to mention more than a little disappointed for my sister. Oh, there's nothing to apologize for. This is so entirely the type of thing I should expect by now when dealing with you ladies. He even rubbed his hands over his eyes to catch his tears. Thank you. I haven't had a good laugh in too long. I'm glad we could amuse you. At least he was a good sport. I decided to take the win where I could get it. Come on, sweetie. I touched a hand to my sister's back. Lunch is about to be served, and then you have all those presents to open. There's something special from Mom in there, too. I feel so ashamed, crying like a baby. She wiped her eyes. I don't want everybody to think I'm ungrateful. Nobody thinks that, I promise. I looked at Raina, who nodded fervently as she held the tablet from which Mom watched and listened. Wait a minute. Mom leaned in, her face filling the screen. Raina, what is that on your hand? Is that an engagement ring? Are you engaged? Emma's jaw dropped. What? That was all it took for the waterworks to start again. When I dared to steal a glance at Ethan, I found him laughing again. This time I couldn't help but join him. Chapter 19 After that, everything went beautifully. Once Emma calmed herself down and had lunch, there were no more big emotional outbursts. Pete chuckled. I'm so glad I didn't have to witness that. It was actually pretty funny. I almost wish you were there just to watch the whole thing unravel. I reached for another of the lemon bars within the box on the coffee table, next to a box of cake. Pete was enjoying some of that while we caught up back at my apartment. I spoke to Dad, too. I explained how uncomfortable this is for you, and I pointed out how quiet things have been around here. I think he's going to let you off the hook. You have no idea how much I appreciate that. No offense. None taken. I managed to cut myself off there, rather than add in something about not wanting my boyfriend to spend the night at the apartment of a girl he used to date, but I figured that was best left unsaid. I settled for munching on a lemon bar instead. They were truly outstanding. And I was certainly paying for them. My eyes had only slightly bulged when I finally caught sight of Ethan's invoice. They were worth every penny and then some. But don't think I'm going to leave you alone. I'll still come up with a way for you to pay me back. Ethan's words echoed in my mind. By that time, the shower had been winding down, and people were saying their goodbyes. I would have agreed to anything at that point. Pete's phone rang, and my heart only sank a little. I got up, prepared to leave the room so he could have privacy, but he only shook his head while listening to what the person on the other end of the call had to say. Okay, I'll be right down. It was obvious from the way he sounded this wasn't a personal matter. He was in full-on professional mode. What's up? I have to go to the station. He ran his hands through his hair as he stood. Shoot, I should have asked somebody to come down here and watch the apartment while I'm gone. I don't need a babysitter. He shot me a look. Don't do that. I'm fine here, really. Go to work. Then, because I couldn't help myself, I pressed my luck. So what's going on? Nothing you need to worry about. He jerked his thumb toward the bedroom. Can I change in there? Of course. I waited outside the door while he put on something a little more professional. Whoever he'd been with that afternoon, they'd done the sort of things a person wore jeans and a t-shirt to. I still wished I knew who she was, so I could at least put a face to the phantom in my imagination. It wouldn't have anything to do with the Cornell situation, would it? Darcy, can we not do this? I'm just curious. And you've seen where your curiosity gets you. Let it go. I'm just saying, if it's important enough for you to pick up and run, it must have something to do with either Pierce or Emily. He flung the door open, now dressed in his typical work attire. Enough. I'm serious. Because, you know, I was just thinking, maybe I should go with you. You're unbelievable. I'm just saying, there won't be anybody here to watch the apartment, and where would I be safer than at the police station? You're only trying to stick your nose in where it doesn't belong. If this has anything to do with Emily, my nose belongs there. I think we both know that by now. Just the same, I'll keep you posted, I promise. I'll tell you everything once the questioning's over. Just stay here, okay? With that, he left, and I stuck my tongue out at the door. Men, always thinking they could boss a girl around. He had another think coming if he thought I was going to sit around and wait for him. 
Besides, all of my dad's warnings had finally gotten to me. I didn't much love the idea of sitting by myself in an otherwise empty apartment on a Saturday night with nothing but lemon bars and a lemon raspberry sponge cake to keep me company. Poppy was out for the night, and of course Emma would be exhausted from the day's excitement. I made up my mind, and a moment later shoved my feet into a pair of sneakers and ran down the stairs. Pete wouldn't need to see me. I knew that building like the back of my hand, and I could get in through the side door and take the back stairs up to the interrogation room. If I stood outside it, nobody would even know I was there thanks to the two-way mirror. There were perks to being known by everybody at the station. Nobody questioned my coming in. Nobody thought it was strange that I crept along taking the back stairs. Hardly anybody even noticed me. It was a bit busier than usual, which also helped. Saturday nights were usually busy thanks to tourists getting rowdy. I waited in the stairwell, the door partly open, peering down the hall, waiting to see where Pete would go. I could hear him talking to somebody, and it wouldn't do me any favors if I popped out and showed myself before he went into one of the rooms. Then I saw him. I closed the door a little more, leaving only an inch through which to see. He was with Joe to my surprise. This had to be something big if they'd called Joe in. I imagined he would have taken the day off, considering the shower. They disappeared into the last room down the hall. I counted to five to be safe, then slipped out of the stairwell and darted over as quietly as I could. Once I was in front of the mirror, I saw who all the fuss was about. Greg Cornell was sitting at the table, tapping his fingers, jiggling his foot. Nervous. Why in the world had he come down? I looked around to confirm I was alone, then turned my attention back to what was starting to play out. Greg, we're going to record this. Pete placed a device on the table and hit the record button. This is Officer Pete Fraser and Detective Joe Sullivan. The date is Saturday, August 29th. Please state your name. Greg Cornell. Greg, you came to the police department of your own free will. Are you willing to speak to us without a lawyer present? Yes, sir. He sat up a little straighter in his chair, and I noticed the sweat beating on his forehead. He was a kid, or practically. I would bet he was terrified, in spite of the high and mighty act he'd put on for me at the house. What is it you have to say, Greg? Joe looked up from the legal pad on which he was taking notes, old school all the way. Greg looked back and forth between the two men. If I tell you this, do you promise to keep me safe? Of course. Pete had an excellent poker face, which was a lot more than I could say for myself. I was chewing my lip, holding my breath to see what would happen next. Okay. He let out a long, shaky breath. I'm afraid of my uncle, Oliver. He's getting desperate. Pete was calm, measured. Has he done something to hurt or threaten you? Yeah, but it's more than that. He's been going through all of Grandpa's house, tearing it apart. Says he's looking for things. Papers. He's been drinking all the time, and then he started to become violent. Greg looked down at his hands, resting on the table. And he started to say things. Bad things. Such as? He keeps talking about how he's glad he got Emily, Ms. Newberg, out of the way. I stood with my hands clasped over my head, like I was trying to keep my skull from blowing off. How either Joe or Pete managed to keep their cool was beyond me. Obviously, I had not missed my calling. I'd never have made a good cop. Joe prodded him. He used those exact words. Greg nodded, taking a sip from a bottle of water before nodding again. Yeah, he said he wished he'd found out where all the important papers were hidden before he got her out of the way. Like she would have made things easier for him to find them or something. I don't know. Were there any other witnesses who heard him say that? I mean, it's a big house. I think we were all home at the time, but I was the only one nearby. Aunt Bobby and Aunt Valerie were out at the pool. My dad and my Uncle Peter were doing whatever they do. He shrugged. We're all just killing time right now, waiting for Grandpa's lawyer to come into town. He's got a health problem? I don't know. He's an old guy. And once he comes into town, they're going to unseal Grandpa's will and finally read it to us. Another shrug. I don't know why it has to be him, but I don't know about these things. Joe cocked his head to the side. What about school? Are you enrolled this coming semester? Greg sneered, falling back in his chair. He folded his arms, suddenly the picture of insolence. That kind of fell through. 
It's a long story. So he wasn't going to college. That was interesting. Still, it didn't mean anything. Maybe he figured he didn't have to go to college the way so-called normal people did. Is there anything else you can tell us? Greg started jiggling his foot again. I mean, I don't know what you want me to tell you. To your knowledge, did your uncle spend any time with Miss Newberg the day of the funeral? I mean, yeah, but it's not like anybody stood around and talked to her. We didn't really like her. He snickered. She didn't like us either, but yeah, we were all in the same room for a little while. Did she seem sick or confused at all? He shook his head. No, she was pretty normal for her. Did you see her eat or drink anything? Yeah, I already told you guys about that when I came in with my parents. Pete smiled. Refresh our memories. They had, you know, little sandwiches, pastries, coffee and tea. Pretty typical stuff. Greg scratched his head. I think she had a sandwich and a cup of tea. Joe and Pete exchanged a glance. I could tell that unnerved Greg somewhat. His foot shook worse than before. I think it was my Uncle Oliver who poured her cup, now that I think back on it. You think it was, or you're sure it was. We can't afford to make a mistake here, Greg. These are very serious allegations. You don't think I know that? His eyes went wide, like he knew he'd made a mistake. Sorry, this isn't easy to do. No, I'm sure it's not. All right, Greg. Pete stood, and I backed away from the mirror. What we're going to do now is take you downstairs, and someone's going to type up your statement. You review it, then you'll sign it once you confirm everything in the statement is what you told us. Sound good? Greg nodded his agreement, and Joe motioned for Greg to follow him from the room. I flew down to the stairwell, peeking out like I did before. Not a moment after I was in place, Joe led Greg to the front stairs, and soon the sound of their footfalls faded to nothing. But Pete hadn't come out yet. I waited, shifting my weight from one foot to the other, anxious to see him. I didn't know why, really. I could have taken the stairs and snuck out the way I'd snuck in. I wanted to see his face. I wanted to see if he believed everything he'd just heard. Finally, I got what I was waiting for. He came out of the room and paused in the hallway, letting out a long breath while his head fell back. I could practically see the tension melting from his muscles. He believed Greg and he was relieved things were finally coming to a close. Now, if I only knew whether he was glad for my sake or his own, knowing he wouldn't have to hover over me anymore. Chapter 20 All I know is I'll sleep a lot better now. I leaned back on the sofa, crossing my ankles on the coffee table. Poppy sat cross-legged on the floor, digging into a piece of cake from the fridge. Even after a day, it still tasted as fresh and moist as it had at the shower. What a relief. No offense, but the idea of somebody coming around here to hurt you makes me nervous, and not just for you. I would never hold that against you. Not after she'd been attacked and knocked unconscious, all because of somebody trying to get to me. I swear, I'm a menace. No, you're not. You just happen to attract menaces into your life. I kind of like the way that sounds. I attract menaces. I laughed at myself before finishing my glass of wine. It felt good, being able to unwind for the first time since that darn funeral. The statement from Greg had been enough to obtain a warrant for Oliver's arrest. Pete and Joe questioned Oliver on the specifics of his relationship with Emily, his father, and the events on the day of the funeral. He swore up and down he was innocent, of course. The twist had come once Pete had noticed the way Oliver's arm was bandaged, like he'd only just received a fresh cut, one which looked like it was starting to become infected. When Pete asked if there was any chance his blood would match the DNA found at Olivia's, he turned the color of milk. That was how Joe described it anyway. So he trashed Olivia's shop, and the idiot managed to cut himself while he was doing it? Apparently so, though I think Pete was bluffing about the DNA. I don't know. It worked either way. Oliver said it was supposed to be a warning for me to butt out of things. Like I guessed, he didn't know I wasn't actually Olivia's employee. Wow, people are really something, aren't they? You just never know. She chewed, wearing a thoughtful expression. I mean, look at me, always walking around with paint in my hair and on my clothes, with people looking at me funny because of my piercings. I've seen much less discreet piercings, for what it's worth. She only had a ring on her septum and one in each eyebrow, plus the ones in her ears, hardly scandalous. 
But you know what I'm saying. They look at me and they think I'm a weirdo, but they would see somebody like Oliver Cornell on the street and assume he was a good guy. That's probably true. You can't judge a book by its cover. I guess you would be the expert on books. She clearly thought that was a very funny little quip, giggling to herself before taking another forkful of cake. Anyway, he's not a threat anymore. But now that means there's no more excuse to have Pete staying here for the night. Her eyebrows moved up and down suggestively. Don't tell me you're totally happy about that. Actually, I am. He was unhappy being here, and I certainly couldn't be comfortable knowing that. It was the most awkward situation I think I've ever been through. That's saying a lot because I've been through a lot of awkward situations. I noticed she was trying to hide a grin as she stared down at her plate. Want to know whom he's been seeing? What? I asked you if you wanted to know who he's been seeing because I saw the two of them out together yesterday afternoon. She stole a glance at me from under her eyelashes. I thought maybe you would want to know. Well, I don't. It's none of my business. You are a terrible liar. I'm not lying. She stared at me blank-faced. Okay, I sort of want to know. Are you happy? But I don't feel right sneaking around behind his back. You're not sneaking around behind his back. And I know you're dying of curiosity, so don't pretend like you're not. Okay, fine. Tell me. Who is it? Lord, give me strength, and please don't let it be anybody who's way prettier than me. A petty thought for sure, but I couldn't help it. She giggled. Honestly, I don't know who she is. Poppy! I threw a pillow at her. That's not funny. But he was with a girl, and they were most definitely on a date. She made a kissy face, smacking her lips together. She was cute. Not as pretty as you. You don't have to say that. It's the truth. She was okay. I saw them on the boardwalk. He was trying to win this ridiculous stuffed animal for her. That hurt. That hurt a lot. That was what he'd done on our first official date. I tried to push it aside, but it wasn't successful. That's nice. I'm glad for him. Meanwhile, I wished I was alone so I could cry a little. That could have been me. I had completely lost what could have been an opportunity to be happy. Is it wrong that I like him even better now than I did before? What do you mean? Just what I said. I liked him before, but now, I don't know. It's like I've seen this whole other side of him. He was trying to be polite, respectful, and sweet before, which is great. I'm not complaining. But he wasn't being real, like he was trying so hard to impress me. All he had to do was be himself. It could have something to do with who your dad is, working with him and all that. Terrific. Now you have me wondering if he only dated me because of my dad. That's not what I meant. She threw a pillow back at me. You are the worst sometimes. I only meant he didn't want to offend you and thus offend your dad. I mean, isn't there some grain of truth to the idea of a guy being terrified to date a cop's daughter? That's true. You make a good point. I looked toward the kitchen, remembering. When we were arguing, it's like we were finally being real with each other. It wasn't exactly fun, but it felt like we'd reached a new level. I could be looking into it a little too much, of course. Whatever Poppy was about to say was lost when a loud noise from outside caught our attention. We froze, looking toward the door leading to the stairs that ran alongside the house. The door was locked, as was my habit, but there was no denying the noise had come from the other side. I hadn't turned the light on out there, so there was no way of seeing through the window unless I wanted to get closer. I did not want to get closer. Darcy? Poppy was frozen solid, barely moving her lips to whisper. It's okay. Stay calm. I was whispering too, sliding my hand over the couch cushion to reach for my phone. I swiped my thumb across the screen, glancing over to confirm the emergency prompt had come up. I tapped it, and the phone automatically dialed 911. I raised it to my ear. This is Darcy Harmon. Someone is outside my apartment. The dispatcher rattled off the address to me, which I confirmed. We'll send someone out right away. I thanked her, ended the call, then texted Pete out of habit. Someone's outside. I already called for help. I thought this was over. My fingers shook, but I managed to get the message out before joining Poppy on the floor, where we clasped hands and waited for help to arrive. By the time they did, of course, the stairs were clear. But there's fresh dirt on the steps, on the landing. Yes, because it had rained earlier in the day, and the ground was still damp and soft. There weren't any discernible footprints, but whoever it was had tracked mud up the steps. I hadn't used them. I should have expected my father's arrival, but it still came as a surprise. Sweetheart, 
He gathered me up in a tight hug. Are you all right? I'm fine. Whoever it was gave themselves away and ran off before the car got here. Thank God for that. He hugged me again. See, and here you are swearing you didn't need to be looked after. But Dad, I thought this was all supposed to be over now. Oliver's in jail, right? His face fell. He's out on bail. There was no reason for the judge to deny it, and of course his family has the resources. I didn't think about that. I feel naive for not thinking it through. He held me at arm's length, looking stern. Now will you agree to stay at my house for a couple of days, at least until we can get to the bottom of this? This time, it didn't seem like I had any room to argue. I started getting my things together while Dad checked in with Poppy. Even I knew when it was time to stop being stubborn and accept things the way they were. Oliver Cornell wasn't going to stop coming after me until, what, he went on trial? If they could even prove he poisoned Emily, it would be ages until that happened. I could try to get a restraining order, but what good would that do? Besides, I didn't have any proof. Maybe his confession about busting Olivia's shop up to silence me would be enough? My phone rang as I was finishing getting my things together. I- I'm sorry, I-, I called as soon as I got your message. I, I was at a movie. Pete was breathless. What happened? Are you all right? It's okay. Everything's fine. Whoever it was, they left before the patrol car got here. I'm getting things together and going to Dad's for a little while. They must have really shaken you up if you're agreeing to do that. Yes, it's amazing what having a prowler outside your door will do. He was quiet for a moment. I'm glad you're okay. Keep me posted. I promised I would, then finished packing and joined Dad in the living room. The fact that I no longer felt safe in my own home was enough to make me want to spit nails. But anger would have to come later. For now, I needed my daddy. Lucky for me, he was right here, ready to take my bag down to the car and drive me somewhere I knew I'd be safe. Chapter 21 I'm telling you, it'll be fine. If you can't take advantage of the perks of a live-in babysitter, what's the point of having a live-in babysitter? I winked at Dad, bending over to lift Georgie out of his pack-and-play. You know that's not how I see you. Of course, and I know how long you must have waited to get that reservation. But it's all the way up in Paradise City. Which is what, a half hour away? Everything will be fine. Nobody even knows I'm here. I looked at Georgie, who babbled and patted my cheeks. Tell Daddy not to be such a worrywart. The fact was, after two days at Dad's, I was feeling extremely silly. Yes, the fear Poppy and I had gone through had been very real, but now that the threat was gone, I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd overreacted. You know I would never put Georgie at risk, right? I wasn't joking anymore. We'll be just fine here. You'll be gone for a few hours, you'll come back, and all will be well. I put a hand on his shoulder. It's important for you and Holly to get out together. I know it means a lot to her. Has she been complaining? You know she wouldn't, even if she had anything to complain about. But here you both are with a young child in the house. She's still working, and she deserves a nice night. I'm sure she's been looking forward to it. She has. Still, he was undecided, his mouth set in a thin line. Would it make you feel better if I had somebody here with me? Maybe Emma could come over. Terrific, so I'll have all three of my children in the same place at the same time for a maniac to pick them off one by one. Wow, that's a cheerful thought. Welcome to the mind of a father who has seen the worst of human nature. He ran a hand over Georgie's head, stroking the fine golden hairs covering his scalp. Maybe Pete could come. No, don't call Pete. He glanced my way, frowning. What happened with you two? Don't worry about it, okay? It's just I don't want to disrupt his social life. I've already done enough of that. I nudged him with a grin. Besides, that's not fair. You know he'd never say no to you. He worships the ground you walk on. I do tend to have that effect on people. Still, I'd feel a lot better. Then Emma and Joe, you can't disagree with that. No, that makes sense. I'll give them a call and see if they'll be willing to come by. I'll give them a call. Why don't you get in the shower, detective, and get ready for your big night out? I gave him a playful shove and harassed him until he climbed the stairs. I then looked at Georgie, who had followed Dad's progress. I'm telling you, he's the stubbornest man who ever lived. I heard that. Dad's voice echoed in the upstairs hall. Maybe I wanted you to. I hadn't, but whatever. I called Emma from the house phone and hoped she would be able to come by. 
even though I'd put on a good show for Dad's sake, the fact was I didn't particularly want to be alone. Besides, we hadn't had an excuse to sit down and chat for a while now. Emma groaned in dismay. Shoot, oh, we drove into Philly with Raina and are on our way back now. It'll be at least another hour and a half. We only just crossed the bridge. That's fine. I'll tell him you'll be coming over and everything will be okay. I then made sure Holly wasn't on her way down the stairs and that Dad was still in the shower. Between you and me, it feels like tonight isn't your average date night for them. What are you saying? I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just getting a vibe. This feels like more than wanting to keep a reservation. Well, obviously we need to hustle and get over there. There's clearly a lot for us to talk about. I urged her to remind Joe to drive safely before heading up. He's carrying precious cargo. Shut up or you'll make me cry. Something told me I could look at her the wrong way and make her cry, but it was best not to get into an argument when she was doing me a favor. It was another twenty minutes before Holly came down, followed by Dad. I swear, I shook my head, looking from Dad to Holly. All men have to do is get in the shower and get dressed. Dad scowled. I'll have you know I shaved, too. Oh, excuse me, I rolled my eyes, and Holly laughed. Just one more thing that isn't fair, though at least we get to have the fun of dressing up. Yes, and she looked sensational in a sleek black dress. Nobody would believe the woman ever had a baby not that long ago. Are Emma and Joe coming over? Yeah, and they're with Raina, so maybe she'll come too. It'll be a full house. Good. I might actually be able to enjoy my dinner now. He kissed my forehead, then did the same to Georgie. Call us if you need anything. I won't, but I'll lie and say I will. I winked at Holly, who giggled before following Dad out the door, blowing kisses to Georgie all the way. Looks like it's just you and me for a little while, bud. My brother blew a raspberry. I'm going to choose not to take that the wrong way. I turned on the TV before setting him on the floor with a few toys. There was nothing in the world I liked so much as playing with him, watching him discover new things. Like when I stacked a few blocks and then knocked them down, and he looked at me like I was a god among mortals. You probably have the highest opinion of me out of all the boys I know right now. I made another block stack and he just about lost his mind when I knocked it down again. Just think, one day you'll be able to teach Emma's baby how to do this. The phone rang. I got up to get it while Georgie gnawed on one of the blocks. Well, he was trying. Hello? A pause. Darcy, what are you doing there? Then Pete remembered. All right, you're staying there. Yep, it's just me and my brother at the moment. Dad went to dinner with Holly. I see. He sounded troubled, which both piqued my interest and filled me with dread. What's up? There have been a couple of developments over here, and I thought he'd want to know. He uh, instructed me in no uncertain terms to keep him posted. I could give him the message. Oh, I'm sure you could. You're very helpful like that. I try to be helpful wherever I can. I sat on the floor again and stacked blocks like the mature adult I was. Why not tell me now and get it over with? You know he's going to tell me eventually anyway. Besides, Joe and Emma are on their way over, so I could just as easily get it out of him. Fair enough. In fact, I'd like the pleasure of reminding you it isn't your job to run down leads. You're supposed to bring this stuff to us. What stuff? The earrings. Oh, right, Trixie. Did she call or something? She called. I've got to give her credit. She knows what she's doing. She got in touch with Heather at the jewelers and asked her to run down the ID numbers engraved in the diamonds. Guess what? They were reported stolen two years ago. Wait, what? By whom? I looked into it. The person who filed the report was none other than Emily Newberg. And those weren't the only jewels she reported either. According to the paperwork the company sent over, there was a total of seven pieces missing from Pierce Cornell's safe. The man didn't take chances. He kept records of everything and Emily maintained them. Okay, let me get this straight. Bobby and Peter both told me the earrings were a wedding gift. They got married five years ago. Right, meaning those earrings had been missing from the safe for three years before Emily caught wind of the problem. Though according to the records, the stones were originally part of a pendant. My guess is Peter took the pendant someplace and had the stones removed and set in earrings instead. He wanted to give his new wife a sparkly gift, but didn't want anybody in the family recognizing it. They might have recognized the pendant. 
exactly the conclusion I came to. Emily might have held this over his head, or she might have threatened the entire family about it. Who knows? But there's most definitely a record of a new safe being delivered to Driftwood two years ago. I gasped, so the kids couldn't get into it. They wouldn't know the new combination. You've got it. Now I'm wondering if Oliver was trying to open the safe all this time. You said it sounded like he was doing demolition work up there? It was awfully loud, for sure. I thought he'd come through the ceiling. I thought things over, watching Georgie. Lucky kid, he had no idea what the world could be like. Here I was, assuming she sold them for the money. Now I'm wondering if they were trying to get rid of them to hide what Peter did. Could be. And there's something else. I'm afraid to ask. We found a few interesting facts about Greg Cornell. Greg? I'd figured he was pretty clean and everything, or as clean as a member of his family could be. He told us during his statement that he wasn't going to college this fall. That struck me as strange. People like them usually send their kids to their alma maters. You know, legacy students? The Cornells have always gone to Harvard. You mean they don't go to Cornell? That sort of seems like a no-brainer. He snickered. Anyway, I made a few calls. Turns out Greg was kicked out of prep school just before winter break last year. He was accused of stealing from his roommates. Then there was this little Ponzi scheme he was running. Excuse me? He called it an investor club. They were pouring money into Bitcoin, only he wasn't making money for his investors. He'd pay them from the onboarding fees and investments new members handed over. Wow, a little young to start acting that shady. He's lucky he was a minor at the time, not to mention the lawyers at the family's disposal. None of this was proof of him lying, but it cast doubt on his character. For sure. Besides, there's something been bugging me about the way he acted when he was talking to you and Joe. Oh, what, what bugged you? The innocent, ah, uh, shucks act he was putting on. Nothing could have been further from the person I met at Driftwood. That version of Greg was haughty, sarcastic, and jaded. He acted like a person twice his age. I figured maybe he was more comfortable at the house and in distress when he was at the station, but now you've got me thinking. Can I ask you something? Sure. How do you know about Greg's behavior during his time at the station? Oh, shoot. Georgie, stop trying to eat the sofa cushion. Don't use the baby as a distraction. I'm sorry, I am. I couldn't help myself. I'm getting tired of hearing that. I know. I pouted even though he couldn't see me. I have no excuse. For once we can agree. Silence unfurled between us. I wish I knew what this new information means for our case. I'm glad you're at your dad's and there's company coming over. Me too. No sense in pretending to be more confident than I actually was. I'll feel a lot better when they get here. I waited for Pete to answer, but I got nothing. In fact, there was an eerie silence now. I looked at the handset and tried to hang up, then call him back. Only nothing happened. I got up, went to the phone dock and unplugged it, then plugged it back in. Still nothing. The line was dead. There was nothing inherently threatening about that. There could have been a problem with the lines, or maybe somebody forgot to pay the bill. Stranger things had happened. I picked Georgie up off the floor, looking out the window. It wasn't full dark yet, but twilight was starting to fall. I've got a bad feeling about this, bud. My phone was in my purse, which I'd left in the kitchen. I took him with me and was reaching for the bag when the back door burst inward, glass flying. Georgie screamed. So did I, turning instinctively to put my body between him and the glass coming at us, my hand over his head and holding him close. I looked over my shoulder, horrified, realizing somebody had used one of the chairs in the yard to break the door. Somebody who now walked in through the hole they'd made. Somebody wearing jeans and a thin jacket, a ball cap pulled low over their eyes and nose. Somebody who lifted their head to glare at me. My jaw dropped. Bobby. Chapter 22 Why couldn't you leave it alone? Why did you have to stick your little button nose in it? She reached into her pocket and pulled out a pistol. You don't seem like a bad person. Irritating. Basic but not bad. I'm not basic either. Why that mattered, I had no idea. I wasn't about to let her insult me. That's your opinion. She looked to Georgie, who was still whimpering and fussing in my arms. You have a kid? He's my brother. Please, Pete, get here. 
please know something went wrong? He would probably try my cell next. When he didn't get an answer, he might send a car around to check in on me. For once, I'd welcome the interference. Bobby snorted. Your brother? Dad gets around, I guess. And this mom had one of those geriatric pregnancies. He's my father's baby. Detective George Harmon, you're standing in his house. I won't be for much longer. Don't hurt the baby, please. I held him tighter, pressing my lips to his head while my eyes moved around the room. I had to find a way to defend myself. The knife block seemed like a solid idea, but then how much good would it do in a fight against a gun? It didn't matter if I was still holding the baby. I had to keep him safe. Let me put him in his pack and play, okay? It's in the living room. Fine, she motioned with the gun. Don't get any ideas. I won't. She followed me, the gun at my back. I kissed Georgie a few more times and squeezed him tight. I love you so much, bud. It was torture letting him go, but I forced myself to do it. I set him down, smiling all I could, before turning to Bobby. Now let's go into the kitchen and talk this out. I had to get her away from him. There's nothing to talk about. The gun was aimed at the center of my chest. Got to keep you quiet. Nobody else in my entire useless family has the guts to do what needs to be done. There's that idiot Oliver, but he couldn't even handle a little intimidation. He'd think a wild animal got loose in that shop and bled all over the place. But that wasn't my idea. I would never have done something so useless. He does seem like a real idiot. You have no idea. Then there's that moronic nephew of mine getting kicked out of the best prep school on the East Coast because he couldn't help but steal from his friends. Wanted to be a big shot like his father, who's the world's biggest loser. Or my husband, the world's second biggest loser. The gun had started to shake, but now it steadied. I'm not letting them drag me down. They're going to get what's coming to them, and I'm going to collect my husband's portion of the inheritance while he's in prison for embezzlement and misappropriation of funds. What about Emily? She's dead. I don't think she'd care either way. That's not what I mean. Georgie had started fussing again. Bobby's jaw tightened. Can we take this into the other room? He senses what's happening here, and he's going to start bawling. This is why I never had children. She grabbed my arm and dragged me to the kitchen, shoving me away from her with a gun trained on me again. Emily was a nosy, frigid old witch. She was going to hand Peter over for taking valuables out of his father's safe, as if he had no right to them, as if the old man had any use for his dead wife's jewelry. Once that incident happened, it would all be downhill from there. Let me guess, everybody had their hands in Dad's pockets. Did he really have dementia, or was that just something you made up? He did. Man couldn't remember things from one minute to the next. He could have the same conversation ten times in a row, and it would always seem new to him. She barked out a bitter laugh. He didn't want for anything. He had the best care. The best of everything. But that wasn't enough for Emily, hinting she had proof of theft, proof of his being mistreated, that it was all going to come out soon. So you killed her. I did no such thing. Her smile was sweet, snide. I had nothing to do with what happened that day. But you convinced somebody to do it for you. So what if the police will eventually connect Greg with the cyanide he put in Emily's tea? She rolled her eyes. If he'd gotten it right in the first place, Pierce would still be with us. But then nobody misses him either. Understanding slowly dawned. That's what killed Pierce. What happened? An accident? Something like that. I convinced Greg he wouldn't get his inheritance if Pierce went before Emily, that Pierce left her all his money. Did he? I doubt it. The old man was a sadistic creep, but he wouldn't have left his money to her. They weren't really romantically involved. He looked at her as a trusted watchdog, that's all. So get her out of the way, and she wouldn't be able to report all of you for stealing from Pierce. She had proof somewhere. Oliver still hasn't been able to find it, and he can't get into that safe. She gritted her teeth. He's worthless, about to break. Which is why you had Greg go to the cops with all that made-up stuff. Not all of it was made up. Only Oliver pouring Emily's tea. I doubt he was sober enough that day to know whether he did or not, to be honest with you. I figured it was a safe bet. She thrust the gun my way, 
But you had to sneak around. You had to eavesdrop. Greg saw you and followed you. He had the brains to call me and ask what should be done. He told him to cut the brake lines. Georgie began to wail. Bobby's eyes darted his way, her lips curling in a snarl. I couldn't let her get distracted and hurt him. She was unstable enough that she might do it, purely because he got on her nerves. Hey, I'm talking to you. I snapped my fingers, drawing her attention back to me. You made it too easy. I don't know what gave you the idea you were a sleuth, but you're wrong. Though I guess you got one thing right. What's that? He went to the station the night Greg did, instead of staying home. I hoped I'd find you there so we could have this discussion. But I'm a patient person. I knew the time would come. This was it. I saw it in her eyes, the way they hardened. She was ready to do what she came to do, what she didn't trust her family members to do. You've been watching me that closely? Come on, somebody get here soon, please. It was either that or sit around listening as Oliver tore the house down. What would you do? Georgie let loose with a louder cry than before. Bobby snarled, muttering a curse. That's it. I'm going to shut you up, then I'm shutting the kid up. That was a mistake. She could threaten me all she wanted, but Georgie? Everything went red. An ear-splitting roar cut through the air. I only understood as I launched myself across the room that it was coming from me. Bobby didn't have time to react before I slammed into her, knocking her to the floor and landing on top of her. The gun slid across the floor, under the table. You will not! I drove an elbow into her ribs. You won't hurt him! You won't touch him! Get off me! She tried to throw me off, but I was a woman possessed. She rolled over and started crawling away toward the gun, but I took a handful of her hair and tugged. She screamed, clawing at my wrist, but I wasn't about to let go. You're not going to hurt him. And Emma, Emma would come and find us. I wasn't going to let that happen. You're not getting away with this, Bobby. She rolled onto her back again, this time slapping and punching like mad. I grabbed hold of her arms and fought to keep them still, but she was frantic, wild. She managed a single blow to my jaw that left me reeling, seeing stars. That was her opportunity. She wriggled out from under me and went for the gun. I was almost too late, throwing myself on her hard enough to knock the air out of her lungs. Two of the kitchen chairs toppled over, and the bowl of fruit on the table followed, sending apples and oranges rolling all over the place. I could hear Georgie screaming over the dull roar in my head. Bobby pushed herself up on her knees, knocking me off her back. I fell to the side but wouldn't let go, wrapping my arms around her waist and pulling her away from the gun. She shrieked and threw herself at me instead, clawing at my face. I had to make her stop. I couldn't let her have the upper hand. Georgie needed me. The thought of her using that gun on him cleared my head. Instead of trying to stop her clawing and slapping, I took her throat in one hand. The other, I curled into a fist. I'd only delivered a punch once or twice in my life, but the stakes had never been this high. Somehow that gave me the aim and the strength. The satisfaction of connecting with her nose and feeling it crack under my fist was primal, and I wanted to roar in triumph. She fell away, both hands over her spurting nose. I used the opportunity to drag myself over to the table and fish the gun out from underneath. I rolled over, taking aim, and stopping her from making another move. I had a choice to make, though it didn't feel like a choice. It felt like a necessity. My finger tightened around the trigger. Then I saw the lights. I heard the pounding footfalls. Darcy! Darcy! Pete burst through the front door, followed by a handful of uniformed officers. I dropped the gun and slumped against the table while the officers took care of Bobby. Pete helped me to my feet and wrapped his arms around me. I pushed him away, though, swaying and stumbling into the living room. Georgie's face was red, wet with tears that had soaked into his shirt. He reached for me, and I picked him up holding him tight while Pete supported us both. Georgie, bud, I've got you. We're okay. Chapter 23 The place looks great. Olivia and Rachel had cleaned the shop up with help from friends around town. The front window had been replaced, too. You'd never know anything happened here. I'm lucky to have good people around, Olivia grinned, including you. I don't exactly feel like a blessing to you right now. This was my fault. No, it was Oliver Cornell's fault. And he's going to get what's coming to him, 
along with the rest of his messed up family. She hugged me with her good arm. I don't hold it against you, sweetie, so don't even think it. You saved my bacon when Rachel had to go out of town, too. I still want to pay you for it. Consider the scales balanced, especially considering the money she'd put out when replacing the glass. Maybe insurance would reimburse her, but still, it was a big upfront expense. Labor Day weekend was coming up, meaning one last surge of vacationers. Mom was busy behind the counter at the cafe, finally feeling like herself again, and absolutely furious with me for not having told her anything about the Cornells. Frankly, I was impressed with myself, not to mention Trixie. She hadn't breathed a word to Mom. I waved while on my way next door, where Becca had opened for me. I was glad for the excuse to sail past without stopping in to get my butt handed to me in front of Mom's customers. Within minutes, there were people wandering in, sipping iced lattes while perusing the shelves. You're looking good. Becca's gaze landed on my jaw, where I tried to cover up the bruise Bobby had given me. I can hardly see it. Thanks. It took a lot of makeup. And it felt sore, but that would pass. She couldn't hide a grin. I heard you kick the snot out of her. That's all anybody can talk about. Don't be surprised if most of the people who come in today demand details. Maybe I should make a sign to let them know I don't feel like rehashing it. Her eyes lit up. Or you could make a recording and we could sell it. Can you imagine? Always dreaming up ways to make more money. That's why I love you. I turned my attention to a customer flagging me down with a question about special ordering a specific author's backlist, and I was happy to tell her we could ship anywhere in the country, all thanks to Becca's initiative. Olivia wasn't the only person fortunate enough to have good people around her. She messed with the wrong person. Ethan whistled in wonder after I finished telling him the story, sitting in the kitchen of his shop. He'd texted once word spread of the so-called epic fight at Dad's last night. I'd say I'm surprised you're working today, but I know you too well. I couldn't sit around and do nothing today. I hear you. Nothing to do but think. I nodded, grateful he understood. Anyway, it's finally over. I'm glad it ended before Emma showed up. I hate to think how it would have affected her. There you go again, more worried over your family than yourself. If it hadn't been for worrying about my family, I might not have found it in me to defend myself. The slightest thought of Bobby hurting my brother still made my chest feel tight and hot the next day. It would be a while before I could remember without reacting. The baby. Yeah, no way was I going to let her near him. He's lucky to have you, but you already knew that. Ethan slid half a sandwich my way, keeping the other half for himself. Eat something. Thanks? You look like you could use it as all. He was right. It just so happened Caprese was one of my favorite flavor combinations. Mozzarella, fresh Jersey tomatoes, homemade pesto on a homemade ciabatta loaf. It was heaven. You might be only so-so at lemon bars, but you can bake the heck out of a loaf of bread. I took another bite to hide my grin at Ethan's scowl. I'll have you know my customers went wild over the bars, even the ones you hated. I didn't hate them. I didn't love them, was all. And I said at the time you could sell them, which you did. I took another bite of my sandwich, so you're welcome. He took a deep breath. I'm reminding myself you've been through a lot lately, and I shouldn't kick you out. Thanks very much, though you still owe me. Oh, come on. I sent you money through PayPal. What else do you want? I want repayment for the pain you put me through. He stuck out his lower lip, which shouldn't have made me laugh, but it did. Fine, what else do I owe you? Lay it on me, so long as it's not too embarrassing. I won't advertise the shop, so don't even think about it. I polished off my food and wished there was more. That would kill your mom. No, mom would kill me. He hit me with a hard stare. Would it kill her if I asked you out to dinner? Whoa, I hadn't seen that one coming. I'd figured I'd missed my chance. Dinner? Like a date? like a date. For once, he didn't make a snarky comment or pull a face. What do you think? Would the fabric of Cape Hope unravel if we did that? I don't think it would. I smiled, then smiled wider when he wiped invisible sweat off his forehead. That would be great. I'd like that. Good. He tried to hide his relief. He failed. We'll have to firm up plans later. Gotta handle the end of summer crowd. Same here though I hated to leave, especially now. 
I'd better get back to the store and relieve Becca. I'm sure anybody who stopped in while I was at lunch was disappointed not to get a look at me. I'm sure they were, though not because of what happened last night. He winked before backing out through the swinging door, leaving me blushing furiously. The man had a way about him. Of course, Mom is furious with me. I finished putting together the salad for our family dinner. It had been Dad's suggestion, getting together at my place. It made sense, too, since his back door was still ruined, and I wasn't exactly chomping at the bit to get back in there, either. Not just yet. The memories were too fresh only a day later. Emma waved a hand. She'll get over it. I'm more annoyed with you for not telling me, to be honest. She glared at her husband. And with you, sir. Sorry for not wanting to upset my pregnant wife. What was I thinking? Joe rubbed my shoulder. How are you holding up, slugger? I cringed. Not my favorite nickname. Even if it felt incredibly satisfying at the time. Sorry. He kissed my cheek, then murmured in my ear. She deserved it. Good for you. She had deserved it, and much worse than that. He settled in front of the TV, leaving me in the kitchen with Emma. Is it just me, or does it smell like olive oil in here? She tapped her nose. Pregnancy senses. I feel like a superhero. Long story. I had mopped the floor four times since that night, but the odor obviously lingered. How are you really feeling? She glanced over her shoulder, checking on Joe's position. We're alone now, you can tell me. I leaned back against the sink, exhaling. How did I feel? I could have killed her. I had the pistol in my hands and I was about to pull the trigger. I would have done it. Nobody in the world would have blamed you, sweetie. She stood in front of me, brushing my hair over my shoulders before closing her hands over them. Self-defense, all the way. And you had the baby to protect, too. He was all that mattered. I had to keep him safe from her. Her eyes welled up. You're gonna get me started. What doesn't get you started anymore? Honestly, not much. I broke down sobbing over one of those ASPCA commercials this morning. To be fair, they're pretty brutal. She pulled me in for a hug. I know you're going to make an excellent godmother. I gasped, pulling back. Seriously? Me? You want me? We want you. The tears started to flow, but then I was crying too. Not Raina? I assumed you would ask her. Emma winked. She can have the next one. We laughed and hugged again. Hi, everybody. Holly came in with Georgie on her hip, followed by Dad. Just seeing Georgie brought everything back. He reached for me, fingers splayed, and I took him off Holly's hands. Hey, bud. How are you feeling today? I kissed his cheeks, his hands. He lowered his head to my shoulder, and my heart just about melted, even as it hardened when I remembered the feeling of the gun in my hands. I would have pulled the trigger if it meant sparing him. Dad was, of course, Dad. She's lucky I wasn't the one who got there before Pete and the boys did. He ran a hand over my hair. You okay? I feel a lot better knowing she and Greg are where they belong. The judge had denied bail during their hearings that morning. The two of them had been pointing fingers at each other all day, according to what Joe had shared after arriving at my apartment. There wasn't a family secret that wouldn't come out by the time the whole thing was finished. We should have asked Pete to come. Holly set up the pack and play for Georgie before joining us in the kitchen. If he hadn't figured out something was wrong after Bobby cut the phone line, I shuddered to think what would have happened. I'm sure he's busy with his girlfriend. It was getting easier to say that. Pete's girlfriend. Pete had a girlfriend who wasn't me. I could get used to it. Oh, that's over. Joe pulled a beer from the fridge, the six-pack I had bought for Pete, only two of which were missing now. It is? I caught Emma grinning at me when I blurted it out. Yeah, she was only here for the summer anyway. She's not leaving until after Labor Day, but he decided to cut things off early. He popped the cap on the bottle, unaware of what he was doing to me. I couldn't assume Pete ended things because of me. Yes, he'd practically attached himself to me last night, going with me to the hospital to make sure I wasn't hurt badly, staying by my side the entire time. That was his job. We were friends. There was nothing more to it. Though the idea of his being single didn't exactly bother me, I was right back where I'd started, wondering whether Ethan or Pete was the right man for me. All things considered, it could have been worse. 
it already had been. Now life was back on track, for better or worse. Looking around my kitchen, I knew it was for the better. I had everything and everybody I needed. Life was good, if a little chaotic at times. Dad draped an arm over Holly's shoulders. Now we can tell you what we wanted to announce last night once we got back from dinner. Holly beamed, then held up her left hand. I knew there was something else going on, didn't I? He asked me last night at dinner. Holly bit her lip, looking back and forth between me and my sister. You're kidding me. I gaped at the ring, thunderstruck. You're getting married? Emma's voice was shrill. You're actually getting married? Holly's face fell. I don't know if you're happy or upset. Happy, happy. Emma covered her face with her hands and burst into tears, which prompted Georgie to begin whimpering. Poor Dad looked bewildered as Joe comforted Emma, and I tried to hug Holly with a crying baby in my arms. Yes, life was chaotic, but it was very, very good. End of Book 10 This has been Funerals and Favors, K-Pope Mysteries Book 10 Written by Winnie Reed Narrated by Jack Ainsworth. Copyright 2016 to 2022 by Winnie Reed. Production copyright by Winnie Reed.